Thank goodness. I've been wandering alone for so long, I thought I'd never see another soul again. I was kidnapped by these bandits weeks ago. They locked me up in the towers near Mistwatch. I managed to pick the lock and slip out while the guard slept. But now, I'm completely lost. Can you help me, please? Oh, thank you. But I should be fine now that you've shown me the way. But those bandits have to be stopped. They're at Mistwatch. Here, let me show you on your map. If you can stop them, you'll be a true hero. I'm beginning to think Skyrim wasn't designed to be played by people, or at least people who abide by any sort of logic. I thought we were done with the unintuitive, self-defeating gameplay mechanics in the previous video when we were talking about magic in Skyrim, but to my horror, it might actually be worse here. At least magic doesn't have entire skills that are a trap to invest in or not invest in, or an invisible cap that will make progression past a certain point for an entire stat worthless. Where magic would let you know, time and again, it doesn't appreciate you doing things like trying to have fun, the melee playstyle is riddled with things where Skyrim will just let you do the wrong thing and ruin the experience for yourself. This has led to many, many people absolutely annihilating Skyrim's combat in their analysis videos. But I'm here today to show you how to have fun with melee. Yeah, that surprised me too. So that's what we're going to talk about today, the puzzle maze that is melee combat. We'll also look at the Companions in the Civil War, two quest lines that in analyzing have no doubt shaved months off my life expectancy. We'll also be looking at some fan favorite side quests and continue to delve into the never ending disaster that is the Creation Club creations. If you haven't watched my video on the magic play style, which also covered the main quest and some other topics, I recommend watching that video at some point. But don't worry though, that video is definitely not a prerequisite to watching this one. So you're free to just watch this one and you can go back to that one after you finish watching this one all the way to the end. The same as the last video, I've put a lot of effort into making this video a perfectly fine audio only experience. So you won't miss out on any important details if you aren't actively watching. One last thing to address before we begin, because I'm sure we'll both be getting comments. I have watched Patrician TV's 20 hour Skyrim analysis video. In fact, he and I are actually pretty good friends, have collaborated many times, and I even co-host a podcast on his channel. The similarities between some of our points are purely coincidence. 90% of this script was done before I'd even watched his video. And because I have a remarkably short memory memory with certain things, any similarities in the remaining 10% is also coincidence. I want to dismiss the notion that analysis videos need to be entirely new takes and opinions. Just because Joseph Anderson made a valid criticism of Fallout 4 six years ago doesn't mean someone making a new video now can't make the same point. Some viewers might never have seen his video or even remember that point. The creator themselves might not have seen the video, or the new video might have some different context for using that point. But even ignoring all those reasons, it's fine for an analyst to repeat a point another analyst made because it helps build consensus. If Bethesda looked at all these videos on Skyrim and got 30 different explanations for how they got the companions wrong, it's gonna to be hard for them to pick out what they should actually take to heart. This doesn't mean it's fine for an analysis video to be nothing but regurgitation of points made elsewhere, but there is value in agreeing with other people in a discussion. Just figured I should put that out there. Now, before we get into why melee combat in Skyrim is uniquely stupid and yet still tricking analysts into thinking it's stupidly simple, I want to talk about a topic I've been itching to cover since before I'd even started this entire project. Despite pretty much everyone agreeing Skyrim sends players into an offensive number of dungeons, I don't think I've seen a single video that has adequately analyzed why Skyrim dungeons are just so unfun. This has horrified me because I've seen Skyrim's awful dungeon design philosophy seeping into other Bethesda projects, fan-made mods, and even mod remakes of previous Elder Scrolls games. The problem is that this isn't a case of one or two issues holding back a good system. This is a fundamentally flawed design ethos built upon and informing other bad design choices. Which means we're going to be talking about dungeons for the next, hmm, 40 minutes or so. Let's get started. The main arguments against Skyrim's dungeons is that they are all boring because they look the same, have terrible puzzles, and Skyrim's combat isn't good. While I agree Skyrim's dungeons are terrible, I think these arguments are alarmingly missing the deeper issues. A lot of these arguments get hung up on one or two things, like Skyrim's level scaling or its enemy variety. But I think all of these things, and many more issues, all contribute towards creating the mind-numbing experience we end up seeing in-game. So let's take it from the top. What technically is and isn't classified as a dungeon in Skyrim can get pretty murky because the game doesn't use the term often or consistently. 
One definition is that a dungeon is any location that has a boss encounter, a boss chest, and can be tagged cleared on the map. But even that definition is a bit lacking because there are dungeons that don't have boss chests, and there are also dungeons that can't be marked as cleared. Looking at Oblivion, classifying what's a dungeon is a straightforward task. It's just any loaded underground zone. Iliad ruins, forts, caves, and mines, they all fall neatly into this definition. They're further subdivided based on their occupants, but let's not jump into that tangent just yet. The simple reason for this breakdown of definition is due to the fact that Bethesda put a lot more effort into increasing the variety of the locations on Skyrim's map. Some of the more noteworthy ones are camps, towers, landmarks, dragon lairs, and giant camps. Landmarks are one of the interesting ones because when people talk about the little hidden things that they found out in the wilds of Skyrim, they're often talking about one of these locations. Oblivion played with the idea of having obscure places a world designer snuck in, but just like purpose-designed dungeons, this sort of level and world design that's become a hallmark of modern Bethesda games didn't really find its true footing until Fallout 3. If you watched my previous Skyrim video, you might recall that this new way of dungeon design was brought in by Joel Burgess with his work on Vilverin and a few of the other dungeons in Oblivion. I don't know if there was a similar origin story for those little points of interest, or if the world designers were just taking inspiration from Burgess and the dungeon designers, or if this was just a natural evolution of Bethesda's world design process, but the improvements in Bethesda's world and dungeon designs do seem to run in tandem starting with Fallout 3. So it shouldn't come as a surprise that what even qualifies as a dungeon has become a lot harder to pin down now that Bethesda has embraced a more, shall we say, fluid design philosophy. This is why I get confused when I see people saying Skyrim's dungeons lack variety because I don't always know what they are referring to. I assume they mean the many subterranean locations like Nordic Ruins, but technically places like Lost Valley Redoubt are also dungeons. But I never see people bringing that one up when they are talking about the 12th Nordic Ruin that they had to clear. So let's stick to talking about places where the sun don't shine because a lot of quests take us into the underground depths of Skyrim, and I believe the variety issue of Skyrim's dungeons traces back to them. They also demonstrate what I believe the variety issue really stems from, and that's a problem with exposure and visual variety. When it comes to visuals, dungeons in Skyrim are definitely an improvement over their Oblivion counterparts. I don't ever see anyone defending Oblivion's dungeons while poo-pooing on Skyrim's in this regard, so I won't dwell on this too much. But in general, Skyrim dungeon designers had a lot more art assets they could play with, and a lot of dungeons often blended tile sets. So a cave might lead into a Nordic dungeon, or a Dwemer ruin might terminate into a cave. I have nothing but praise for this sort of creativity. The problem is that those assets were still not limitless, and not all dungeons had the same sort of creative use of assets to break up the visual monotony of seeing the Nordic Ruin tile set for the 10th time. Skyrim's muted color palette and limited number of dynamic light sources definitely didn't help soothe the visual monotony either. Presumably, this is due to Bethesda opting for a quantity over quality approach to fleshing out Skyrim's dungeons, and as we will see when we finally talk about Dragonborn, the level designers clearly had a lot more time to get creative with the dungeons in that expansion, making them a lot more visually stimulating. So now we come to the other problem, and what I believe is the main source of the variety complaints, and that's the unequal representation of Skyrim's various dungeons. If there's one thing just about anyone who's played Skyrim will recall, it's going through a Nordic Ruin. Critics take that to mean that there are more Nordic Ruins than anything else in Skyrim, and technically, yeah, that's true. But it's actually a lot worse than that. When we look at the types of dungeons main quest lines take us into, there's a really disproportionate number of Nordic Ruins compared to all the other dungeon types. The main quest takes us into Bleak Falls Barrow, Ustengrav, and Skaldafen. So out of the seven, three are Nordic Ruins, one is a fort, one is a sewer, one is a unique Akaviri temple, and one is a Dwemer Ruin. But okay, this is the Dragon Nord story in a game set in Skyrim, it's fair to assume Nordic Ruins are gonna get featured here. How about the Mage's College? Two Nordic Ruins, a Dwemer Ruin, and a fort. Two of the three Thieves' Guild dungeon crawls are also Nordic Ruins, and those stand out even more because of the variety of the guilds' non-dungeon-related quests. In that case, the player can be blindsided by the sudden dungeon crawl quest, and because it's also a Nordic Ruin, that's only going to compound the player's weariness. I won't go through all the other major quest lines, but the pattern is pretty consistent. So if you're a player that's going through all the major content in the game back to back, you're going to be going through a really disproportionate number of Nordic Ruins, and that's likely adding to your dungeon fatigue. This is likely the result of needing Nordic Word Walls to teach us shouts, and Word Walls are almost always located in Nordic Ruins or Nordic Ruin adjacent locations like Dragon Peaks. But the thing is, there's really no lore reason why Nordic word walls need to be exclusively located in Nordic ruins. We don't know who exactly built each of the word walls, but if you learn how to read Draconic, 
or just read the translated versions on the UESP, you'll see that they all seem to have been written by ancient Nords or Dragon Priests. They're almost always commemorating a dead hero, sometimes just stating a bit of ancient Nord wisdom, but not all of them are written in a way that would necessitate they be located in a crypt. So why couldn't the designers just plop some of these out in the open world or in some caves? I'm sure there's a few of you watching who want to point out Forsaken Cave and Sunderstone Gorge, two dungeons that contain word walls that are shown as caves on the map. In Forsaken Caves' case, that's just a cave entrance. Most of the dungeon is just a Nordic ruin. Sunderstone Gorge is much more creative with how it blends cave and Nordic ruin tile sets, but even that dungeon still insists on sticking the word wall in a Nordic ruin-like chamber, and only two of the 40-ish dungeons being somewhat divorced from Nordic ruins only further proves my point. I get why, stylistically, they'd want that continuity, but when you have a game with roughly 45 individual words to learn, you're painting yourself into a dangerous corner where you're going to need roughly 45 Nordic-style dungeons to stick those walls into. We really could have used more word walls like the one at Murdia's Shrine that's just out in the open, and my guess is an exception was made for that one so that players aren't forced to do the bidding of a Daedric Prince to get the shout. But to test my exposure theory, and because I never made a concerted effort to clear all of them, I decided to run through every single Dwemer ruin in the game, including the giant one added by Creation Club. What I found after almost two full days of recording sessions devoted to just running through Dwemer ruins is that grinding dungeons f***ing sucks and should never be done. By the time I got to doing some of the dungeons for the Ethereal Crown, which are some of the best Dwemer dungeons, I was not having a good time. The ironic upshot is that after all those Dwemer ruins, my first Nordic ruin was refreshing, almost enjoyable even. But if running through some of the largest and most diverse dungeons in the game was still brutally tedious, it goes to show something is fundamentally flawed with the dungeon experience in Skyrim. Funny thing about that Dwemer CC item, Forgotten Seasons was one of the very few, kinda decent creations. It adds probably the largest dungeon I've run through in Skyrim, well, really it's more like five different dungeons connected via larger dungeon Blackreach style, outfitted with some unique mechanics and puzzly elements. It also adds some new unique helmets and, uh... They're definitely a look, a steam-powered robot horse, and a unique passive power that changes with weather. Just be sure to wear your glasses when trying to read what this spell actually does. The Dwemer Automaton Horse is an interesting addition because it's an unkillable horse with infinite stamina. If that sounds crazy powerful and undermines what little there was with the horse system, don't worry, it's actually worse than that because with it being invulnerable to all damage, you can use it to jump off mountains and take no fall damage. You'll still take damage from enemies when you're riding it, but if you want to travel as the crow flies in Skyrim, this is your best bet. It's a horse, so it can climb sheer vertical surfaces, there's your horse climbing joke for this series, and no fall damage obviously expedites your trip back down that mountain. If you've forgotten rideable and purchasable horses were a thing in Skyrim, I don't blame you, and frankly Bethesda probably wishes you'd forget too. Horses were one of the things that just barely survived the cut during development. Apparently, they were something they really struggled with while making Skyrim, and I'm not sure what to make of that. We had them in Oblivion, and aside from their implementation being a little weird, functionally, they were fine. You would think then it would have been a simple thing to just bring them over to Skyrim and maybe iterate upon them a bit. That's apparently not how it worked. So it turns out that they were having issues with the horse outrunning the engine's ability to render things. Probably a console hardware issue. But that still doesn't explain all of the other issues horses still have in Skyrim. Horses can sprint now, which sounds nice, but really, how much better are they than the player when it comes to running? I decided to put it to the test, and before you ask, yes, I did drag race a horse in my character, and yes, I am single. In my defense, this is a game where the designers fake the player's speed increase in werewolf form by just increasing the camera's FOV, so I think you can understand why I might be suspicious these horses are nothing more than a placebo. So, the apparent benefits of horses are increased stamina and increased movement speed. Well, that increased stamina is an outright fabrication for all purchasable horses because they have a whopping 106 stamina. The player starts at 100 stamina, so unless you're playing a character that will never take a stamina increase at level up, which even my pure mage took a few of those after a point, you're going to have more stamina than most horses in the game. But okay, maybe the horses are just more efficient with their stamina consumption while sprinting. Uh, no, they aren't. My horse depleted its 106 stamina in 16 seconds, yielding an efficiency of 6.63 stamina per second. 
My character depleted her 160 stamina in 25 seconds, yielding an efficiency of 6.4 stamina per second. I'm willing to chalk these slight differences up to the inaccuracy of my time measuring methods as a way of coping here. But there are better horses in the game when it comes to stamina. Frost is a horse you can acquire from a side quest in Riften. That horse boasts a total stamina pool of 148, so roughly 5 level ups into stamina. Shadowmere is a popular steed and he's rocking 198, so almost 10 levels into stamina. The Unicorn... All right, give me a second with that CC creation. So the best horse in the base game is only about 10 stamina levels higher than the player at start. To be fair to horses though, they don't have to worry about equipment burning slowing them down, which will decrease that efficiency quickly for a player, especially a heavy armor character, till they get the conditioning park or the seed standing stone anyhow. So the stamina pool stamina efficiency argument is a bit of a toss up depending on your build and equipment loadout. When talking about pure speed though, the horseman's out every time because the player doesn't have a way of increasing their movement speed. Yes, I know about the fishing creation and the speed boost ring. No, I'm not going to talk about it because I'm already three tangents deep here. We'll get to that later. In the no sprint test, my horse completed the test in 35 seconds, while my character did it in 41 seconds. In the sprint only test, the horse did it in 14 seconds, and the character did it in 17 seconds. So in sprinting, the horse is about 15% faster, and in jogging, the horse is about 18% faster. Nothing earth shattering, but it's something, I, I guess. Horses will allow you to fast travel if you're over encumbered, which my only response is get better at inventory management and get yourself a bipedal horse that can follow you into dungeons. If you really want to carry those 60 dragon bones, drop them on the ground and order your follower to pick them up. One at a time though. If you drop them as a stack, whatever your follower can't carry is going to get poofed out of existence. Please learn from my mistakes here. Or just make them carry all those dwarven warhammers you keep grabbing for some reason. Some of you might be wondering why I didn't just look up all this information in the creation kit. That's a good question. Okay, I want to move on, but we need to talk about mounted combat. In a rare admission of weakness, Bethesda added mounted combat to the game with a regular update. So only a few of you might even remember Skyrim before it had it, because now it's part of every single patched copy regardless of DLC or retail version. Wait, what's that? You didn't know Skyrim had mounted combat? Once again, I don't blame you. The game never makes a point of telling you about it, so it's likely something most players discover by accident from an errant button press. And also NPCs can't do it, so we don't even have that to tip us off to its existence. But it's there in all its janky glory. There's no lock on while on horseback, so trying to hit anything while on horseback is just, well, good luck. Especially if you're a melee character. Mountain Blade, Skyrim is sadly not. Also, I just love the omission of magic for mounted combat. Yeah, if you're a mage, you just can't cast spells while mounted. Magic, which would most certainly be the easiest thing to do while on horseback, is just not possible in Skyrim. I would have complained about that during my magic video, but the thought of wasting magicka whiffing firebolts because I'm trying to steer a neurotic glassy-eyed dinosaur is something I'm kind of grateful to have been spared from. So even with mounted combat being a thing technically possible in Skyrim, your best bet when ending up in combat is one of two things. Get off your horse and fight, or try to outrun your enemies. Getting off exposes another issue with horses, and that's their insatiable bloodlust. Whether you're fighting skeevers, dragons, or forsworn, once free of your command, your courageous steed is going to run into the fray and start trampling enemies. This is another behavior made famous from Oblivion, but Skyrim tried to smooth it over by making the horses in Skyrim a lot hardier. Get it? Because we're up north. The standard horse of Skyrim has a total health of 289, which is almost three times the starting health for a player character. Shadowmere, on the other hand, is packing 1,637, which is more than a blood dragon. So yeah, your horse can end up being a decent tank for your party. Personally, I don't like watching my 1k gold investment running off two LARP as a temporary tank, when that role is almost certainly being filled by someone much more qualified. But it is a thing that they can do somewhat competently, so there's that. Final verdict on horses then. I never really bothered with them until the Dwemer horse came around with its unlimited stamina and health. Seeing as the main difference between horses that aren't Shadowmere were practically cosmetic anyways, maybe this is what Skyrim horses should have been from the start. In my opinion, this makes putting up with all the idiosyncrasies of horse ownership kinda worth it. Did you know your horse will report you for crimes you commit in its presence? Or how about horses catching diseases, because that's a thing too. The hard truth is that Skyrim just isn't a big enough place to justify the existence of horses. Ignoring the fast-traveling elephant in the room, I never found myself really aching when traveling by foot. Well, outside of it just being dull and tedious because the map of Skyrim isn't even laid out for players to enjoyably travel by foot, this isn't Red Dead Redemption 2 where the map actually does feel like an actual province in its scale. 
with how compact Skyrim is, even if you're using the horse, you're going to be hopping on and off of it very frequently most of the time. So at that point, you might as well use my infinite sprint glitch I discovered after I got sick of using my horse. So far I've only gotten it to work with one-handed weapons, but knowing Skyrim, there's probably other ways to make it work too. What you do is equip a one-handed weapon, sprint forward, and while sprinting, do a forward power attack. Once the power attack animation begins, you just start spamming regular light attacks. You don't have to go crazy and break your mouse or controller spamming attacks, just a nice, consistent rhythm will do. This will lock you into sprinting even after you run out of stamina. So long as you keep swinging, your character will keep sprinting. Enjoy. Speaking of Red Dead Redemption, Skyrim's Creation Club made the bold decision of copying some of its horse mechanics. The Wild Horses creation adds, what else, wild horses for the player to tame. These are not dynamically spawning herds, they just stick a few unique horses throughout the map that the player has to try breaking in. These horses aren't anything special, they're just reskinned versions of the common Skyrim horses down to their low stamina. The player can then bring the tamed horse to a stable to buy custom saddles and give their horses a unique name. These services are also available for all the other ownable horses in the game too. The custom naming system is, of course, oddly obtuse. So you can't just enter a unique name and call it a day, no, no, no. You're limited to a predefined list of mostly Nordic names. Not only that, the name that it applies is randomly selected from that list. So if you want a specific name from that list, yeah, good luck. Remember, this is a game where I can name individual potions that I'm crafting. Speaking of surfaces, horse armor, it's back. It's just cosmetic again. Nothing else needs to be said. Oh yeah, and the Wild Horses creation brought back the Unicorn. Seeing as we killed the last Unicorn in Oblivion for Hircine's quest, the mod authors really needed to come up with something special to bring it back in Skyrim. I'm gonna let Patrician handle that detail. I'll just mention that the Unicorn definitely holds its own with 1,637 health and 698 stamina. It's also flagged as essential, so that's kind of neat. It's no Dwemer steam-powered horse, but eh, it'll do. All right, with that out of the way, we talked about the types of dungeons, visual variety, the exposure issue. Yeah, I guess it's time to tackle level scaling. Simply put, the level scaling of Skyrim is fine. I say that with the largest number of asterisks imaginable, but I'm still willing to make that claim. The reason is that most people who have problems with the level scaling are really having issues with the character leveling system but just don't know it. If you watched my Skyrim Mage video, you'll probably know where I'm coming from, but if not, don't worry, we'll be going for round two in the next section when we get to talking about leveling as a warrior. Contrary to popular belief, level scaling systems are not a cardinal sin that should be avoided by any self-respecting game developer. Level scaling is just another tool, and like a tool, it can be used properly or improperly. Because it was so badly implemented in Oblivion, people seem to assume Bethesda didn't learn much about how to use it in Skyrim, but that's just not the case. Skyrim's implementation is a clear improvement on every front. Most people aren't even aware of how the level scaling system of Skyrim works, and that alone is a sign of it maturing from Oblivion. Skyrim's system is a whole lot more subtle, and that's what you want in a system like this. If the average player is completely ignorant to its existence, that's a good thing. That means the constant appropriate challenge the system is meant to create through the experience was there without the player running into a brick wall. The problem with Oblivion's system was that there were many brick walls because of how enemies were bracketed, and the fact that low-level enemies just disappeared entirely from the map once the player entered the next bracket. Skyrim addresses the brick walls in two ways. First, there are more brackets with more enemies in each bracket for all the different enemy factions in the game. Skyrim has a lot less visual variety with its enemies, but a lot more depth. So where Oblivion had two types of undead lich that would spawn once the player hit their required spawn level, Skyrim would have maybe six to eight Draugr variants that would act as higher leveled enemies. In Oblivion, those two lich variants were then scaled to the player's level by some sort of formula. In Skyrim, all enemies are fixed to some defined level. The Draugr White Lord is a good example of this one variant that's fixed at level 15. Its stats are also fixed with 490 health and 450 stamina. The Draugr Scourge is interesting because it's actually three variants, all of them fixed at level 15, but all with different health, stamina, and magicka stats. So rather than scaling the stats of all of its enemies, Skyrim's level scaling system will play with the composition of the enemy spawns. 
This leads into the second way Skyrim addresses the brick wall issue. Low level enemies never disappear entirely from the spawn lists. If you clear Bleak Falls Bower at level 1, you're going to see mostly level 1 Draugr. By the time you're level 50, clearing a Nordic Ruin in the Reach, you're still likely to see at least a couple of low level Draugr playing the role of cannon fodder. It's not like Oblivion, where all those wolves suddenly evolved into minotaurs while you're away in the Shivering Isles. Skyrim will just prioritize spawning enemies deeper in the pool, and enemies that were once boss encounters at the end of a dungeon will end up being common enemies 10 character level ups later. Broadly speaking, these two changes really help smooth out the level scaling. Frankly, the only similarities between Oblivion and Skyrim's level scaling systems are that they both use the player's level to determine what it should be spawning. Just about everything else seems to have been altered in some way, so it's not just a rehash of Oblivion's system, as I've seen some people accuse it of being. But to try to reintroduce some level of risk to blindly exploring in Skyrim, Bethesda added even more complexity to the system by adding minimum levels to each dungeon based on their geographic locations. Generally speaking, dungeons in flat lowland areas like the Tundra are going to have lower minimum levels, while dungeons high up in the mountains like those found in the Reach are going to have higher levels. What this ends up looking like is a lot of dungeons near Whiterun spawning bandits whose levels average lower, with the dungeons high up in the Reach spawning Forsworn whose average levels are a bit higher. Mountain peaks are where dragons live and those are usually the highest level enemies a player can find at any given point in their playthrough. This is one of the more subtle changes made to the system in Skyrim and it sadly just wasn't quite there yet. The idea was that low-leveled players ought to avoid places like the Reach, but in practice, that low level is just anything less than level 15. By that point, the player really is free to wander Skyrim without having to worry about accidentally stumbling into a dungeon they aren't expected to clear. Technically, this is applied across the entire province, but the difference between level 1 and level 6 is maybe 3 hours of playtime. So, obviously, the granularity of the system gets lost very quickly, so you're likely to not even notice that East March is meant to be less welcoming than Whiterun Hold. This is something Fallout 4 expanded upon very well, with people actually praising the Glowing Sea as a place appropriately difficult to clear. And with what we know now about Skyrim's geographic level scaling, it should come as no surprise that the Glowing Sea is on the complete opposite end of the map where the player begins the game. I've seen people believing Fallout 4 actually did away with level scaling. The truth is, Bethesda just iterated upon the massive changes they made between Oblivion and Skyrim. Actually, a lot of changes went into the system in Fallout 3, but let's stay focused here. A lot of level scaling detractors like to point out that the level scaling removes the catharsis they feel when revisiting a place that gave them a hard time with their now demigod characters to seek out retribution. But Skyrim also addressed this issue by level locking a dungeon once the player enters it. So if you entered Forsaken Cave at level 15, all the spawns in the dungeon will forever be based off of you being level 15. Even if you return to that dungeon 30 hours later as a level 60 beast, the dungeon will still treat you as a level 15 player. So you'll just be facing a whole lot of restless Draugr and maybe the occasional white. Why don't most players know this is a thing? Because who the fuck wants to run through these same Skyrim dungeons again? I get the catharsis argument and I sympathize with it, but Elder Scrolls games were never really the sorts of games that encouraged repeating dungeons on the same character. So the catharsis argument was never really something that needed addressing because you're expected to always be seeing new content. And if you're seeing something new, it's safe to assume you want to see that new stuff challenging you in new ways. If you want to make the argument that Skyrim isn't a challenging game, then yeah, I'm not going to disagree much there except maybe try a pure mage. But that's a whole discussion best safe when we talk about leveling. Level scaling also plays a role in a few other systems, most notably loot tables. This is where I think the level scaling system fumbles the hardest. Once again, it's not as bad as Oblivion, where by level 25 you'll be seeing low life bandits spawning with Daedric gear, but it's still pretty busted. By level 35-ish is when I'd say the loot tables of Skyrim start to go haywire and you'll be finding expensive enchanted gear popping up in the world. You're much less likely to find bandits carrying that stuff, but bandit chiefs can be decked out in head to toe in enough gear to finance Ulfric's war. As well, boss chests at the end of just about every dungeon can inexplicably contain all sorts of rare and expensive gear. This also affects what you'll be seeing in shops, which makes it seem like inflation is a rampant issue for Skyrim's economy. There's also dummy item spawns in places like Dun Dungeons where at low levels you might be seeing petty soul gems spawning, but by level 40-ish you'll be coming across filled grand soul gems. This makes getting rich in Skyrim a foregone conclusion by mid-game. This is why I stopped looting dungeons by level 50, and that's a shame because looting is one of the few things that actually makes dungeon crawling the least bit interesting. Also, some quest rewards are tied to the player's level, but there's significantly fewer leveled items than in Oblivion, so you don't have to worry as much about getting inferior items just because you did a quest at a lower level. So with level scaling influencing all these systems, how does it come together to influence the overall experience for the player? Like I said, I think it's 
fine with some asterisks. I think the major problem with the system is in its tuning, and that ultimately results in it eventually failing its primary purpose. The game's difficulty is just not consistent. Some points of the game are going to be difficult, some points are going to be a cakewalk, and it all depends on the sort of character you're running with, and of course your skill level and knowledge of the game. Bethesda seems to have overcorrected for the ball-busting difficulty Oblivion system would invariably devolve into, because the stats of your enemies never stopped scaling. Doing away with that has alone reduced the challenge of Skyrim, but they also put hard limits in on the types of enemies that will spawn and the frequency of those spawns. I used a test save and some console commands to run through a couple of dungeons at different character levels just to get a feel for the system in action. I ran through Deepwood Redoubt, which leads into Hag's End, and Ragnavald Temple, with my character hovering around level 40, 80, and 150. The results confirmed what I was suspecting, but it still surprised me a bit. As I had assumed, there are upper limits to dungeon spawns, but they are not as aggressive as I thought they would be. The level 40 run had a nice variety of low and high leveled enemies, but the 150 dungeon only had a handful of the highest level enemies possible. I went ahead and installed some UI mods so that you can see the enemies' levels and stats easily in the footage. What I expected was that by level 150 I'd only be seeing death overlords in Ragnavald, but that wasn't the case. I'd occasionally run into chambers that still had nothing but level 20s and 30s in them. There were even a few level 1 draugars still floating around too. Interestingly, the boss encounter at the end was also fixed, so I was fighting the same boss at level 40 and level 150. The thing is, you're not expected to ever reach level 150. If you're doing that unironically, you are literally playing the game wrong. But even if you do manage to hit that level, caps on things like player armor rating, spell damage, elemental resistances, and so many other stats will ensure that there's an upper limit to your total damage and survivability, just as there's an upper limit on the number of high-level enemies the game will spawn. In looking back with this knowledge, suddenly a lot of the limitations of the magic system seem to make much more sense. Still inexcusable, but I get why they did what they did. This is no doubt due to Bethesda wanting to avoid the fate all players of Oblivion faced, where one day their game would just be a never-ending grind against constant damage-soaking enemies. The problem is that now the game is stacked in the player's favor, unless they're a pure mage. And so, with a well-designed character, like a stealth archer, the game is doomed to not being able to challenge the player after a point. This is why every character has a level sweet spot where its level, perks, skills, and equipment actually find some sort of harmony with the challenge from the level scaling. Unfortunately, that sweet spot is an inflection point, and the experience will sooner or later flip to fall out of harmony, ruining the challenge it managed to find. The solution is probably a more active system, then. If the player is clearing enemies quickly, the game starts to spawn tougher enemies. If the player is struggling, it can tune down the enemies it's throwing at them. Or perhaps play with the AI. Make the AI more aggressive or defensive, depending on how the player is playing. If the player keeps hiding, have them flush the player out. If the player keeps getting stealth kills, make the AI more perceptive and more likely to detect the player. The scaling system in Skyrim really could have been spectacular. It just needed more polish and tuning to have been perfect. Earlier, I said I'd been grinding through Duoma Ruins, and it made me realize how nobody should ever grind dungeons in Skyrim. We almost have everything we need to fully explain that assertion, but before that, I want to address a complaint I often see running in parallel with the Skyrim dungeons are boring and lack variety argument. That is, the Skyrim enemies are boring and lack variety complaint. I call this a complaint and not an argument because this is always said in passing with nothing to back it up because it's just incorrect. First, let's just list all the enemy factions we can come across in vanilla Skyrim. Bandits, Draugr, Animals, Monsters, Dragons, Forsworn, Necromancers, Conjurers, Warlocks, Cultists, Vampires, Falmer, Dwemer, Automatons, and Daedra. Many of those have sub-factions like Cultists, which is a term I'm borrowing because there actually is a Cultist faction in Dragonborn, but with my definition, you'd have groups like Periites Afflicted and Boethius Followers. Bandits is another faction that has a dizzying amount of sub-factions. The complaint often turns into people saying that the game really only has Bandits, Draugr, Dragons, and Monsters. But you know what? I can actually streamline this even more. Why not group bandits and Draugr together? They're both bipedal after all, and dragons are just a type of monster that can fly. Ignore the stuff that Parthenax says, please. And there we go, now Skyrim only has bandits and monsters. In order for this argument to work, we obviously have to get very reductive and completely ignore all the nuance these factions exhibit. What's the difference between bandits and Fulmer? A lot, actually. Fulmer are blind, so they can only detect a player based on sound. 
They use poisons, are usually paired with formidable chores companions, and favor magic and ranged weapons. Whereas bandits come in so many varieties that they end up being the most diverse human enemies in the game. You can run into a party of bandits with a few mages or a party that favors bows. The worst thing I guess we can say about bandits is that they all kind of blend together aesthetically speaking. What distinguishes the bandits I fought at Halted Stream Camp and the ones that I fought at Bleak Falls Barrow? Not much except for some flavor lore in a journal and the environmental details of the dungeon. The bandits at Bleak Falls Barrow were there because What's-His-Face with the Golden Claw hired them so that they could get to the treasure. And the ones at Halted Stream Camp seem to have been there to set up shop to use the transmute tome to turn the mine's iron ore into gold ore in order to make themselves rich, but it seems like they lacked a good enough mage to use the spell effectively, and isn't this the sh that people usually compliment Bethesda on? Well, I guess if this sort of environmental storytelling is done in the overworld, it's worthy of awards, but if it's used to add flavor to the game's bandits, then it's no good. Okay, but what about variety within a faction? Let's talk about everyone's favorite, the Draugr. They're all just dumb, undead enemies that swarm the player with no regard for their own well-being, right? Eh, uh, not really. You have Draugr archers who will hang back and try to snipe the player, only switching to their melee weapon when they are cornered. Then you have Draugr whites who mix up melee and frost magic, which can really give a melee player a run for their money. Draugr are also some of the only enemies outside of dragons that can use shouts. Dragon priests are technically a faction of their own, but they're pretty undead and they're usually surrounded by Draugr, so let's throw them into the mix too. I won't even try to list all the things that they can do because each one's designed to be a unique boss fight. And you're usually only fighting Draugr in their crypts, which are dark, cramped, and littered with corners and traps where they can ambush you and make it difficult to sneak up on them. They are practically immune to frost magic and are completely immune to illusion magic until you get the Master of the Mind perk. They also swarm and don't run away because they're undead and have no self-preservation instincts. Also because we have the turn undead spell effect to make them run away. You know what enemies do run away? Humans, like bandits and mages. And I'm not just talking about making them flee with illusion spells, I mean if a bandit watches you mow down all of his allies, he might just quit the fight and run away. Alright look, if you want to argue enemies are boring because Skyrim is an easy game that doesn't require players to learn these weaknesses and exploit them, then yeah, I'm not going to disagree too much. But if you're going to complain enemies are boring in Skyrim because they lack variety when they are very clearly distinct from one another, then you're just wrong. Sure, we can both agree that the dungeon experience is lacking in Skyrim, but misidentifying the causes of that dissatisfaction does nothing to help find solutions to the problem. And this is why I get concerned about a lot of the criticism I see thrown at Skyrim and other Bethesda titles. People aren't always right, or even close to being right. That concerns me because I want to see Bethesda learn and improve the games that they are making. In order for that to occur, they need to be getting accurate, valid criticism at the very least. Offering suggestions for how to fix things like dungeons is nice and all, but honestly, these people have been making games for a few decades now. I think they can come up with the solutions they are willing and able to implement. They just need to be told what it is that they are doing that players don't like. Also, they need to stop rushing their games, but that's another discussion. Okay, so now it's finally time to explain why I find Skyrim Dungeons lacking. And in keeping with the overall thesis of this series, that is people don't get Skyrim, it's actually one of the things people really love to praise about its dungeon design. This past summer I picked up hiking, and through the trials and tribulations of a few trips, I learned the two main things necessary for doing it successfully. Preparation and paying attention. Preparation not just in having the right gear and plenty of water, but also in planning. One of the most important things to do before hitting a trail is figuring out, even roughly, the trails that you're going to be taking. Paying attention is self-explanatory. Make sure you're staying on your trail by referring to maps and learning how to read terrain. Ignore these things and approach hiking like it's going for a walk but surrounded by trees and you're gonna have a bad time. Embracing these elements is what makes it hiking, and applying these skills is part of what makes it fun. Turns out these principles apply to dungeon crawling in games in pretty much the same way. I did a video on Valheim in the beginning of the year, and I really wish I'd been hiking by the time I made that video because this analogy perfectly applies to that game. In Valheim, Preparation is absolutely vital to making a voyage successful. You need to make sure all your gear is in good condition, that you have plenty of food and ideally other consumables, and you need to figure out where you're going to be going, how you're getting there, and how you're going to be getting back home. Failure to do one of these things will probably result in death. Over preparation is also a thing because inventory space is limited. After you've played enough, you'll know what you need to bring for the sort of voyage that you're planning, but there's always a certain degree of uncertainty that will help keep things from getting boring because, well, sometimes shit just goes sideways and you have to adapt and hopefully survive to learn from the experience for the future. This is the heart of Valheim's adventuring experience, and it's brilliantly simple because it simply trusts the player is going to learn what they need to do to survive. In Skyrim, most of this experience is simply not possible because the mechanics were either stripped away or were never there to begin with. For example, death. 
In Valheim, dying is a pretty big deal because you might end up respawning on another continent. Extra preparation can mitigate that, but in general, dying can be a real nuisance. In Skyrim, and pretty much every other Tez game, we can save and reload at any time. The trivial act of hitting the quick save key can save you a lot of headaches, and if you forgot to save and have to repeat a section, it's generally considered to be your fault for not preparing for the possibility of dying. This does end up diminishing the overall thrill and risk with exploring and dungeon crawling, but I'm willing to give that a pass because at least I have the option of not saving if I want to play with some higher stakes. But what about something that we no longer have the option of playing with? Like, say, equipment durability. You know, the thing people hated so much in Oblivion that Bethesda just ripped it out root and stem in Skyrim, even though they added a smithing skill and litter the world in dungeons with forges, grindstones, and armor workbenches. Or how about enchanted item charges? I mean, I'm grateful that the system wasn't removed entirely, but removing the ability for NPCs and cities to top off our charges for a fee is a worrying step in the wrong direction. While, yeah, sure, it wasn't a big break from the routine, heading back to a town to service my equipment was something that helped pace out the dungeon crawling experience in Oblivion a bit. In Skyrim, two of those services are just no longer available. So now, my biggest reason for breaking away from dungeon diving is to just sell off all the loot in my inventory and maybe pick up some more potions. Funny thing about potions, though. While Bethesda removed the pestle and mortar and made it so that alchemy must be performed at a table, encouraging more preparation, health now regenerates over time just like magic and stamina, on top of us still being able to just hit the wait key and skip an hour to regen everything back to full. And on top of all of that, restorative potions are now way more common dungeon loot, so you're never really even going to be strapped for potions even if you're actively ignoring alchemy entirely. One step forward and two steps back, I guess. And in the case of inventory management, if the people who hate it get their way, we might see Bethesda trivialize or outright remove encumbrance too, as if followers weren't doing that enough as it is. People don't seem to understand that in making these demands for mechanics to get stripped out, they are actively encouraging Bethesda to make the dungeon experience worse in these games. So is it really any wonder that Skyrim's dungeon crawling experience is so boring and tedious? When the danger and necessity to prepare has been stripped away, what are we really left with? Well, let's look at what the experience really boils down to now. Going back to the hiking analogy, there's a few terms used to describe the types of routes one might take. That's the loop, the out and back, and the point to point. Simple, self-explanatory terms that also apply to dungeon design. All three route types have different strengths and weaknesses, and depending on the sort of trip you want or need to take, employing one over the other is often beneficial. Starting with that last one first, a point-to-point -point is often the reach a destination sort of route. Shriekwind Bastion is a good example of this type. The dungeon has two entrances the player can come across, and the flow of the dungeon is from one external door to the other. The problem is that this dungeon doesn't really go anywhere. These sorts of dungeons would be better if they helped shave off travel time between major destinations like cities or quest objectives. So the point-to-point -point dungeons of Skyrim kind of misses the point. Haha. <laughs> You know what game did point-to-point -point dungeons well? Fallout 3 with its metro tunnels. But of course, players hated having to navigate appropriately challenging tunnel sections, which actually complemented Fallout 3's combat system well, because they looked samey and super mutants just weren't the most fun enemies to fight. So Bethesda ditched the idea of dungeons actually leading players places because they don't want to force players to run through dungeons. Even though Skyrim still forces players to run through dungeons because dungeon diving is a part of Bethesda's game DNA and that's just not going to go anywhere. You'll be hard-pressed to find out-and-back dungeons in Skyrim because, as the name suggests, this requires backtracking. And Oblivion dungeons ruin that for a lot of players. The revulsion to backtracking seems to be a gaming-exclusive phenomenon because in hiking, out-and-back routes are very common. Maybe even the most common. It's another route that usually involves a destination, but the trip back is usually not offensively tedious because there's usually stuff to see on the way back, and part of the enjoyment is just the act of navigating the trail. Oblivion poisoned this well quite a bit because its out and back dungeons were incredibly monotonous visually, and didn't always feature side chambers the player might have missed on their way to the end of the dungeon. So by the time the player hits the end of the dungeon, they might not have anything worth experiencing on the trip out of the dungeon. And because we aren't hiking here, the act of walking back out of the dungeon isn't really going to have its own intrinsic value in its challenge. Not all Oblivion dungeons were like this, though. Most of them, in fact, had enough optional chambers and alternate routes that the trip out could offer some new stuff to see. But then players would get lost, and players can't be expected to read a map, so there goes that. I don't know, maybe something like a mini-map would have worked. I, I wonder, where have I seen that before? It might sound like I'm blaming Bethesda here, but there's plenty of blame to be passed onto all the players who incorrectly blamed their boredom with Oblivion's dungeons on their layouts and nothing else. They misdiagnosed a lot of the dungeons' samey feel as a symptom of their layouts when it really wasn't that at all most of the time. 
lack of visual variety, dull combat due to level scaling and unoptimized character builds, and no context for why the dungeons even existed were all things that helped contribute to this feeling as well. But people fed Bethesda bad feedback, and then Bethesda did what they've become known for doing and just dropped ideas that were just a few tweaks away from being great and replaced them with even worse ideas. This is how we get stuck with an overwhelming number of dungeons following the loop type route. Typically, you'll do a loop route while hiking because of the convenience factor of ending up where you started and not much more. They're also easiest to replicate and predict, but really it's because you need to get back to your car and so you're going to find a way back that doesn't require backtracking. There is also a bit of catharsis in planning a route that can actually loop back, however. What's funny is that I see players loving the loops in Skyrim dungeons because of that exact same cathartic feeling. You guys really should try it in real life. Trust me, it's even more satisfying. So is it any wonder Skyrim dungeons will begin to feel like an amusement park ride when most of them utilize a route that's best for its convenience factor? Because the need to plan my route and pay attention while navigating has been removed, I'm free to turn my brain off and just follow the straight line to the exit. I can ignore anything behind locked doors because even if lockpicking is now a universal skill, any locked doors that don't have a key are going to be optional. I don't have to prepare much except for clearing my inventory of loot, so I won't be getting to cities very often, and due to the loop-like nature of dungeons, I can bang out a bunch of them in quick succession. This this is why they can feel repetitive and samey. None of them holds you for more than a few minutes, and their streamlined conveniences make it so that you can do several of them back to back very quickly. This is why I said in the beginning that players should never grind dungeons in this game. It's too easy of a habit to fall into, while simultaneously being the surest path to dungeon fatigue. Alright, time to compliment some of the improvements made to dungeons. Like I said, visual variety is a good step up. I also appreciate little things like being able to see the current overworld skybox through holes in the ceiling of the dungeons, and seeing it synced with the actual overworld skybox. That's a pretty neat attention to detail. Speaking of details, I appreciate that almost every dungeon has something going on in them if you care enough to read the environmental details and do some actual reading. There's a cool dungeon near Riften that starts with a, uh, a high elf stormcloak officer? Uh, yeah, sure buddy. But he wants a dragon priest mask located there and employs us to do the dungeon diving for him. So we go through Foral Host and get some interesting lore into the demise of the dragon cult in Skyrim. It ends with us blowing the cover of the obvious Thalmor plant, and it's actually an interesting story the whole way through. Quite a few other dungeons give us little quests or companions to give us things to do while also providing context and history of the dungeon. I also love the traps and environmental hazards in dungeons. When people say how all combat encounters are the same and just boil down to standing there and hitting enemies, I assume they never bother to look up and see the hanging exploding jars, or look down to see their enemies standing in pools of oil, or tried baiting enemies into spike traps, or tricked enemies to run into their own rune traps, or kited enemies into halls of swinging blades, I mean I can go on, but I think you get the picture. Traps add some much needed depth to the environments and dungeons, offering unique dynamic tools that can have a greater impact on combat that's more than just a visual gag. In general, traps in Skyrim are much faster and much deadlier than their Oblivion counterparts. This results in even a seasoned player such as myself falling prey to them from time to time. They often get me when I'm absolutely not paying attention, and going back after a reload will have me realizing how obvious the trap really was. So I guess we should explore some ways we can actually improve what we got here. I'm gonna sidestep the puzzle discussion, because I'm not the right person to get good feedback on puzzles and games. Frankly, I hate them all, and find their inclusion in most games to be tedious time wastes. I'd rather the dungeon and gameplay to be challenging and thought-provoking enough to make it as stimulating as a decent puzzle would be. I don't think Tez 6 ought to rely solely on puzzles to add pacing to its dungeons. Instead, better and more consistent movement options should come standard for all players. Think whirlwind sprint but unlocked from the start of the game, and platforming elements to be used instead. Looting and pretty scenery can also be used to slow the players down if they want to engage with those elements. Apart from just approaching dungeons from a completely different angle, one that expects the player to actually struggle in dungeons and learn to respect their dangers and challenges, I guess playing with the different route types would be a way to cheat a bit. The out and back dungeons could make a comeback if dungeons utilize two routes that would both meet back up at their destination. This way, if the player reached the end, they really only cleared half the dungeon and could spend the time going back the route they didn't take. Bethesda could also mess with reinforcements coming into the dungeon, so even if the player is backtracking, they are at least not backtracking through empty halls. Experimenting with more dungeon types is also something that would work, and it's something that they did do quite a bit in Skyrim, but because people never mention places like Lost Valley Redoubt, I'm led to believe most players never even saw it. Fallout 4 did a lot of experimenting with things that didn't even really feel like dungeons, and I think it worked well in some instances, though it's a bit easier to do that in an urban setting. Ultimately though, I just don't think the dungeon experience can truly be saved until Bethesda stops taking advice from players who don't even seem to understand that risk and challenge are two things that make exploration worthwhile.
I figured I was going to need to play a few characters in order to do the melee analysis section justice. As a result, I ended up settling on three characters to get the job done. My first one was a standard sword and board that was as allergic to magic as I could make it, though shouts were allowed for reasons we'll get into in a minute. The second was a two-handed build that was pulling double duty as a destruction spell sword, which proved interesting. The third was one I played on stream, and that was a dual-wielding conjured blades build that had some backup magic for defense, but almost exclusively relied on power attacks for the bulk of its damage dealing. When I came up with how I was going to do these videos, I figured Melee was going to be the most boring to play, which was why I stuck it in as video number two. Turns out, these were three of the most fun characters I ever played in Vanilla Skyrim, and this has left me with a lot of questions that I need to answer in this section. I've rewritten this section three times now because I'm struggling to reconcile what my experience was like playing a Melee character with the experiences of many others who have played Melee and considered it irredeemably bad. I know the whole thesis of these videos is that people have been getting Skyrim wrong, but when looking at some of the other videos out there, I have to wonder how people are coming to such radically different conclusions than I am. Depending on the video, my reasoning has swayed between, eh, they just didn't give the game enough time and attention, to, yeah, this guy has definitely got some kind of agenda. The time and attention issue is a funny one because a lot of these videos open up with the YouTuber saying how they've sunk hundreds of hours into Skyrim, but for various reasons, they gotta get some stuff off their chest. Underestimating how much time you need to invest into playing and researching a game is an easy trap to fall into when doing these sorts of videos. Assuming a few hundred hours with the game overall would get the job done seems like a safe assumption, but not necessarily, especially in Skyrim's case when you take mods into account. There's a difference between playing a game for pleasure with a sh ton of mods over the course of several years and playing it vanilla for a few weeks with the exclusive intention of analyzing it. I say this as someone who did fall into that trap and allowed assumptions and vague impressions that formed after a decade with the game to shape my actual opinions. But playing three melee-focused characters in a completely vanilla environment and actually having fun has made me realize how wrong some of those impressions really have been. Sure, it required me to accept Skyrim for what it is and not what it could have been, but there is some fun to be had here. The agenda issue is something that frankly irks me. Probably the most common question I get asked is how I decide what games to compare to other games when doing these sorts of videos, and my answer is usually something like, they need to be fair comparisons. The problem with Elder Scrolls games is that there just really isn't anything out there like them, which is why 90% of the time I'm comparing them to each other. I rarely see games that are trying to do what even parts of Tez games try to do. This is honestly one of the reasons I loved Valheim so much. In a lot of ways, that game captures and sometimes exceeds what Elder Scrolls games are trying to do with letting players make their own adventures. So when I see so many people comparing Skyrim to the likes of Dark Souls when talking about combat, yeah, I get a little bit tilted. From the mouth of the creative directors themselves, Dark Souls is about letting players experience the pleasure of overcoming hardship, while Elder Scrolls games are about letting players live whatever lives they want to live in a dynamic world. So already it should be apparent that combat in Dark Souls is a central priority for the developers, while Skyrim's combat was just another thing that needed to be good enough not to ruin the experience for most players. I don't want to get all blackpilled in assuming some videos just use Skyrim as a punching bag because Skyrim fans aren't going to clap back, but when I see Skyrim and Dark Souls invoked in the same video about a game unrelated to either, yeah, I get a little bit suspicious that Skyrim is just being used to play the role as Babby's first video game. If that's the approach you're taking with analyzing Skyrim's combat, you're coming in from a position of bad faith. This doesn't offend me as a Skyrim fan because, well, I'm not one. No, this offends me as a critic. Deciding to hate on Skyrim because no one's going to call you out and everyone else is doing it is just weak. But people missing the point of combat in an Elder Scrolls game is nothing new. Elder Scrolls games in general have always had an awkward relationship with their combat systems and explaining themselves to the audience. From Morrowind's hybrid dice roll action-based system that many players confused for a purely action-based system, to Oblivion's floaty combat riddled with damage sponges, and finally to Skyrim's system that gets lambasted for basically the same reasons as Oblivion's, there's always been one fault that runs through all of them, lack of visual feedback. It's shocking how often I see complaints of Skyrim whacking around the bad animations bush because people seem to assume this is a pleb reason to criticize a combat system. I mean, they're kinda right, especially when it comes to Marwind, but by 2011, it seemed reasonable to ask a major AAA developer to have their action combat system have at least something going on visually speaking. The audio experience in Skyrim is nothing to write home about either, and I firmly believe that had these two things been top tier in Skyrim, a lot more people would have walked away with favorable opinions of the combat because at least it would have had the appeal of style. Visual clues do matter a lot in an action-based system because it tells you who's actually winning in a fight. This is probably why I see so many people claiming that they have a hard time following Skyrim's combat, because at first glance, nothing seems to be happening. There is stuff happening, it just all looks like mannequins whacking each other with foam bats. But I'll clue you into what the combat system of Skyrim is all about. It's options. 
When I see people compare Skyrim to Kingdom Come Deliverance and more how I go, well, points for at least picking games that are first person, but can you use magic in those games? A clever guy might invoke Dishonored, but I wouldn't say Melee in those games feels particularly good either. Elder Scrolls games have always compensated for their bring your own imagination combat systems by drowning the player in tons of options. Well, then Oblivion happened and a lot was cut. Then Skyrim happened and even more was cut. Honestly, the only people who really should have an axe to grind with Skyrim's combat sandbox are older Tez fans because those games had far more on tap. In their quest to reduce redundancy, Bethesda stripped out a lot, particularly in Magic, though Melee and Range suffered too. Whether it's seen as dumbing down or streamlining, the results are the same. Less options overall to focus the gameplay on what remains. But before we focus on what remains, I do want to address a very real constraint on the combat system that I pretty much never see anyone address, and that's the fact that these games are primarily a first-person experience. Melee in a first-person game, it's a tough thing to crack. By virtue of the fact that developers are not trying to make games that will make most players motion sick, combat in these sorts of games will always be a step or two slower than third-person action games. Things like dodge rolls are obviously out of the question, and as someone who gets motion sick from a lot of games' camera shakes and first-person head bobbing, I'm gonna go ahead and veto the sidestep to replace dodge roll suggestion I've seen floated a few times. This is why I don't usually find myself agreeing with people who claim Skyrim's combat wasn't nearly as good as it should have or could have been. In spirit, I agree. There was a lot of room for improvement. But when people follow that statement up with, so they need to tear the whole thing down and start from scratch, here's a list of 40 mods that I used to make Skyrim have Dark Souls combat. Yeah, I'm closing out the video. The bitter pill a lot of people don't want to swallow is that Skyrim's melee combat is about 70% of the potential we'll likely see from melee-focused combat in a first-person game. If there was a way of doing it, well, we'd have seen it by now. Sure, Tez6 could implement things like parries and contextual combat based on exploiting animations, which Fallout 4's melee system started to mess with anyways, but there's not a whole lot left to do to make the games more mechanically skill-based. And once again, making the combat of Elder Scrolls mechanically skill-based is completely missing the point of the franchise in general. Some people will say, well, the game has a third-person camera, just force the player into that perspective when they get into combat. I don't think this is a smart idea either. A first-person perspective offers players a more visceral and intimate connection with the game. Forcing every player out of that during the most exciting parts of the experience would feel like the player is being robbed of something. And what is to really be gained? To make Elder Scrolls games feel like other games out there? Maybe not all of us want to play a game that demands getting good at timing frames perfect parries to survive every encounter. Maybe we like letting stats, levels, and equipment be the big factor in determining the outcome of encounters. There's much better ways to improve the Skyrim combat experience, at least with how it feels. But I'll save that for when we get to discussing melee weapons in the next section. One of the most common complaints I see about Skyrim's combat is that it's shallow. But is it actually that shallow, or are people mistaking its simplicity for shallowness? Let me propose a hypothetical situation. Say you're a melee character fighting on some low terrain and you got an archer harassing you from a ledge. What do you do? If your answer is run around the dungeon and take the path up to get into melee range, congratulations, you're ruining the experience for yourself. The correct answer is use unrelenting force to blow him off the ledge, or use ice form to incapacitate him and let physics handle the rest, or have a ranged follower in your party who you can order to focus on the enemy, or use a nearby oil pot to burn the enemy off its ledge. Okay, how about a difficult boss fight at the end of a dungeon? If your answer is chug potions until it's dead, once again, you're ruining the experience for yourself. Use level ups to unlock new combat moves, or start packing some poisons, or use marked for death to weaken the boss, or figure out what elements and types of damage that enemy is weak to and exploit that, or maybe use that staff and those scrolls that have been sitting in your inventory for ages. Skyrim's major fault is not in it lacking tactical options, it's in its habit of not pushing the player towards using those options. Well, also, it's its punishing leveling system, but hang on to that thought. Skyrim is terrified of two things, forcing the player to commit to something and showing the player numbers. Aside from the bad animations and sound effects, I really believe the commitment issue is the source of many complaints people have about combat, especially melee. Because Skyrim doesn't want to force the player to pick up blocking, the player is technically free to ignore it. The result is terrible, and I'd argue is the wrong way to play any melee character that isn't dual wielding, but it is possible. You can brute force your way through every engagement, soaking in tons of damage, guzzling potions, and constantly backtracking and jumping onto ledges where enemies will have a hard time chasing you. But this is how you end up proving true of those analysis videos that claim Skyrim combat is people standing around whacking each other with pool noodles. You'd be forgiven for thinking blocking is optional because it is a dedicated skill after all, but yeah, it's not. Getting into the rhythm of blocking and shield bashing was something that actually took me a bit when I first started to play the sword and board orc. But once it started clicking, I realized the potential for what I could do with it thanks to its ability to stagger. 
Before long, I was bullying enemies off of ledges into traps into my allies' field of fire, or using it to isolate enemies from their allies. Suddenly, I found myself playing the game way more tactically, and surprise, surprise, I was dying a lot less and having a lot more fun. This was all before I'd even invested more than a couple of perk points into the skill, proving it's not something you're meant to ignore. But hang on, that sounds like mechanical skill to me, and you just said Tez games shouldn't have mechanical depth. No, having a game with no mechanical depth is how you end up making interactive movies. Some level of mechanical skill depth is necessary to make any game be a game, especially an action RPG. I just don't think we need to go very far with Skyrim's system. Let's not pretend there's no middle ground between Dark Souls and Cookie Clicker. This got me thinking of new ways that I could bully enemies with my shield, and it didn't take long for me to find the veggie soup strat. Once again, I will not blame you for forgetting or not even knowing Skyrim has a cooking system. For the most part, it's kind of terrible and was something that saw much better iterations in Fallout 4 and 76. One of the few useful things that you can cook up though is vegetable soup. This just requires a head of cabbage, a leek, a potato, and a tomato. With four simple ingredients you can find all over the place in the game, you can literally invalidate stamina management for the rest of the game. This is because the soup provides one point of health and stamina regen per second for 720 seconds. This might not sound like a whole lot, but when I mention power attacks and bashes only require one point of stamina to execute, the true potential here should become more obvious. Unfortunately for us, stamina is a few degrees more complex than Magicka, so let's cover some basics here first. All characters start with 100 base stamina, and certain actions taken by the player will consume a specific amount of stamina. Those actions typically are sprinting, power attacks, bashes, rolling while sneaking, and zooming with a bow. Though for the sake of this discussion, we'll focus on those first three. Perks, skill levels, and many other things can decrease the amount of stamina consumed when performing those actions, but there's always going to be some fixed cost per action. Assume a player has 100 stamina, and each power attack costs 30 stamina to perform. You might assume the player can then only perform 3 power attacks because 30 times 3 is 90 stamina, leaving only 10 stamina left, 20 shy of the cost to perform another power attack. But that's not how Skyrim works. The player can actually perform 4 power attacks because they still have 10 points of stamina, and doing a power attack only requires at least 1 to execute. This is because Skyrim's stamina system actually allows the player to go negative with it. To compensate, if the player goes negative, the player's natural stamina regen is delayed by a few seconds depending on how negative they went. This timer might range anywhere from 1 to 7 seconds. Once the timer reaches 0, stamina will begin to regen. You might have noticed when you're sprinting and you run your stamina all the way to 0, your stamina regen is delayed by a little bit. This is that timer in action. So if you pop off all 4 power attacks, you might be waiting a bit for your stamina regen. Don't ask me why they bothered with this negative system with timers and sh** because I've been sitting here for 10 minutes trying to figure out why they do this as opposed to just making it so that you need at least the amount of stamina needed to perform the action, but I just cannot come up with any rational explanation. In order for restore stamina effects to work, they needed to make it so that those effects instantly reset that timer. So once you drink a restore stamina potion, you immediately start regenerating stamina. As a result, if you have a restore stamina effect with a duration on it, that timer will constantly be getting reset meaning your stamina will constantly be at least one, meaning you can constantly use power attacks and bashes. Because it's absolutely trivial finding the resources to make veggie soup, I'd just make a ton of it and down a bowl before entering a dungeon or before a big fight. So a lot of fights went from looking like this, to this. Is it exploity? Yeah, probably, but it sure as hell does look funny. But you don't have to invalidate the stamina system to have fun as a melee character. More often than not, I wasn't even rocking the veggie soup. I just used careful stamina management and a mix of light attacks, power attacks, shield bashes, and shouts to get the job done. Either way, I was usually having fun because I was using all the tools I had available to me. Sure, I could have sat there eating my soup, stunlocking every enemy I came across, and chugging a bunch of potions when I ran into trouble, but playing a game using the exact same strategy the whole time is boring, and boredom is enough to convince me to mix things up. A lot of my silly strategies like the veggie soup exploit came about because I wanted to experiment with the tools that the game was giving me. The game didn't care whether I was using the most optimal tactics for this specific encounter, or if I was completely ignoring one of my core attributes, it just let me wreak havoc how I wanted to do it. This was very refreshing for my experience with a pure mage character which, outside of illusion, seemed to be operating under a no fun allowed rule set. This is, and has always been, the core appeal of Elder Scrolls games for me. 
I've seen so many people callously dismiss my enjoyment out of Skyrim as just the most basic response to the reward feedback from collecting loot. But I left my grinding days behind with RuneScape. For me, finding a game that lets me mess around with its systems in unique ways the developers clearly didn't intend is something I find deeply satisfying. If you're the type of player that is looking for a more carefully designed and purpose-built game that's absolutely going to let you know you should be blocking using power attacks, that's fine. Skyrim's probably not going to be the game for you. But to say Skyrim lacks any sort of mechanical depth because you ignored all the instances where it does have depth is just silly. In writing this section, I came up with another melee magic build that would let me invalidate investing into stamina and health. Can't hurt what you can't hit. And I want to break away and try that build out. That doesn't sound like something that should happen in a game that has no depth, or is as deep as a puddle. God, how many times have I heard that one? If you decide to return to Skyrim after watching this, my best advice is get creative. Try things you never tried before, adapt when you run into trouble, and see how the game reacts. But let's return to those two things Skyrim is terrified of, forcing the player to commit and showing the player numbers. I wasn't just talking about committing to using mechanics that would work for the player, I meant committing to anything. Here's where we start to get into the dark side of this combat sandbox. A lot of players wholeheartedly believed in the notion Bethesda was trying to sell with Skyrim that players were free to pick up anything and do anything at any given time. Get sick of using two-handed weapons and their slow swing speeds? Eh, just switch to one-handed weapons. It'll be fine. Uh, no. No, it really won't be fine. Unless you're making that switch very early on in your playthrough, switching your main source of damage dealing is awful. Playthrough ruining even. This is another example of something you can technically do, but damn is it gonna suck. This isn't something I can even blame players for, because with the removal of classes and the open fluid-like nature of the skill system, it seems like an option that would always be there. The reason Skyrim did away with the class system that has been a staple of these games since Arena was because some players really hated f up a character build and having no option but to start a new character with the skills they now want to play with. Skyrim's leveling system is, in theory, supposed to do away with classes so that players can switch skills midstream or pick up a new skill without being penalized for it. This also meant that the tutorial didn't have to introduce every skill present in the game, like pickpocketing its speech, because the player would be free to pick those up later after being introduced to them during something like the Thieves Guild. The problem is that the leveling system of Skyrim is a complete black box because of its crippling arithmophobia. And even if we could look under the hood to see what runs this fluid leveling system, we'd all develop that phobia too. Because it's such a tangled nightmare of formulas that I don't think anyone actually knows how it really works. Okay, the formulas are out there, and I'm sure there are a few people who do understand them, but figuring out when you're going to hit character level 12 from grinding your smithing skill is literally impossible in-game. Real quick for those who are unaware or need a refresher, Skyrim has two types of levels. Skill levels for each of the individual 18 skills in the game, and the character level, which, when leveled up, is when the player gets to invest in one of the three attributes and gets a perk point to drop into one of the skill trees. To gain a character level, the player needs to level up their skills. In previous Tez games, there was always some fixed number of level ups that the player needed to get in their major skills in order to earn a character level up. In Oblivion, it was 10. So if one of your major skills in Oblivion was block, 10 skill ups in block would get you the next character level up. Because Skyrim doesn't have major and minor skills, all skill level increases will contribute to a character level up. The thing is, there's no set number of skill level ups needed to gain a character level up. We now have character level up XP instead. That XP is a number that we cannot see, so that alone is putting a big blinder on the player trying to figure out when they are going to get their next character level up. The other thing is that skills do not contribute the same amount of XP. XP is awarded based on the skills level compared to every other skills level. For example, if smithing is your highest skill and pickpocketing is your lowest skill, leveling up smithing will award the most character XP and pickpocketing will award the least. Because they all award their amount proportionate to each other, you have no idea how much XP you will be earning to contribute to a total XP amount you can't even see. So now you can start to see why you might be in serious trouble if you decide at character level 25 and skill level 65 you just had enough with two-handed weapons and now you want to use bows, which has a skill level of 15. Don't worry though, skill XP gain is based off of other XP curves, but they aren't proportionate to one another or use some other equally confusing relationship. So you can grind those levels, but you might end up in the situation where you got too many high level skills. And in which case, your archery skill just isn't going to be contributing much to your character XP gain. This is a serious problem if you need perk points to invest into that archery tree now to make that bow actually functional in combat, especially higher leveled combat where you're going to be fighting enemies that will now be outclassing you in damage output. 
this is why this system just doesn't actually work, like, at all. Cool, I can switch to a bow if my character level is like 6, but if I want to change that to 25? Fuck no! And how long does it take for me to hit level 6? Maybe 5 hours? So Bethesda made this whole convoluted leveling system that needs to be obfuscated because the math is an eldritch horror just to save the player the agony of losing, what, 5 hours of progress on a character? There isn't enough snark and sarcasm in the world to get across how bad of an idea this was. Oh, and this is ignoring all those perk points you might have invested into that skill you're now dumping, and all those increases to an attribute you might no longer want to use. Say goodbye to all of that until you complete the Dragonborn DLC and unlock the ability to at least refund all the perk points in a skill tree. You could also go the insane route and legendary a skill, which is another thing. If you max out a skill at level 100, you have the option to turn that skill legendary, which resets the skill back to 15 and refunds all the invested perk points. But be careful, just because the skill says it's 15 doesn't actually mean it's not going to make your lower skills level up any faster. I tested that. My block skill awarded the same amount of character XP regardless of whether all my magic skills were 100 or legendary back to 15. That's cute. So why would you legendary a skill if it's not going to help get that skill out of the way to be replaced by your new favorite skill? Because legendary skills still award character XP. So you can farm them for character level ups and thus perk points. And that's really it. If you want to push past the character level cap of 81 that you will hit if you get every major skill to 100, or if you just want more perk points, legendary is your route. But all of this, the unpredictable character level ups, the punishing nature of perk points, the inconsistent XP curves for the different skills, non-refundable attribute points, and Skyrim standing there silently as you fuck all this up, all of it plays in how effective your character will be in combat. This is why I said people who are having problems with the level scaling system are probably having issues with the leveling system and just don't know it. Because the game tells you nothing and will let you do all of this, while its design implies it's so simple you shouldn't even have to think about it. Now you have a character that has a couple of wasted perks here, a dead skill there, not enough points invested into health, and now you're getting bodied by enemies that you know are getting more difficult. It's easy to blame the level scaling system for making the difficulty outpace your character, but the truth is, the truth is you just had a bad character and you didn't even know it because Skyrim said it's all fine. There's probably a few other general topics worth broaching, but we still got five skills we need to talk about in more detail, and I want to keep this short. The astute viewer might be thinking, five skills? I thought combat had six skills in it. You're correct. Technically, the combat skills are smithing, heavy armor, block, one-handed, two-handed, and archery. I'm going to be punting archery over to video number three when we talk the stealth playstyle, because if I don't, that means we'll have to cover three offensive abilities here and no offensive abilities in the stealth video, because the stealth combat style has no offensive skills outside of pickpocketing poisons onto enemies. Funny thing is that the stealth standing stone actually includes archery, so if you pick the combat standing stone, you won't be getting that increased XP gain to archery. How is anyone even supposed to know that? I'm going to make the executive decision here to group our discussion of one-handed and two-handed weapons together. These skills are so similar that even their trees look almost identical. If I separated them, I'd just be repeating myself a lot, so I'm going to channel some Bethesda magic here and reduce redundancy. In terms of cuts from Oblivion to Skyrim, there's not a whole lot that didn't make the jump. The removal of short blades kind of sucks, but with how little of a presence they had in terms of unique items in Oblivion, there's probably quite a few people who forgot they even existed. There's the odd removal here and there, things like sabers and clubs, but almost everything carried over completely intact. Despite limited cuts, no new weapon types were added. Instead, Bethesda spent their energy on recategorizing melee weapons from the awkward bleed and blunt skills into the more sensible one-handed and two-handed skills. This is a change I agree with because it's a sound argument to make that, from a technique and skill perspective, there's far more overlap between a Warhammer and a Claymore than there is between a Warhammer and a Mace. And now we no longer have a game trying to gaslight people into thinking axes are a blunt instrument. Unfortunately, Skyrim also decided to inherit Oblivion's hidden weapon attributes, and even added a few more. Things like weapon reach and swing speed are fixed to each weapon type, but the player will have no idea what those numbers are, forcing them to try to infer those things when they go to swing them. This can lead to awkward moments like when I thought axes in Skyrim had a shorter reach than swords when they are in fact the same. How many of you knew that maces are meant to stagger your enemies more than swords, and that's meant to be one of the advantages to using them? Another fun fact about hidden attributes, great swords and battle axes both have the same swing speed because great swords were erroneously set to the same value. The unofficial patch fixed that, but this dunks on the idea that players would infer these values when even the devs didn't notice the swing speeds being identical between two entire weapon types. Of the attributes we can see, base damage, item weight, and item value remain. 
Swords sport the lowest base damage, Axes land in the middle, and Hammer Maces top the charts. The order remains identical for item weight too. Item value doesn't really matter except for those few players who really care about an item's weight to value ratio, so let's talk materials instead. Once again, not much was cut. Rusty iron, fine iron, fine steel, and silver were left in the rearview mirror, but they were replaced by other materials like Nordic, Skyforge, Steel, Dragonbone, and quite a few more from the expansion in CC. Yes, companion players, I hear you. Silver is actually in Skyrim. I played the companions too, after all, for their upcoming section. I didn't miss the fact that the silver hands were equipped with silver weapons. Thing is, those weapons only come as swords and greatswords and can only be looted off of silver hand bandits. They can't be found anywhere else, can't be purchased, and they can't be crafted. Even CC only added a silver set of armor, so we don't even have paid mods to bail this argument out with an exception. This is a shame too, because silver weapons actually do an extra 20 points of base damage to undead enemies and werewolves. I say that's a shame because, oh yeah, material attributes are gone now too. No longer will you need to use silver, elven, daedric, or enchanted weapons on things like ghosts and wraiths. I mean, no surprise there, if they removed item durability because it triggered players who hate preparation in their adventures, they definitely weren't keeping a system that made certain enemies completely immune to damage if the player wasn't prepared. So, people who discredit Skyrim weapons for basically being the same across the board aren't really wrong. What? Surprised I agree with them? As much of a contrarian as I am, even I can't play devil's advocate for the minute differences between them. Really, the biggest distinguishing features between them is whether they are one-handed or two-handed. The chance for them to shine was in their perks, but Bethesda botched this in one of the saddest ways possible, which has resulted in a lot of back and forth on discussion boards since 2011. So let's talk perks. Both trees follow pretty much the same exact lines. A 5 rank perk to start things off that, at max, will double the base damage of the weapons governed by the skill. The pommel gives us a single stamina cost reduction perk at 25%, and then a 4. Standing power attacks do 25% more damage with a chance to decapitate enemies, and a sprinting power attack that can do double critical damage. The end of the tree gives us a backwards power attack with a 25% chance to paralyze enemies. Two-handed gets an extra perk before that, which lets power attacks hit all enemies in front of you. Look, I really wasn't lying when I said the trees are identical, and it only gets worse from here because even their branches are almost identical. With the exception of the branch in one-handed that leads into dual wielding, more on that in just a bit, we get three paths that all lead to three rank perks that relate to swords, axes, and hammer maces. These perks are also identical. Swords get a chance to crit, axes do bleed damage, and hemaces ignore enemy armor. These perks come to meet at an unholy crossroad where hidden attributes, inconsistent attributes, hidden enemy attributes, unexplained mechanics, poorly worded perk descriptions, and that players should just feel it design philosophy all come together to create one of the biggest wrecks in Skyrim that ends up chopping the melee system down at the knees. A very common question melee players end up asking when looking at these trees is, What's the difference between bleed damage, armor penetration, and critical damage? A lot of players assume not much at all. Considering how the DPS values for all the weapons end up equaling out almost entirely, a lot of players think this means weapon choice really does just boil down to preference and not much else. Up until this point, yes, that's true. When taking these three perks into account, though, you'd be wrong! To break this down, we have to get into the weeds here, so let's talk power attacks. Unlike Oblivion, where power attacks were pretty much useless because lower fatigue reduced damage output, power attacks in Skyrim are not as big of a trap. I mean, they still kind of are, especially when you get into things like improving weapons with smithing and enchanting, and so attacking as fast as possible will out-damage power attacks, but they are still useful for stunning enemies, interrupting actions, and generally just manipulating the flow of a fight. Power attacks are directional, so holding forward while performing one will do a lunging attack to close the gap, while doing one backwards will perform something meant to create distance. Sideways power attacks perform a sweeping move that can get behind an enemy's defenses or hit an adjacent target. If you pick up that charging power attack perk, you'll end up doing the damage of a power attack plus a double critical strike. All of this makes power attacks very situationally useful. They're best for opening a fight, ending a fight early, or breaking in enemy's defenses. Anything else and it's mostly a waste. Critical strikes cannot be performed without unlocking them with the appropriate perks. They work by adding another hidden attribute of each weapon in the form of a bonus critical damage value to the total damage of the hit. This value cannot be increased in any way outside of the perks governing critical strikes. The bonus damage, up to plus 50% with rank 3 of the perks, is actually calculated off the base damage of the weapon. So a Daedric Sword, which has a critical damage value of 7 and a base damage value of 14, can end up doing an extra 14 points of damage during a critical strike. This might not sound like a lot, and well, that's because it's not. The benefit crits have is that they ignore enemy armor and no enemy is immune to them, which cannot be said for armor penetration or bleed damage. So, since we're here, let's talk about armor penetration. 
Armor in Skyrim is weird because, surprise, surprise, it has its own hidden values that you have no chance of intuiting by just playing. This isn't the armor part of this video, so I won't dive into a breakdown of how armor values work, but for the sake of shitting on armor penetration perks, we don't have to understand the system because almost no enemies outside of bandits and Falmer even wear armor. That simple fact should already make it obvious why this is probably the most worthless of all the perks. So if you do make macers your preferred weapon type, you might as well skip the perks because not even dragons have an armor rating. Yeah, you heard me right. The creatures whose scales and bones make the best armor in the game don't have an armor rating that the perk can bypass. If you are fighting armored enemies, apparently the perk actually over delivers because of how armor penetration works with applying extra damage. But still not something I was able to feel when I was doing my testing, so who's to say if it actually does much? Bleed is the last, and it's kind of a joke too. While it is effective against more enemies than armor penetration, things like undead and dormer automatons are still immune to its effect. Bleed is nice because it can stack, and the damage also ignores armor rating, but the damage still ends up amounting to very little. Bleed damage is, of course, another hidden value of each weapon that isn't derived off of any values we can see in game, so once again, just something you gotta feel. I doubt there's anyone on this planet perceptive enough to notice that orcish axes do more bleed damage than any other axe south of Ebony. A Daedric axe with three levels in its bleed perk will give three bonus damage per second for six seconds, resulting in 18 extra damage total. But it can stack, so six seconds can probably let you stack it three times or so. Still not much, but it is constant, as opposed to critical hits that only have a chance to occur. Just make sure you print out the bleed damage chart because the perk description is not at all informative, and each material type is all over the place in their damage and duration. Just look at this, there's no rhyme or reason at all. The perks increase the duration of the bleed effect for iron, but every other material has their bleed damage increased by the perks while their duration remains the same. The damage increases are another cluster of inconsistency, steel going plus 1, plus 1.7, and plus 2.3 all lasting 3 seconds. Dwarven goes 1.2, 1.75, and 2 for 4 seconds. Daedric goes 2, 2.5, and 3 for 6 seconds. Then you look at Orcish and wonder what the f happened. 1, 1.5, and 2 damage for 4 seconds, 4 seconds, and then 8 seconds. Why? These perks then run into the other parts of the UI that refuse to show numbers, so you gotta be really in tune with how long fights are supposed to last in Skyrim at your given character level, uh, one-handed and two-handed skill levels, the difficulty you're playing on, and the types of enemies that you are fighting in order to figure out which weapon type you want to rock for the best experience. Or just ignore all that bullshit and go with one-handed swords because they have the second highest swing speeds, and once you start improving your weapons, landing more blows becomes the name of the game above all else. Actually, daggers are technically the best melee weapons DPS-wise, but their short reach can be a hindrance in of itself. But a dagger shield build would be quite potent because if you get into a situation with an enemy blocking, you can just shield bash them to open them up to more dagger spam. Or you could go the dual dagger route. I'm actually going to talk about daggers more in the stealth video, so instead let's talk about the dual conjured sword character I ran on stream. Dual wielding is actually pretty fun, one of the genuinely fantastic additions made to Skyrim's combat system. It's got plenty of shortcomings, which has earned it plenty of detractors, but if you really want a chaotic, high-risk, high-reward melee experience, yeah, go ahead and give dual wielding a whirl. In terms of perks, you only get three for dual wielding, and presumably the weapon type specific perks if you really wanted to wade into that, but the perks that increase dual wielded speed and power attack damage will actually apply whether you use your left hand weapon or not. So long as there's a weapon in that slot, the perk will be active. This actually leads into some nice quality of life improvements for mining speed. The downside of dual wielding is that you give up your ability to block, and magic becomes more tedious to use. There's a bit of a quirk when dual wielding weapons that I discovered while playing this character on stream. I'll, uh, I'll let my past self demonstrate what that is. At King, the left weapon doesn't work? Don't tell me that. That's gonna make this even more fucking annoying. Oh, wait. oh my god, you're right. Oh, that's fucking brutal. Why? Why? <laughs> it's literally like, this is, they have perks related to dual wielding and stuff, and I can't even hotkey them. Oh. <laughs> Alright, well, Blood Scythe starts with a B, so I know where that's going to be on the... <sighs> okay, so Blood Scythe will always be at the top. This is, this is what I'm being reduced to. And then go in here and right click that. That's, that's how it's gotta be. So yeah, 
you cannot hotkey weapons to slot into your left hand. Spells and shields will automatically equip into the left hand slot if there's a weapon in the right hand, but one-handed weapons will only ever slot into the right hand. This means if you switch to, say, a healing spell, you then have to go digging through a menu to put your offhand weapon back on. This became tedious so damn quickly that I wound up ditching my upgraded weapons for Conjured Swords again because the Bound Weapon spell is able to correctly equip the weapons. Just another reason why this build ended up being such a fun character to mess around with. Coupling it with Veggie Soup, getting all the dual wielded related perks, the base damage perks for the one-handed weapons, because that applies to Conjured Swords as well, and the perk to increase Bound Weapon damage, this character became a walking blender. Conjured minions and a tanky companion also kept enemies off of me most of the time, letting me move around the field, deleting enemies with impunity. Sadly, there was one thing I couldn't add to the meme, and that was Elemental Fury. Elemental Fury is a shout that increases weapon swing speed, and three levels of it will make you swing really fast. Using this with dual-wielded weapons is usually a treat, but this shout doesn't work on enchanted weapons, and bound weapons are considered enchanted. Elemental Fury is fantastic for really any melee character, but dual-wielded characters and two-handed characters can get a lot of mileage out of the shout. In looking back at the script, I realized I kind of forgot to mention shouts as a warrior, which is a bit of an oversight because I'd argue the inspiration for shouts was given melee players access to dumbed down magic. Ironically, shouts can sometimes overshadow magic with effects that aren't available as spells, but this isn't the magic video. Please, God, don't make me think about vanilla magic again. There was a point during my sword and board orc character where I just gave up and ran through the main story to get dragon rend, and that was during the god awful fight that I got on screen right now. If you're a melee only character, dragons are, <laughs> well, there's not enough expletives in the English language to convey the frustration of dealing with these fucking terrible fights. I find it shocking how bad the experience can be when Todd is historically a barbarian player. You would think then that playtesting would have at least exposed how miserable of a time a barbarian play would have in this game. Doubly ironic because this is the game where the barbarian playstyle would actually be thematically appealing to players. I got sick of literally standing there having my mage follower carrying my ass for most of these fights, so I went ahead and got the skeleton key equivalent to dragon encounters. A lot of the shouts I was using as a warrior, I also used as a mage. Unrelenting force, become ethereal, slow time. Disarm sounds like it would be a useful shout, but anytime I found an enemy I actually cared enough to try disarming, the shout failed because it's just not effective against enemies past a certain level, and apparently that upper limit is pretty damn low. This was also rendered obsolete by Disarming Bash, which has no level limit, and it was easier to use since I didn't have to equip it like I did the shout. The elemental breaths were mid, but Ice Form was pretty useful. You'd think the elemental breaths would be something we'd be using against dragons, but their weak damage, limited range, and painfully long cooldowns rendered them completely non-viable. Marked for Death was actually a very useful shout as a melee player, and I wish I had unlocked it sooner. It was rare that I ran into an enemy that I actually felt I really needed to use it on, even when I stepped up to playing on Legendary difficulty, but I appreciated it when I had the occasional Dragon Priest filtering my ass. If you can actually get them to work, the Illusion Stand-In spells would be a nice crowd control, but I'd rather use things like Ice Form or Unrelenting Force. But that's really the extent I found myself using Shouts as a Warrior. I was definitely using them more than my Mage, but they were still held back by way too long of cooldowns, making me forget that they were even there half the time, so they never really became a part of my playstyle, unlike things like Shield Bash. Alright, time for the obligatory combat redesign portion of this video. The goal here is to expand on what we already have, because like I said, I think Skyrim was mechanically close to being pretty solid. So we are not going to turn this into a fast game of dodge rolling and frame perfect parries. Actually, my suggestions will likely slow combat down even more, turning it into a careful high stakes game of rock paper scissors where stats, preparation, and decision making play the defining roles in who is gonna win. This, I think, aligns much more neatly with what Elder Scrolls is trying to do, because coupling these changes with much stronger visual and audio elements would make it incredibly immersive for players who are in it for that experience, and more tactically rich for fans of deeper RPG elements. Also, this would make each encounter more meaningful, so Bethesda doesn't have to break the engine trying to put more NPCs on screen. There's your, lol, creation engine can't do big battles joke for this series, and also it can on PC, you know, just saying. I'm gonna assume the old attribute and class system is not coming back, so I'll save my breath advocating on its return, but it still doesn't really make any sense that getting better with a weapon class makes you do more damage. I'd rather a physical attribute of my character do that instead, so let's remove anything base damage increasing from skills entirely and tie weapon damage increases to health and call that new attribute vitality or something. Stamina can do something similar with bows, but I'm not talking about stealth in this video, so let's avoid that tangent. One-handed and two-handed skill increases would now simply decrease stamina cost for power attacks, 
figure your character is learning how to swing their weapon more efficiently. As I also said, perks were a chance to make the different weapons distinguish themselves, so let's embrace that. Rework the trees to focus on adding new moves in the vein of the charging power attack perk. Those are much more interesting than just base damage increases to weapons, and is more indicative of what getting better with a weapon would actually do. The perks that strictly added bleed, armor, penetration, and crits, yeah, they're now gone. We're gonna implement those elements directly into weapon choice and those unlockable moves. In my Skyrim Mage video, I suggested bringing back mastery perks like the ones that we had in Oblivion. One-handed and two-handed skills will now automatically gain higher crit chances when you hit Apprentice, Adept, Expert, and Master in those skills. This implies your character is getting better at targeting weak points on an enemy, and that makes sense if they're getting better with using their weapon. We can also make landing backstabs exponentially increase the odds of getting crits, you know, encourage players to consider positioning more. I want to decouple crits from swords for two reasons. First, swords, they're just too good in Skyrim. They really need some more downsides. And second, players naturally gravitate towards them anyways because they're the simplest and most common weapons in recent Tez games. So if all weapons have a natural crit chance, swords end up on a more level playing field. I imagine most players would opt to keep one handy though because with the greater differentiation we're going to introduce in this next bit, players are going to be encouraged to carry two weapons belonging to their skill of choice. A sword would offer the most versatility due to its balance and speed and armor penetration. I know we keep dancing around armor here, but I think light and heavy armor should have more distinguishing them than just their physical weight and armor ratings. This would come in their ability to protect against different attack types because we're going to bring back directional based movesets for light attacks. So if you hold a movement direction while attacking, you'll perform a different move, just like power attacks but with light attacks now too. These will not only allow you to move around in different ways when attacking, it will also change the type of damage you do. Slash, hack, pierce and blunt. Slash and hack would do bleed damage if they land critical hits. Pierce and blunt will do armor penetration if they land a crit. Slash and pierce are effective against light armor. Hack and blunt are effective against heavy armor. All weapons will be able to perform two of these damage types, which is why you'd want to keep two weapons on hand so you can cover the other two that your main weapon won't be as effective at, or just use magic. Oh, also, armor and weapon durability is coming back, learn how to maintain your equipment. This also adds the opportunity for a new dimension to combat, which is wearing down your opponent's equipment to weaken them, but I'll save that suggestion for the smithing section. Also, weapon materials will matter again, but we can do away with doing no damage against ghosts and just say different material types are more effective against other material types and types of armor, and maybe it can weaken some foes like silver against undead. Just more things to consider when preparing. To encourage the two-weapon approach, we'll rework the controls in the game to offer two weapon slots that the player can cycle between by just tapping something, maybe the favorites button. So the idea goes, I main a one-handed sword, which works best against unarmored and lightly armored enemies, and carry a secondary one-handed mace, which works best against heavy armor. I mean, in reality, getting clobbered by a mace is going to be super effective against someone in leather armor too, but let's suspend a little disbelief here. Maybe light armor lets opponents move out of the way quickly to avoid the slow mace swing speed or something. And that's pretty much the bulk of the changes. The key is in coming up with good moves the player will progressively unlock with perk points, and coming up with move sets that would further differentiate the weapons and the weapon skills more. The biggest thing between one and two handed should be their reach and weapon force. Staggering should play a bigger role outside of just power attacks, and reach should be more noticeable. I'd also suggest adding moves like pommel strikes and slapping opponents with a flat side of a blade for different effects, like maybe stunning enemies more. So how the new weapon skills might look is that in a straight fight, Two-handed is going to easily beat one-handed. One-handed with a shield would be a more even fight, but single and dual-wielded weapon warriors might want to prioritize speed to nullify the reach advantage of their two-handed opponent. Once up close, the two-handed character will be much more vulnerable and will need to use their quickest attacks, like a pommel strike, to buy themselves distance once again. This would also open the door for more weapon types, like short swords and, yes, spears, pikes, and lances. Those would pair very well with using shields. Imagine being able to attack while blocking, but at the expense of pretty much any mobility. We could get really nutty and add limb damage from Fallout, but I don't think that's necessary, and I'm trying to keep the amount of work down for Bethesda with these suggestions. Because here's the thing, I think almost all of this could be added to Skyrim with a mod right now. These are changes I'm sure Bethesda could do, because we've seen them make bigger leaps in the past already, and most of this stuff has already existed in this engine. I think this is much more reasonable and a lot less insulting than dismissing the honestly pretty okay combat system of Skyrim by saying Bethesda needs to make Tez 6 Dark Souls. I seriously hope Bethesda just ignores those suggestions because that's not what these games are about. I hope they instead listen to players like me, suggesting they focus on increasing the tactical RPG elements that reward preparation and smart character builds over pure mechanical skill. Ah, look at that, another double up. 
I tried avoiding these topics where I could previously, but it was kind of unavoidable. This took a lot of the wind out of their sails, so let's just go ahead and knock Block and Heavy Armor out at once. Somehow, Block is one of the messiest skills I've looked at thus far. Let's start with the Shield Wall perk, which increases damage blocked. Ignore the name, Shield Wall works for all blocks, regardless of whether you have a shield equipped or not. In Vanilla Skyrim, it says blocking is 20, 25, 30, 35, and 40% more effective, which just isn't true. The actual values are 10, 20, 30, 40, and 50%, which the unofficial patch fixes by altering the perk description to report the correct values. So already block is off to a rough start, but let's go even deeper. What do you think would be easier to block? A dagger or a warhammer? You'd think a dagger, but... Alright, I've killed that bit at this point, but y y you get it. It looks like someone just made a slip up when writing the blocking with a weapon formula and based a part of it on the base damage of an enemy's weapon and not the player's weapon. As a result, if the enemy is attacking with a weapon with a lower base damage, it ends up reducing the effect of the player's level in the block skill. This reaches tremendous levels of what the f*** when you consider unarmed opponents have a weapon damage value of zero. So that means a skeever can completely invalidate the defensive bonus the player gets from being a master in the block skill if they are blocked without a shield. Shield players don't have to worry, that's a different formula that works off the armor rating of the shield instead. Then you got Orgonians who just can't use Disarming Bash in Vanilla Skyrim. Power bashing the weapons out of an opponent's hand is just not gonna work, which might actually be a benefit if that Orgonian player isn't playing with a shield in the unofficial patch. But alright, alright, enough mockery, let's actually discuss the skill. Despite its flaws, I still believe this is a very solid skill worth investing in for basically any melee character. I don't think it's something anyone should be ignoring because blocking brings a lot of tactical options to the table, especially with its perks. The mechanics for blocking have seen some subtle but appreciated improvements from Oblivion. Instead of having a dedicated block button, blocking now maps to the left hand. If you have a shield equipped, hitting the left hand attack button just lifts the shield. If the hand is free or you got a two-handed weapon equipped, the left hand attack button performs a weapon block instead. It's simple, but it works well and allows for performing bashes and power bashes. Hold block and then tap the right hand attack button and your character performs a bash. After unlocking the perk, you can do a power attack to perform a power bash. Power bashes do more damage, and if you unlock the disarming bash perk, your power bash has a chance to disarm your opponent. This never stopped delighting me because I found it cosmically hilarious that an insanely powerful undead Nordic warrior spent thousands of years waiting for a worthy foe to enter its crypt only for a shitlord like me to come around and slap its weapon out of its hands. Power bashing damage is based off of the shield's base armor rating if one is equipped, otherwise it's going to use the weapon's base damage. This cannot be altered by any improvements made to the weapon or the shield either. This means power bashing with a weapon can do more damage, which is a neat trade-off when you consider blocking with a weapon protects against less damage. And then we got the veggie soup strat for infinite bashing, but I don't need to repeat myself here. I noticed in my testing that I was able to get a couple of crits while power bashing. I don't see anything about this on the UESP, and seeing as I was using a sword that had the critical damage perks unlocked, it made me wonder if power bashing can only do critical attacks, or if it's going to trigger the associated perks for whatever weapon I have equipped. So, for example, if I had an axe and the hack and slash perk, would I end up causing bleed? damage with my power bash. I test this further, but my mods for testing that broke with an unexpected update to tell people how to access the CC stuff in Anniversary Edition, so I'll let one of you guys figure out what the deal is here. You can also unlock a perk that slows time when an opponent is performing a power attack. This makes it very easy to counter opponent power attacks, but it can get very annoying because this is an automatic thing that can't be turned off once unlocked. It's also not that useful because attacking when an opponent is performing a power attack doesn't do anything special. There's no attacks of opportunity here, you just might interrupt their attack if you stagger them. But you can use that slow time effect to put distance between you and your enemy because you can still move freely during that slow motion period. Then you got deflect arrows, which doesn't actually deflect them back at your enemy, but just negates all damage from arrows if blocked by a shield. There's also elemental protection that gives you 50% resistance to health damage from fire, frost, and shock spells if you have a shield up. Doesn't matter if you block that spell head on, get hit from the back, or step on a rune, it will always have the incoming health damage. Stamina magic or damage remains unaffected though. Block Runner just lets you move at a normal movement speed with your shield raised. Shield Charge is the master perk, and it lets you perform a running attack with your shield up that will paralyze your opponents. Really, you're just knocking them on the ground. Fun to play with, but a bit tricky to control in the heat of a fight. That's really it for the perks. For the most part, I'd say it's one of the better trees. There's no real logic to its physical layout, but if you're using block and shields often, you'll 
want all the perks except maybe quick reflexes, which is an optional branch anyways. Despite me overall liking this skill on the updates to the system, we still got plenty of room for improvement. Aside from just fixing all of its bugs and just making it more consistent overall, I think the system needs to take stamina management into account. As it stands, blocking attacks will cost the player stamina, but it's not going to make it so that the player will stop blocking or have reduced effectiveness with lower stamina. Having it so that we consume stamina while holding up a shield and take a stamina hit every time a blow is blocked would add a lot to the flow of blocking. Increasing the block skill should then decrease the stamina cost for using the shield. Another suggestion is adding bigger and smaller shields. Skyrim can already detect if your shield isn't blocking your legs, so let's just go ahead and make tower shields to block more personal space and maybe add some tiny shields that can let us move around quicker. We could also add parries, and I think that will happen in Tez 6 if what I saw in Fallout 4 is to be iterated upon. Armor rating and damage reduction are the two stats linking block and heavy armor. I'll keep this part simple because the formulas and math influencing these systems are extensive. Damage reduction is a value derived from armor rating and other factors, but as the name implies, this is the true value that's being used to calculate how much damage you're actually going to take when getting hit. Damage reduction is exponential to your armor rating, so higher armor ratings proportionately reduces more damage, which only makes the system more complicated and ultimately leads to its self-destruction. Directly boosting damage reduction is basically impossible. You'll be increasing damage reduction by increasing armor rating. Armor rating can be increased primarily by equipping items with higher armor rating values, increasing your skill and your armor stat, this being heavy armor today, enchantments that fortify the skill, and picking up perks in the heavy armor tree. Then there's the bonus armor rating from an equipped shield, one of the benefits of blocking with a shield as opposed to just using a weapon to block. Armor has its own hidden value in the form of a hidden bonus 3% increase to armor rating for every piece of armor equipped, but as far as I can tell that's the only truly hidden value for armor, so thank the gods on that. Anyone familiar with Skyrim's armor system will probably know about the armor cap. Armor cap is actually a misnomer because it's really a cap of 80% on damage reduction. You're free to pump your displayed armor rating up as high as you want, but your armor will never make you completely immune to all incoming damage, only 80% of it. This can be reduced down to effectively 97% though if you use a shield to block. Shields also have a cap on their damage that they will block too. As I said earlier, this is probably because Bethesda didn't want to let the player completely invalidate enemy damage in this game, now that we no longer have infinitely scaling stats for enemies. The problem is that nothing in game will tell you about this cap and it's absolutely trivial hitting it. For example, with a max skill and heavy armor and all the relevant protection increasing perks, you can hit the armor cap with a full set of unupgraded Daedric armor plus its shield. Let me put this another way. With 100 in the heavy armor skill and all of its relevant perks unlocked, you can literally ignore the smithing skill and any enchantments that boost your heavy armor skill with what's admittedly the best armor in the game. Still, I spent hours painstakingly min-maxing my armor by grinding smithing and enchanting, stacking alchemy effects, and all of this other nonsense, only to remember when I was done that the armor cap exists and I was well beyond it. The upshot is that you could focus all that energy into making the best pair of boots or something and forego equipping armor in any other slot because your boots will give you all the armor rating you need. Or if you use a shield spell, you can ignore most armor slots because shield spells work by just adding armor rating. Or you can just get a set of iron armor to its best quality with 100 smithing and also hit the cap. Basically, there's no reason to give your armor much thought outside of aesthetics because you are pretty much guaranteed to hit the armor cap at some point. I understand why the armor cap exists, but being able to hit it by your mid-30s as a heavy armor sword and board warrior is absurd. It invalidates so many perks, skills, equipment slots, armor materials, spells, sh the list is endless. The armor cap being this accessible effectively removes over half the things you needed to consider at earlier levels. This is one of the most visible signs that Skyrim desperately needed another pass to fine-tune its scaling because this could have easily been fixed by just tweaking the underlying formula so that we don't have an exponential increase in damage resistance. But hey, now I can play Fashion Souls. Too bad most of the armor in Skyrim is just ugly, but at least we have CC to fix that. Ugh, never mind. We'll be circling back to this armor cap conundrum because it's such a profoundly destructive influence on the melee experience it almost borders on removing spell crafting levels. But at least with the armor cap we can be blissfully ignorant of the fact that our upgrades stop having any sort of effect because the game isn't showing us numbers. Magic on the other hand? Yeah, you felt that nerf the entire time. The perks of the heavy armor tree are just... well they're just f***ing terrible. Of all the trees I've covered so far between magic and melee, this is by far the worst. We start off with Juggernaut. 
increasing armor rating for heavy armor by 20, 40, 60, 80, and 100%. Ignoring the fact that it's not a very exciting thing to invest in, it also just doesn't make any sense. How does getting more skilled with my armor increase its effectiveness? Sure, maybe my character is not wearing it correctly at first, but they shouldn't need to be a master to figure out how to finally wear their armor correctly. Increasing your level with this skill also has this effect, which is redundantly stupid. This sounds like something that vitality attribute from earlier could come help fix. Fists of Steel allows unarmed attacks with heavy armor gauntlets to do their armor rating and extra damage. I really don't know if we're even going to get into the now extinct unarmed skill, but this is the only perk in the game that even acknowledges the punching lifestyle. What's bizarre is that there's no equivalent perk for light armor, so I guess Skyrim just decided pugilists and monks were classes no longer worth being recognized. Yeah, Khajiit players are seething right now. Cushioned halves fall damage if you're wearing a full set of heavy armor. As silly of a perk as this is, I kind of approve because it at least adds some kind of feature. I never found fall damage to be something to consider, especially when Become Ethereal lets me throw myself off mountains with impunity, but maybe a 75% fall reduction would be more appropriate, with it automatically triggering a ragdoll effect after a certain height to better show your armor absorbing the impact, and also because it would look funny watching a human tin can rolling down a mountain. Conditioning. Heavy armor weighs nothing and doesn't slow you down when running. Once again, makes no sense. I could see it increasing movement speed a bit, but it's in the name. Heavy armor. Letting this perk completely remove one of the only drawbacks only makes it so that light armor is just outright inferior now. It also just doesn't make any sense. How does getting better at wearing armor? Well fitted. 25% bonus to armor if wearing a full set of heavy armor. Refer to my complaints about Juggernaut. Matching set. 25 bonus to wearing armor when wearing a matching set of heavy armor. Once again. It really goes to show how Bethesda had no f***ing ideas for this perk tree when they had to make the same perk six times to fill in a tree with the fewest perks overall. Oh, I'm sorry, light armor, I didn't see you there. Tower of Strength, 50% less stagger when wearing all heavy armor. Alright, we haven't talked staggering much, but that's because it's just not a big issue for the player. The only time the player will be staggered is if they are hit by a power attack or a shield bash, and in the former's case, that's not even a guaranteed stagger. In my testing, I stood in the middle of a field getting whacked by five bandit chiefs, and I honestly couldn't tell the difference in stagger rate from when I was fully armored with this perk and when I was completely naked. I guess I got staggered a couple more times, it's, it's really hard to tell. Staggering should be, like blocking, tied to stamina. Lower stamina, more chance of getting staggered. Also, maybe light attack should have a chance to stagger too. I know that stealing power attacks is thunder a bit, but it's not hard to sidestep an AI's power attack, especially when they telegraph them so much. Adding the chance to light attacks gives AI a better shot because they don't even seem capable of recognizing when a power attack is appropriate. A staggered foe should probably be more susceptible to getting crit too. Get staggered when your stamina is pretty much zero and there's a good chance you're getting knocked flat on your ass. In a real fight, getting thrown off footing and especially getting knocked off your feet is about as good as losing a fight unless your opponent doesn't know how to capitalize. This should be reflected in Skyrim's combat by making staggering a much bigger deal as opposed to just a moment where you aren't allowed to spam light attacks. With those suggestions in mind, this perk would be a nice treat. But I'd say stagger reduction would also be a great thing to build into the effect of the heavy armor skill itself as opposed to the confounding damage reduction effect. Maybe getting to 100 in heavy armor will guarantee 50% stagger resistance, and the perk can add an additional 25%. This would be another way heavy armor could distinguish itself from light armor and make up for its slowness. I can hear the Tez 6 should be Dark Souls people foaming at the mouth right now because I just proposed a watered down poise system. Hey, we can still steal ideas from Dark Souls here from time to time. You also have that force without effort blessing that you get from Parth that also reduces staggering 25%. Imagine getting to such a high stagger resistance that you could potentially stand up against a full unrelenting force shout. That'd be pretty powerful. Last perk, Reflect Blows. 10% chance to reflect melee damage back at the enemy while wearing all heavy armor. Sounds good, but it's defeated by the designer's lack of understanding of Skyrim's armor system. That reflected damage is based off the actual damage done to you, not the total damage of an enemy's attack. So if you're at the armor cap, that's only going to be 10% of the remaining 20% of the original attack's damage. But wait, it gets worse, because if you block with the shield, that's now down to 3%. On higher difficulties, that damage reflected back is also subject to the player damage tax. So if you're on legendary difficulty, that's 0.25% of that 3%, while you'll receive three times the damage taken from the hit. Truly a worthless perk, and that's the master level one. So yeah, I think you can see why I believe this is the worst skill I've covered so far, and likely is not going to be topped by anything, even lockpicking when we get to stealth. I honestly don't think there is a single good perk in this tree. The damage reduction perks can be made up by just upgrading your gear. The weight issue can be circumvented by the Steed Standing Stone, which can be doubled up with another stone with the Ethereal Crown, because as I demonstrated with the Armor Cap Conundrum, you can easily forego a heavy armor helmet and still hit that armor cap. You're still going to be getting damage reduction from getting levels in heavy armor, which is an entirely passive leveling process, since it's just 
just based off of the damage taken while wearing heavy armor. Use the perks that you would have invested in this tree and dump them into smithing and enchanting because at least smithing lets you upgrade weapons without running into a damage cap. I guess the only thing left to complain about is the armor sets themselves. Like I said, I think they're all ugly, but that's a subjective take. What's objectively worse is armor getting reduced down to just four pieces. Yeah, we lost the ability to change our pants in the jump between Oblivion to Skyrim. I heard this was said to reduce the complexity of NPC armor so that Bethesda could get more of them on screen, particularly for the big battles of the Civil War. Oh god, not yet. To which, I hope this was just misinformation because the solution there would have been to just make the Stormcloak and Imperial armor sets occupy both armor slots seeing as they were the big concern here, or just give NPCs special unified sets, but when looted, a script replaces them with separated versions. We know containers can swap items dynamically, a quest in the Mages College did it. This would let Bethesda and players enjoy their cake. NPCs benefit from having fewer polygons and whatever else, and players get to enjoy having all their equipment slots. Aside from just losing the ability to mix and match armor the way I want to, this also has a dampening effect on enchanting, which really didn't need any more dampening to begin with. And really, enchanting becomes one of the only considerations for equipping armor in Skyrim thanks to the armor cap. Unfortunately, the limits on what effects can go on which slots makes enchanting gear for a melee character more of a flow chart than a freeform activity with endless benefits and drawbacks. For instance, the helmet slot is almost a complete waste for pure melee characters because the only thing even remotely martial skill related is the fortify archery effect. Also, don't bother with Fortify Heavy Armor, it's completely useless thanks to the armor cap, and Fortify Block is questionable because of its cap too. I could sit here and pitch ideas for how to fix the armor system, but I think I've given Bethesda enough ideas between Stagger, Vitality, the different damage types, and everything else. Perks that complement those new systems would be the best way to fix this tree. If I was going to just redesign the tree from what Skyrim already has, I honestly don't know. Even looking at what mods like Ordinator did to the tree, I'm left unimpressed. The problem lies in the armor system of Skyrim itself just being uninteresting and too divorced from all the other systems of the game. Case in point, spell effectiveness is no longer a thing. Armor needs to be more than just give armor rating and slow you down for us to come up with anything worth investing in as a player. So let's just move on to a more interesting skill. The smithing skill in Skyrim is probably the most functionally sound skill in the game. It does most of what you expect of it in ways that you need it to without it being too simple or too complex. In a lot of other games, this sort of a skill would actually be called a profession because that's more of an accurate description from a time-invested perspective. Mining and smithing are things you make time to do. You hand over a large chunk of your time, and in-game wealth, in order to convert those things into some of the best items in the game. Skyrim smithing skips the four plane, just asks you to toss a perk point its way from time to time. Materials are readily available at blacksmiths who usually have a full suite of smithing tools right next to them too. Ore veins are plentiful enough that you naturally get most of what you need, but obscure enough that you won't be finding much if you aren't actively looking. Maybe you'll need to go spend a few minutes hunting for the more odd materials here and there, but those sorts of tasks I've always found to be Skyrim at its best because it sends you out with a simple objective and keeps you interacting with the world. Another thing Skyrim and Valheim shares. But it's not too simple either. You still need to unlock recipes and those recipes are usually calling for three to five different materials in various quantities. You need different crafting stations to do different things and they're not always is going to be around. Some players will find that tedious and annoying, but if you're embracing the adventuring lifestyle, this becomes a reason to note where services are located and do a bit of traveling. Materials are also heavy, and one of the biggest reasons I want to play your house is so I'm not lugging around 50 silver bars all the time. For a first attempt at making a system like this from the ground up, yeah, you can consider me impressed. I enjoy getting to play a character that gets to use the system. Even my mage character got in some smithing action for jewelry. I wouldn't have even thought of adding that to this system, but Bethesda did because they clearly put a lot more thought and polish into this than many of the other skills in Skyrim. Did I mention it's not very buggy? I like it for many of the same reasons I like the other crafting skills in Skyrim. It only adds to the experience. If you want to skip it, you're actually free to do so, and you won't miss out on too much or be penalized for it. There's a few ways to compensate for not using it, or you can use it selectively and ignore the parts of it you don't really care for. But where it's better compared to enchanting and alchemy is, oddly enough, in its balancing. Enchanting is a chore to grind, and you're likely going to be reduced to grinding after a point just to get it to its max level. And once you do, your reward is re-enchanting all new gear because its best perk invalidates everything you made up until that point. Alchemy can swing either way too fast or too slow, depending on how much you want to cheese the system. In theory, it's built around trial and error, but it doesn't really end up feeling rewarding when you're wasting expensive ingredients guessing their effects. As that's to say, smithing doesn't have its fair share of grinding, but it strikes a healthier balance than the other two. XP in smithing is awarded based on the value of the item produced, so things like jewelry end up actually being worth the effort to make, while also having the upshot of being monetarily lucrative too. People still claiming that the Iron Dagger grind set is the best way to master don't know what they're 
talking about. Actually, I found the best route to success was Dwarven Bows, though I ride Dwarven Arrows are even more efficient. Dwarven's appeal for grinding comes from how it's sourced. Because the ability to smelt new Dwarven ingots is a lost art, the blacksmiths of modern Tamriel have resorted to recycling the metal that's already out there. For the player, this means they have to pick through Dwemer Ruins for their scrap metal, bring it to a smelter, and boil it down to their base ingots. This system has some weird balance issues though, where you can get 5 pounds worth of ingots out of 2 pounds of scrap metal. I guess the rest is just water weight or something, but this does make it easy to acquire large amounts of ingots. Then you just have to source iron, which is readily available in shops, and bang out a bunch of bows. Bonus points if you also temper them. You can turn a nice profit too, and because these are weapons, you can sell them to blacksmiths who have the most cash in the game, saving you the hassle of having to pawn things like jewelry onto poor vendors. If you resort to grinding to fill in some gaps in your progression, you really only have to dedicate maybe 30 minutes to an hour max doing it for a whole playthrough. Coming off of grinding magic skills, this is a huge improvement, and the process of doing it is much, much less painful. Dwarven received a lot of extra attention from the designers, which has it displaying some unique ideas that would ideally see expansion in Tez 6. For starters, despite the broken balancing of it, I actually like the idea of recycling material. I think a smarter approach for Dwarven would be making it require a lot of material to produce one bar of pure Dwarven metal, but we could fudge it by mixing in some other material, maybe iron or steel, allowing us to produce inferior but more economical ingots. The Ancient Knowledge Blessing from the Unfathomable Depths quest is meant to boost the defensiveness of Dwarven armor and boost smithing XP gain. In Vanilla Skyrim, this blessing is just completely busted. Originally, Additionally, the defense bonus applied to all armors in the game. Bethesda tried fixing it, but broke it even more by making it work on all armors except Dwarven. Uh, they never bothered trying to fix it a second time, probably because the unofficial patch was already on the job. As well, the smithing XP bonus only applies as a bonus when tempering gear, as opposed to a straight bonus to XP gain like the description states. But despite how busted and poorly implemented this blessing is, I really like the idea. When patched, this effectively makes Dwarven a top tier material. While that's not exactly earned, because the quest to get the perk is a simple dungeon run, I see a ton of potential in making a bunch of different quests related to smithing that would let players beef up their material of choice. I'm imagining quests in the style of the mastery quest from the Mages College here, where a blacksmith can clue the player into some hidden knowledge that the player needs to uncover. Ideally, these quests wouldn't just be dungeon crawls, but instead would tie to the spirit of each material and maybe even teach the player some info and lore related to the material. I guess now it's time to talk about the perk tree. All in all, it's a decent tree by Skyrim standards. Its anvil shape actually works to its advantage here, as opposed to blocks, round, shield-like shape, as each side of the anvil correlates to the two armor types. Light on the left, heavy on the right. But all is not equal because the heavy armor path requires six perks to complete, while the light armor path only requires five to complete. This could be a glass half empty half full scenario, I guess. Fewer perks means it's cheaper to invest in, but more perks means more content. I'm honestly conflicted here because the first perk being devoted to steel is mostly a waste for light armor players. Like, damn, if only we had some form of light steel option. I don't know, something made out of rings and chains? Is there a name for that? Mithril? Oh wait, that's that other dead light armor variant. You also have the advanced armors perk being located between elven and glass. Uh, advanced armors is almost exclusively heavy armor with the exception of scaled armor, so this could be seen as another wasted perk for the light armor players, or a complete f*** you to heavy armor players who want to make steel plate and are forced to invest in half the light armor path. Yeah, I think Skyrim has a bias towards heavy armor and the smithing tree is a fleck in that here. Playing as a smithing orc warrior, I just skipped steel plate. You can find plenty of complete sets on dead bandit chiefs anyhow. And while I did have to invest one more perk total, I'd take that over having two dead perk investments in my progression. I won't bother going through all the individual perks because it would just be me sitting here listing all the different material types and going, now you can craft them and improve them twice as much. We'll get back to the improving thing, but first let's talk about materials. Again. Unlike Oblivion, where you could find random marauders decked out in full suits of Daedric, Skyrim made the sensible decision to cap things at the upper end of the material list. Now you'll never see someone actually wearing Daedric, or Dragonbone Scale, which is supposed to be exclusive to Dragonborn's crafting ability, and even glass and ebony are much rarer to find on somebody's body. You'll still find plenty of weapons made of the high-end materials floating out there, but armor much less so. You can still find them in chests as level loot, but once again, not as frequent as Oblivion. Remember how hard it was finding a Daedric helmet in Oblivion? Yeah, it's about that rare to find glass helmets now. Materials are still level based, but because enemies are fixed at their own levels, it means you won't be finding a Daedric sword on a level 10 bandit. Even with high level materials being much more rare and loot tables going up into the player level range 40, Skyrim still suffers from some materials being rare because the player just flew through their comfortable spawn level range. 
here's a challenge. Complete a set of Orcish armor on a melee character before Ebony starts replacing all your gear. I promise you, unless you're buying half that stuff or avoiding leveling up, this is way more of a challenge than it might sound. Tempering also brings a new dynamic to the leveled material system that had me completely skipping rungs on the heavy armor ladder. Actually, busted CC armor had me really skipping a lot because quests like Smith and Slash, not gonna pretend I didn't have to look that one up, gave me a set of fully enchanted orcish plate armor when I was level 15. The alternative armor's creation adds a ton of new armors to the game, bringing lots of light versions of once heavy armor exclusives. If you're looking at this and thinking, oh wow, they actually added unique art assets with CC, yeah, don't, don't give them too much credit. These are assets ported over from the Elder Scrolls Blades mobile game, and most of them probably needed the small screen size of a phone to even look good. All of these armors also have unique quests that will just hand you a full set of enchanted armor that you can carry for the rest of the game. Yeah, I'm glad I paid $20 to have what little progression existed in vanilla Skyrim completely busted by these things. A lot of them end up getting added to the level list, so you'll also be finding them spawning in chests and shops. Just don't be the poor fool I saw on Reddit find the Dietrich plate set at level 6 and you'll be fine. Or just don't wear it, but then why'd you buy it? But yeah, tempering. I like it, but it's clear the designers didn't really know what this system's role was meant to be in the progression. A talented enough smith can turn a set of iron armor into something better than Daedric. And with the armor cap, oh god, no, please not again. Tempering completely screws the progression making tempering seem like a system meant to add longevity to a certain look that you want your character to continue to carry. I'm not a big fan on cosmetics in first person games, so getting to rock the steel drip at level 80 isn't really my thing. Ultimately, I think the problem comes back to the armor cap and the super compressed nature of armor ratings in general. There's just not enough numerical cushion space between the materials when it comes to armor rating. The problem also exists for base weapon damage, but at least we don't run into a damage cap in that situation. This ends up making the tempering system feel almost optional, at least for armor, but I also feel stupid for ignoring it because I'm giving up what's basically free armor rating. The solution would have been for the designers to definitively decide on what tempering is meant to be. Is this a system meant for creating longevity for players who just want to rock their look longer, or is it a necessary part of progression? The current system completely fails that second part until the end game and we no longer have any more armor rungs to climb so we start tempering until we hit the armor cap. I think a better solution would be to inflate the armor ratings of the entire system to increase its minimum and maximum values and use that extra headroom to add much more space between the sets. So maybe iron is effective from 30 to 80 armor rating. It can push up into the 200 range with the best iron armor possible, but that's only going to overlap about halfway into the effective range of steel which maybe starts at 100 and goes up to 250-300. I shouldn't be able to make iron armor that can compete with Daedric by just leveling my skill and chugging a few potions, that's insanity. Now, what about the aesthetic player? Well, we could just tell them to suffer for their fashion. Nobody said stilettos are practical for running after all, but okay, let's come up with a solution for them too. How about adding NPCs that will let players apply basic enchantments like fortify heavy armor so that they can have their heavy armor boost keep them competitive? Or maybe have some kind of armor upgrade system that lets players level the armor to the next tier. So a steel upgrade kit that lets them upgrade their iron armor with steel ingots and gives it the same effectiveness. The upgrade process could be expensive to make it more preferable to just follow the material progression as opposed to clinging to the same armor set so that the average player gets the point that constantly upgrading their armor is really only for a certain type of player. Speaking of enchanting, I want to bring something back from the Shivering Isles expansion, matrices. These things were pretty cool. They were enchanted molds for different weapons and armor pieces that the player could bring to one of the two blacksmiths in New Sheoth. These molds would then create enchanted madness and amber items, giving non-magic players a way to mess with enchanting on some level. Ironically, enchanting wasn't really something cut off from non-magic players in Oblivion, aside from it being exclusive to the Arcane University and Frostcrag Spire. Skyrim's enchanting is much more exclusive with it being a dedicated skill. But despite having a more open system, Oblivion also had sigil stones and matrices from SI to let those looking to avoid magic to still get something that felt like enchanting. Matrices would have been the perfect augmentation to the Skyrim smithing system, maybe even having some interaction with the arcane blacksmithing perk that would upgrade their effectiveness. Matrices would also make for great dungeon loot and sought after rewards for exploration and completing quests. More inspiration could be found in the Diablo games, where the player is able to slot gems into their equipment for special enchantment-like effects. Really, the system is pretty prolific now, that's just the first example that came to my mind. In Skyrim, I'd imagine certain gems being tied to certain effects, like rubies being fire, for instance. And if you slot it into a sword, it's offensive. If it's in armor, it's defensive. The different gem qualities would naturally correlate to the effect's potency, too. Maybe we can have some kind of modifier material, too. Like maybe using moonstone with a gem will make it so that the ruby correlates to the health attribute instead. 
Okay, seeing as we're on the topic of adding to the smithing system, let's talk about material types making a comeback. Like I said earlier, silver is the only material sporting a bonus to undead and werewolf damage. Let's expand that to just about every other material type and get a little creative with their effects. Elven would be a good example. Maybe elven armor grants some magic resistance and could be easier to enchant, so enchantments placed on it will naturally be more effective. Daedra could be super high fire resistance and let's say a passive fear effect because it's just so damn terrifying to look at. Nordic Steel, super high frost resistance and buffs to shouts. Couple this with the arcane blacksmith perk, so passive material effects will upgrade with the quality of the items when tempering. I think alloying materials would also be a possible expansion for this system. Tigger's Construct is a mod in Minecraft that does just this. Is it taboo to mention other games as mods in analysis video? Different materials have different properties, and alloying them lets you blend these materials in unique ways. Some of it's great, some of it's terrible, but it encourages experimentation. Alloying could introduce that experimentation element alchemy has into smithing. Going back to Dwarven, Maybe an attribute of that could be that it alloys well with other materials. So you can make a dwarven set of armor that would make it the best armor to enchant if alloyed with elven. Or you can dilute it with ingots of ebony or steel to make it either stronger or cheaper. Just like how Tinker's Construct lets Minecraft players skirt around the enchanting system of that game, alloying and all of these other suggestions I just posed would let melee characters skirt around enchanting in Tez 6. It shouldn't be a direct replacement, but it should at least offer players some more viable options. Finally, durability should come back as I said earlier. It should absolutely be less tedious than an Oblivion, but it shouldn't be gone in a game with a dedicated smithing skill and ample smithing tools all over the world. Aside from just making the decay rates on gear much less punishing, we can also add quality of life improvements like being able to fully repair equipment at armor benches and grindstones for free, bring back repair hammers for repairs out in the field, and higher levels in smithing increase their durability until it's unbreakable with a perk in the smithing tree. Maintaining equipment would also apply bonus modifiers in the form of extra base damage and armor rating. At smithing level 15, having equipment fully repaired only gives maybe 5%, and that diminishes the more the item degrades, until it's near breaking where the item is suffering a penalty to its effectiveness. At level 100, you can double the effectiveness of maintained equipment, and the penalties are much less severe. Maybe add a perk that makes it take longer for items to degrade, and better materials and alloys are naturally more durable. When an item breaks, you can still continue to use it, but it's just going to be at a diminished effectiveness. If it's enchanted, well, at least you still have the effect of the enchantment, assuming it's still charged. And that's all the changes I'd make to smithing. It's all additive, which is a nice change of pace because the smithing system of Skyrim is a very solid foundation. Sure, it could use some more balance and tweaking, but if we add all these new systems, particularly durability, the player will naturally be less reliant on brute force grinding to get to the point where they can craft their ideal armor and temper it to the level that they want it at. I'm all for skills that naturally keep place with the player to mitigate mindless grinding, and my suggestions offer a way to achieve that without making smithing so trivial that you'd hit 100 by just making a couple of sets of armor over the course of the game. And with that, I think it's time to change gears entirely and start talking about the companions. Although I will say, smithing felt like a neglected skill during the companions. We had Yurlin Greymane, who could have played a role in teaching the player unique crafting recipes outside of just Skyforge Steel. Maybe he could have offered some quests related to the skill as well. As neglected as enchanting was at the College of Winterhold, it still had a presence with all the vendors and the Ashnok Forge. In comparison, the Skyforge felt tacked on last minute because someone remembered the companions are supposed to be the warrior faction. Mm, the companions. Yeah, they got shafted pretty hard. It's a shame too, they had a good premise the oldest Nordic organization on Tamriel, instrumental in establishing their race on the continent, the group responsible for what I can only refer to as the incident with the native elves, and the primordial leadership structure that led to the establishment in the various holds, Jarldoms, kingdoms, and empires over the past 4,000 years. Yeah, there's a lot this faction could have done, but someone had to fill in the void the Fighters Guild left behind, and seeing as this was a faction of warriors, that was close enough for them to succeed it, whether it was fitting or not. And then they were neglected, leading to them becoming little more than an afterthought for most players because they never developed into something very interesting or useful. But before we get into the guild's identity crisis, I should properly introduce our protagonist here. Gutha, the orc sword and board warrior, originally hailed from Narzalur, an orc stronghold situated in the eastern mountains south of Windhelm. Inclined towards a life of adventuring, Gutha wasn't really fit for the stronghold orc lifestyle, so out to the greater province of Skyrim she went, doing odd jobs here and there and making a little life for herself in Riften. It wasn't long before she had herself an employee in the form of Mercurio 
an apprentice wizard of the Arcane University. Styling themselves as professional swords for hire, the two of them struck out for Whiterun where Gutha hoped to find them some better work. All of this is to plaster over shit we covered in the last video. I already did the blankest of blank slate cold starts with Sarian, so we're starting with something a bit more seasoned here. Canonically, she's not dragonborn, but if you see me using shouts with her, well, I needed to use shouts because shouts are a core part of the combat experience and I need to use them for the sake of the combat analysis. It cut me a little slack here. Markirio is also going to be a permanent fixture for the entirety of Gutha's adventures, partially because I already did the bad follower bit with Boehner, but also because Markirio was just too damn good to ever give up. We'll come back around to talking about followers because we get a lot of those during the Companions questline, but oh, oh boy, let me tell you, if you haven't played Skyrim with a good mage follower, especially as a melee character, you're missing out. A lot of people told me how they never play Skyrim with followers because they're bad or they step on their toes during combat. Just listen, go to the B and Barb and Riften and toss Markirio 500 septums. Just trust me on this. Seeing the remains of dragon carcasses on the road to Whiterun had Gutha dreaming of becoming a professional dragon slayer. With the dragonborn suddenly gone from Skyrim, there was good money to be made slaying the disorganized remnants of Alduin's forces. But her dreams were put on hold when she came upon a farm outside of Whiterun where a group of warriors were fighting a giant. As a native orc to Skyrim, Gutha knew how dangerous giants could be, so she went over to lend a hand in slaying it. If you are utterly bewildered by the fact that I was actually able to get to the giant and help slay it, uh, I had the same reaction when I was able to do it on this character. If this sequence has a habit of, um, not working, resulting in Ayala calling the player a little bitch because her companion compatriots were able to spank the giant faster than a player sprinting can get into the fight and help. This is because, while normally giants are set to a specific level and stats, this giant is level to the player's level. So if the player is, say, at level 1 coming up from Riverwood, this giant is going to be much weaker than a normal giant. Meanwhile, if you have the game difficulty set lower, it's also going to take increased damage, thus leading to many players playing on anything south of Expert witnessing this giant getting bodied by the companions here. Because I started this character on Expert difficulty, it wasn't immediately taken out. We haven't really talked about difficulty as a warrior character. Compared to what I had to endure as a mage, my warrior characters usually had some difficulty setting where they actually felt fun to play at. As a mage, I was usually in the awkward position of either having to turn the difficulty down a notch and making the game way too easy, or turning the difficulty up and getting stuck with a lot of damage sponge enemies. Neither experience was even remotely fun. With my melee characters, there was almost always a difficulty setting that felt appropriate for it. Just the right balance of challenge that would require me to pay attention to avoid getting blindsided by the odd challenging boss, but easy enough that every encounter with generic enemies wasn't taking several minutes to get through. This is, of course, primarily due to melee players having a reliable way of actually scaling their damage with the level-scaled world. This is why I was semi-confident in defending level scaling in the beginning of this video. Armor rating being very easy to increase is also another thing that makes playing higher difficulties much more viable. And uh, yeah, it's pretty much that simple. Veggie Soup helped carry me through anything that really would have tested me or my patience, but it absolutely was not necessary to get through any encounters. I started the game at Apprentice, but by the time I was leaving Helgen, I had the character set to Expert. Once I had blocking and shield bashing down, I moved up to Master. I don't remember when I was up to Legendary, but it was long enough for me to forget I'd even set it to that. A well-optimized sword and board character can absolutely make a mockery of the Legendary setting, proving my point in the last video that this was a setting thrown in by Bethesda to appease min-maxers. Anyways, Ayella, impressed by Gutha's initiative, invited her to check out their organization up at Yorvesker and Whiterun. Gutha was vaguely familiar with the story of the original 500 Companions, but she had no idea that they were still around and apparently very active in Skyrim. She'd been hearing all about the Greybeards, especially following the exploits with the Dragonborn and the temporary truce in the Civil War, but the Companions? Uh, nah, nobody was even talking about them. It sounded like they really fell down from the lofty heights of their predecessors, being nothing more now than a mercenary company, but Gutha needed coin and they were hiring. Yeah, the setup for the Companions is kind of strange. Bethesda's factional compartmentalization is on full display with them. They are likely the first faction most players will be introduced to, even before the Greybeards, because the player can't help but run right into their scripted introduction at the farm if they're getting aid for Riverwood. As a result, it seems like they are lacking as many hooks as every other faction in the game. If you avoid Whiterun, you're likely not even to learn about the existence of the Companions, which is strange because they are billed as a respected organization operating all over Skyrim. 
Every other faction has several ways for you to discover them, especially if you're running the main story. You'll hear about the Mage's College a lot from all sorts of sources throughout the game, and several quests will require you to interact with the group. The Dark Brotherhood will start to send assassins after you just in case you missed Cicero on the road and the constant rumors of Aventus Arantino performing the Black Sacrament. The Thieves' Guild is literally impossible to miss if you enter Riften, as there's three references to it before you even hit Brainyolf in the market. But the Companions who would make an excellent group of dragon slayers, you know, especially when Whiterun is being threatened by the dragon at the Watchtower. Yeah, they don't even get mentioned during the main story. I'm not saying every faction needs to wear neon signs, but the lack of any companion presence outside of the sequence at the farm and in Yorfisker greatly diminishes the credibility that this is an organization of mercenaries solving issues around the province. This wouldn't even be a difficult thing to address. Just have a couple of random companions out in the world from time to time, slaying a pack of wolves or a bear or something, who can also signal to the player that they can join them if they manage to miss AL's introduction. This lack of integration with the world is not surprising, though, because this faction is painfully incomplete, even more so than the Mage's College. While the College clearly had a lot of caught content, especially since modders have been able to find tons of references to it in the game files, the Companions didn't seem to even make it that far. There is a bit of hidden cut content that modders have been able to find, but they really feel like a faction that was rushed out last minute because we needed a faction for melee characters, and well, this is all Bethesda had time to knock out. It doesn't surprise me, then, that the Dawnguard DLC seemed to be a second shot at life for some of the ideas in the Companions. As it stands, the Companions are pulling double duty as the Melee Warrior Faction and the Mercenary Faction in this game. I'm not saying the Melee Faction can't also be the Mercenary Faction, it's one of the most logical types of work Warriors will fall into, but it doesn't really feel like a natural fit for the Companions, and I'll explain, but first let's address the absence of the Fighters Guild in Skyrim. The guild used to have a strong presence in Skyrim up until the 4th era, but I guess with the diminishment of the Empire, the guild just lost any presence up north. Unlike the Mages Guild, the Fighters Guild is still around, they are just absent in Skyrim. I get the feeling this wasn't always going to be the case for the game, but at some point the Fighters Guild got dropped. We know an arena thing was also dropped, so it's not out of the realm of possibility more Oblivion factions weren't planned to be in Skyrim. As a result, the Companions had to step into the role of mercenaries, as opposed to exclusively being an ancient Nordic East Grimoire fan club corrupted into a cult of here scene. I have virtually no evidence for this theory, it's more just a feeling from looking at what we got, how other factions were handled in this game, and knowing what little we do know about Skyrim's development, but then again, this crack pipe theory could be exactly that, in which case the Companions really were envisioned from the start as being a mercenary company, which, well... The reason the Fighters Guild conceptually worked as a faction was because they were simply a mercenary company formally legitimized by the Empire. Members signed up to handle contracts, and they were paid a wage based on the work they completed. It was a very transactional organization. Sure, there was a sense of loyalty to the Guild itself, but we saw how far that loyalty really went when contracts dried up during the Oblivion's Fighters Guild questline. When we get to Yorvaskar, we're shown something completely unlike what we were being sold by people saying that if we need money to sign on with them. Ayala dropped a few hints about the true nature of their faction if you listen really closely, but that's on full blast when we get to the hall. Talking to everyone there, asking why they joined, the only person who seems to be in it for the money is Torver, a chronic drinker who frankly doesn't seem like companion material to begin with. Everyone else shares very similar stories about either always wanting to be a companion or having no real family or place they belonged and falling in with the companions almost as one might a cult. Once again, I don't mind this characterization, it's actually a pretty cool hook, but this clashes with the mercenary role they are saddled with in several ways. For one, Torver. Nobody even addresses the fact that he's the odd man out, when in reality, having someone part of the club in it for just the benefits would absolutely cause friction with some of the diehard members that have been in there for life and thrive on the Kool-Aid. Second, not all contracts are honorable. Really, it's just one type, the hired muscle job, that really clashes with the stated ethos of the group. In that contract, we're told to go to a randomly selected NPC in the world and intimidate them. The details are vague because it's a randomly generated quest, but being told we can rough up an old woman on behalf of an unknown employer is shady business as faction really should have no part in. Are we a politically impartial group meant to embody the ideals of virtuous Nord warriors, or are we the Thieves' Guild? The rest of the contracts are free of this issue, so I'm willing to chalk this one up as an oversight that could have been corrected if the faction just received more attention. I call this one up, though, because this was literally my first contract with the guild once I was accepted, and with how few of these jobs I had to complete to progress the guild, it 
really stood out because Farkas will be the first member to offer the player a contract and Farkas has a 50-50 shot of issuing this or a dungeon clear contract. I'm willing to bet this ill-fitting contract sees a lot of action for first time players and this can result in some unnecessary whiplash because the Radiant Quest system just wasn't implemented well here. I, uh, <laughs> I felt some serious validation with this point when I was talking to one of my friends and he immediately started bitching about this contract and how it didn't fit in here because once again, it was the first contract he had to do with them. Uh, we're at least able to decline the job, but once accepting it, we have no choice but to carry it out. So getting cold feet here isn't an option. This is a very Bethesda issue to have too. We have a 50% chance of getting a dungeon clear contract, you know, as if we needed any more of those or we get a contract that completely misrepresents what to expect with the rest of this faction. I'm surprised Bethesda didn't script this to give us a guaranteed extermination contract to keep the meme alive of our first contract with a mercenary faction being to go kill rats in someone's house. What, were you guys afraid this wouldn't be praised as being subversive like in an oblivion? I promise, you guys would have been subverting my expectations if you went ahead and recycled that premise a third time. I mean, after all, people are complaining about the prisoner trope, but you've embraced that, so what's the hesitation here? And you gotta hand it to the companions for just assuming we can handle these tasks. Slapping Vilkas with my shield a couple times now qualifies me to go clear a whole dungeon solo, or proves that I'm trustworthy enough to not kill the person I'm supposed to intimidate. Don't we have more qualified members for these sorts of jobs? Surely bitch contracts like killing rats is what we have newbie members for. Then again, sending someone like Torver out to go rough up some people is probably a bad idea. Odds are he owes the target money or something, and we'd just be encouraging his bad decision making. This whole thing is funny because apparently we're still untested. Oh wait, I'm getting ahead of the script here. Upon entering the Great Mead Hall of Yorvesker, Gutha is greeted by a couple of companions duking it out while the rest of the members look on merrily. After chatting and introducing herself to the other members in the room, Gutha can see why random fist fights can break out in this bunch. Every member seems to be incredibly strong-headed ready to fight and prove themselves while elevating the virtues of their leaderless clan. They then direct her to go talk to Kodlak, who they assure Gutha is definitely not their leader. He just offers guidance to the group, settles disputes, and most important to Gutha right now, determines who gets to join the group. Nope, definitely not the leader. Ignore the fact that he's the only one with an actual title and was hand-selected by the previous Harbinger, as companion tradition dictates. There are no leaders here. Got that? Players love to point out this obvious falsehood, and that's because everyone in the Companions are so up their own ass about having a perfectly flat leadership structure in the guild. First off, a truly flat leadership structure does not exist. Power always tries to consolidate itself. If power isn't vested in a legitimate source, then it will find itself in the hands of those most capable or those who seize it. But even without the Harbinger, the Companions still wouldn't have a flat leadership structure because we also have the Circle, a group of selected senior members who embody the ideals of the organization to ensure continuity and principles, which is literally the job of a senior management staff. They also dish out the contracts to junior members and they can elect a new Harbinger, you know, just in case. If the group was true to the idea that there are no leaders, these two instruments would not exist, or at the very least, they'd be stocked with people who had to fight their way to their positions and must defend them when they are challenged. You know, something like what Nords would actually do. The only real agency junior members seem to possess is in the contracts that they accept and the equipment that they are allowed to use. You know what other organization had that? The Fighters Guild, which in Oblivion was characterized as being organized and bureaucratic to a fault. Sure, the Companions have far fewer ranks, and the members of the Circle seem to be free to do whatever the fuck they want despite the wishes of the Harbinger, but junior members have as much autonomy as basic members of the Fighters Guild. In the Fighters Guild, members had to finance their own jobs and equipment. That's what the whole arc with Maglier was meant to show. I don't buy the autonomy of the Companions. I think it's sold as such to explain how the Circle is able to keep secrets from the rest of the members, but once again, the Fighters Guild and Oblivion had plenty of its own skeletons hidden from the rest of the Guild. Maybe they kept this as a legacy to the original 500 Companions, who were described as crossing from Atmora on their own free will, but then Yskrimor is held in extreme reverence back then and now, and the Companion who claimed the Skyforge built Yorvesker and basically founded Whiterun was also described as having led other members into his group. I don't know, maybe this was just meant to signal to the player that they will have no authority once they inevitably become Harbinger because, you know, of course that's where the story is headed. See, this is another ideological difference in this organization that would absolutely cause constant 
constant friction in the group. The hypocrisy of saying we have no leaders, but then always elevating members to these higher ranks should spark as much conflict as having members who are in it just for the money when others are there for the companionship and the lifestyle. And this is ignoring what ends up being the real conflict of the quest line, which is the debate over the nature of the circle's lycanthropy. Its inability to make any of these major disagreements form into actual conflicts is why this faction feels so hollow. And as you can see, we didn't even need to talk to Codlack for the cracks to begin to form here. So Gutha seeks out Codlack, who seems to prefer the privacy and peacefulness of the hall's basement. When she arrives in his quarters, she catches a bit of conversation between Codlack and Vilkus, another esteemed member of the circle, talking about a hunger for blood or something. She doesn't really pay it any mind. When she formally asks to join, Vilkus immediately gets on the defensive, stating he's never even heard of Gutha before coming here. Yeah, don't worry, if you're the dragonborn and save the world, Vilkus will still have no clue who you are. His complaints are hollow, though, because Codlack brings Gutha in without much to consider, except, yeah, she seems strong and we have empty beds to fill. Still, he wants Vilkas to test the newest recruit, so the two of them head into the courtyard for a little sparring session. No need for your exam anxiety to flare up here, you can't lose this fight. Vilkas just needs to see how hard you can throw down. Okay, you can lose the fight, but obviously you really have to try. This segment and the bit that has Vilkas ordering us around to do some bitch work is meant to sell the idea that members gotta earn their place around here, and, well, I approve. It's a shame Skyrim did away with faction ranks because the Companions would be a perfect faction for ranks. You know, outside of the fantasy that they don't have leaders here. It's ironic that despite the fact that tonally the Companions being reduced to mercenaries doesn't really work, they're functionally a much better mercenary faction than the Fighters Guild in Oblivion was. This is because the Radiant Quest system allows the game to generate endless contracts for the player to complete. Even with it being sloppily implemented in this faction, the Thieves Guild does this a lot better, the Companions still end up playing pretty well for a mercenary character. I was originally planning on going into the Radiant Quest system in the Thieves Guild part of the third video, but I forgot the Companions was, like, no joke, 80% Radiant Quests, so I gotta cover it here and now. I've already mentioned it several times since the first video, and there's not a whole lot to the system, but seeing as it's one of Skyrim's more controversial features, it tends to get more discussion than the removal of classes somehow, I guess I'm gonna have to come up to bat for it. I actually like the system. I think it needs some tweaks and needs to be used more carefully than it was in Skyrim, but I see the benefit the system provides. The Companions shows it doing what it would be best for, generating endless grunt contract work for the player. Once you accept a contract, the system looks at the quests that you got and then randomly pulls from a predefined list of locations and objectives to complete. Some quests are a bit more complex, like Rescue Mission, which will select a dungeon that contains a prison cell and an unfortunate non-essential NPC that you need to go rescue. Other quests are simpler, like Trouble in Skyrim, which just selects a dungeon you need to raid of all of its inhabitants. With this system, Bethesda is able to leverage the 140 plus dungeons in the game to create enough content to keep the player busy. And that's the name of the game here keeping the player busy with tasks that will keep them moving and interacting with the dozens of systems the game has to offer. It's meant to give players open-ended goals that act as destinations to work towards, and the enjoyment is meant to come from the moments between accepting the contract and fulfilling it. There's also a little reward at the end, usually some leveled amount of gold, though that's almost always overshadowed by the loot acquired during the adventure itself. And that's really it. It's not designed to replace handcrafted quests entirely, but you'd be forgiven in thinking that by how the Companions barely has anything handcrafted, as even some of its story missions have raiding quest components to them. I think this is just another symptom of the faction getting rushed out the door, though. Maybe there's a few devs at Bethesda rubbing their hands together because they intended to use the system to automate their jobs, but with how much in Skyrim is handcrafted, I just don't buy the idea that Bethesda made the Radiant system to entirely outsource quest design to the system. But that hasn't stopped Radiant system detractors from using the system as proof that Bethesda's getting lazy, and Fallout 4 only poured a tanker full of 93 octane on this conversation. I think there's a lot of resentment towards the system for the few times times it made these players go out to a location only for them to realize that they were on a radiant quest the whole time and no story will be happening. These players felt some sense of betrayal from the designers who tried giving them an errand instead of a normal quest and assumed that they wouldn't notice. As a result, they lay blame on a system that they believe is faulty or fundamentally duplicitous. Like half the other issues I've been bringing up in this video, I think the problem here is not the system itself but simply how it is being presented. Skyrim isn't doing enough to explain itself here, and this leads players into thinking grinding endless raiding quests is another intended gameplay loop, same as grinding dungeons and ignoring core skills for their preferred playstyle. 
First time players can fall into the rut of grinding raiding quests like bounties only to eventually realize that they are, in fact, inexhaustible and won't be leading to anything bigger. The solution here would have been to better signal to the player what are repeatable raiding quests and what are bigger handcrafted quests. The quest journal was so close to having this figured out too. The journal is essentially split into two parts the main screen where each quest is listed individually, and another permanent entry that will list all the little errands the player also has, like joining the Stormcloaks, investigating a rumor, or delivering an item to an NPC. This page is meant to signal to the player that these aren't full quests. At best, they are errands that will lead to a bigger quest, but sometimes it's just a simple job that needs doing. Having a tab just like this for all the contract work and bounties a player can pick up would go a long way to telling players that this is just some radiant content. Now, I'm not going to live under the naive belief that this would stop everyone from complaining about Radiant Quests, because there is a subset of players that truly do believe that the hundreds of quests that are in a game like Skyrim needs to be some grand adventure with a gripping story and an expectation-subverting premise. Not that 99% of the handcrafted quests in Skyrim do that either. I don't think Bethesda should feel obligated to cater exclusively to these players, though. I don't think the main story quests of a major faction should be randomly generated bandit dungeons like we see in the Companions, but I don't see a problem with the majority of my contract work being that. But there is another argument to make against the system. Once you figure out how to identify Radiant Quests, it's easy to avoid and ignore them, but it can make the world feel a lot more shallow once you realize what's going on and figure out these activities will have literally no bearing on the world itself. So here's how we fix that in the case of the Companions. To start, we need limits on contract work. The fact that I can endlessly bust through the same two types of jobs Farkas will give really highlights the artificial nature of these tasks. If I finish a certain type of job, it should be put on cooldown while the guild waits for someone else to bring in another contract of that type. Sometimes Farkas should just tell me that he has nothing and I should go speak to another member of the guild. Plenty of games use arbitrary cooldowns to this effect, and I doubt it would be difficult to add hidden timers to rating contracts here. As we complete contracts, we'd be progressing to our next rank. Once we complete enough contracts, we'd be trusted to handle the next story mission, and successfully completing the story mission would progress us into the next rank. Higher ranks would give us access to more complex and better paying Radiant contracts. The Thieves Guild also had special contracts we'd unlock after completing enough Radiant contracts, and those were unique handcrafted quests that could only be done once. The fact that the Companions didn't have this exact same setup shows that either the devs for the different guilds weren't talking to each other, or once again, they just didn't have the time to implement the same system into the Companions. There are a few unique contracts, like helping Farkas and Vilkas cure their lycanthropy and collecting the Totems of Hircine, but these are just Radiant quests with a bit of window dressing, not full-blown unique quests like the ones in the Thieves' Guild. These contracts are limited, though, because you can only cure Farkas and Vilkas once, and there's only so many totems to collect, so at least they have that going for them. I kind of feel bad proposing Bethesda just do what they did in Marwyn's Fighters' Guild to make the companions work better with raiding quests, but really that's all you need to do to make a good mercenary faction. Skyrim at least has the Radiant system to add more content, but a Sword for Hire faction really doesn't need to go beyond this to work fine. If we really wanted to get crazy, we could beef up the number of members we have in the faction and use Radiant AI to have them going out to the world and completing contracts. Maybe if we aren't fast enough, one of our companion members will snipe the available contracts, or maybe they'll complete them if we ignore them for too long or botch the job. We could recruit others to help us with our job at the expense of a percentage of the cut, or join NPC companions to help them with their contracts for a percentage of their cut. There could also be special jobs that requires us to take one or two companions with us, but the job is harder and will pay out much more. I could see this system getting to be a bit too much for the game though, especially for Radiant NPC AI. It's fine to send the player to random dungeons all over the map, but NPCs have to contend with things like not having fast travel and getting ambushed by dragons. So sending them all the way to Winterhold to kill a monster seems untenable. I mean, this is assuming that they aren't all set to essential, but a more elegant solution to this problem would require the companions to have halls all over the province. Members would work out of their respective halls and would be limited to the hole that their hall is located in. But at that point, we really are just making a Nordic flavored fighters guild. This is why I keep saying I don't think the companions were fit for being a province spanning mercenary organization. They're just too centralized, too small, too inconsequential, and too thematically insular to actually do the things that they are meant to be doing, which isn't helped by us being the only ones actually completing contracts. Like, how is the guild even getting these contracts done in any timely manner that makes them preferable to just hiring a local mercenary group or going to the town guards? One job had me killing a wild animal that snuck into a farmer's house in solitude. 
figure it would take at least three days for the Curry to make it from Solitude to White Run to deliver the contract, then let's be generous and say we pick it up a day later and rush out to get it done immediately. So three more days for us to make it to Solitude to kill the animal. In the six days it took for the companions to take care of the animal, three things were much more likely to occur. Either the farmer got the city guards or a local hunter to kill the thing, or they tried chasing the beast off themselves, or the animal got sick of shacking up in someone's house for a week and left on its own. It's wholly improbable that the farmer would perpetually sleep in their barn waiting for a companion representative to come kill an animal. Even things like the kidnapping contracts don't really make much sense. Sure, I'd want the best people going out to save my loved one, but if getting the best people for the job involves a lag time of a week at best, I'm going to be looking for a more immediate solution. But whatever, the companions are mercenaries and completing contract work is part of the experience. Or rather, completing two contracts because that's all we need to do before we are made members of the circle. After that, things start to really go off the rails. So I guess it's time we start tackling this story. Apparently, after smacking Vilkis around and Codlack telling her she could join the companions, Gutha still wasn't in the group. Sure, she was trusted to represent the organization and do contract work for them, but she wasn't really a companion. This came as news to her when Skewer pulled her aside and told her it was time she earned her keep. They'd gotten word from a passing scholar that a piece of Wuthrad, the legendary axe of Yskimor, was located in the crypt of Dustman's Cairn. Honor demanded the companions reclaim the relic, and so this was the perfect chance for Gutha to be tested. Farkas was assigned to be her shield sibling for the job, so she just had to follow his lead, retrieve the fragment, and return alive. Do all that, and she could call her of a companion, even though she'd already been doing that. Yeah, whatever, we still don't have any story taking place, so this might get the ball rolling a bit. This is one of the few quests in the companions that has us being assigned a follower, which, yeah, with the name of the faction and their whole MO, it makes sense we'd get a few quests where we are actually, you know, working with other members. Unfortunately, the clunky nature of recruiting followers meant that Mercurio was gonna have to beat it for the quest. This wouldn't have been such a big deal if it wasn't for the fact that the guy was lugging around all my smithing materials and there was no way I was going to be able to carry all that at once. Had this character been fresh out of Helgen, this would have been a serious problem because she'd still have no place to store those materials with her mobile chest being locked out of the party. Fortunately, I got Anniversary Edition, so I have many free houses lying around for me to claim. The first house I initially had to claim was... Uh... Nichwanthums? Nichwanthums. Nichwanthums. I, I promise you I'm not actually doing a bit right now. I'm seriously trying to pronounce this thing. Nichwanthums? The fucking dwarven home. This creation adds an ancient dwarven manor that the player needs to restore. The premise got me excited because you first need to fix up the Dwemer machinery there that you then take control of to do all the restorations to the rundown place. I figured this was going to be something similar to Hearthfire where I'd have to collect materials and bring it back for my automatons to use to upgrade the house and maybe I'd get to make some combat bots that would follow me around and maybe there'd even be some special dwarven crafting device like the Ethereum Forge. And I'd always have a reason to return back to the house so I can perform home upgrades and... Nah nah, this is a creation item you should know better by now. We repair the machines by putting a few junk items we find in the adjacent room into a container and then press a couple of buttons to summon a repair spider. After that, the machinery does nothing. Then we go upstairs and pull a lever in one of the rooms of the house and in 24 hours the spider bot magically restores the room despite having no materials or tools. So I just went around, pulled a lever, went outside, skipped 24 hours, went back inside, pulled another lever, and repeated the process until the whole house was restored. It took all of about 20 minutes, and that was just because I was getting a bunch of footage for each room. It's a big place, but it's so far out of the way, and getting into the house requires going through a small dungeon. For whatever reason, there's no way to enter the house directly from the overworld. I guess the creator missed the fact that the player houses are meant to be a convenience for the player. The second CC house I claimed was the one I stuck with for the rest of the playthrough. Hendraheim is a Jorvesker looking house down near the Reach that we get access to after reaching level 10. We then receive a letter from a courier penned by Edvina Shieldharth challenging us to a duel. The letter will read ever so slightly different depending on if the player is a Nord or not, but the gist is the house is super awesome and she wants a great warrior to inherit it. If we can beat her in a duel, it's ours. The Creation Club seem to really love that old orc random encounter because its premise gets constantly recycled. If you're unfamiliar with the encounter, there's a chance you might find a random orc surrounded by a bunch of dead animals out on the side of the road in the wilderness. If approached, the orc will tell you that they are waiting for a worthy foe that will finally kill them because honor demands they die now that they are too old to do much else. In doing this, they honor themselves in Malakoth, and we get the option of offering them that honorable death. I always enjoy killing these orcs in some super cheesy dishonorable way, like stunlocking them with my shield bash or letting my followers kill them instead because, you know, I'm just an asshole.
You never really get any sort of reward for killing the orc, though. You just get the satisfaction of doing something honorable, if that's how you view it. That whole side of the premise seems entirely lost on the CC mod authors, though, because they took this and twisted it into a vehicle for letting us take NPCs to honorably. Also, these NPCs never have any unique dialogue because, you know, why would paid mods bother adding things like voice acting when we have things like journals and letters instead? What, can't you guys read? Except this creation really shows how flat this approach comes across because Guther arrives to answer the warrior's request for euthanasia and she just goes, I understand. I understand. The fight isn't anything challenging. While she's got a decent amount of health, her level is fixed as a player's level, and she just has these standard one-handed warrior perks. The biggest curveball the mod author threw in is giving her a sword that deals some fire damage. So if you need a sword to disenchant for its fire damage effect, come send Advina here to Sovngarde so she can be with her shield sibling once again. Uh, no idea if she and Hyarik were meant to be in the companions, or if this is just a generic term of honor she's thrown around because she's a Nord, and... I don't really care. I got the keys to a crib now, and it's a great place if you like putting gear on display. It's got all the conveniences you might want, although the smithing stuff being located outside was kind of annoying. But it did mean I didn't have to go through multiple loading screens just to drop off my smithing materials, so there's that. There's one more house I ended up grabbing late in the game just to check it out. Tundra Homestead provides a cozy cottage just outside of Whiterun. Complete with crafting stations and fully furnished, this home is a quiet getaway from adventuring. Full support for spouses and adopted children included. Yeah, I just read off the creation description for that one because there's not much to note here. It's an alternative to Bree's home in Whiterun if you want a house outside of the city walls. You don't have to do any quests to unlock it, but it does cost slightly more than Bree's home at 7,500 gold. Once purchased, it's fully furnished, though, and comes with many things a modded house is expected to provide. I do like it more than Hendraheim, though, because at least I had to pay for it, and I'm a bit of a fan of the bug box apartment aesthetic. Anyways, after telling Mercurio to beat Burks back to Riften, don't worry, we can rehire him for free later if we go back and recruit him fast enough, it's over to Dustman's Cairn where Farkas is waiting. Gutha was prepared for a standard Draugr crypt run, but strangely, most of the Draugr were already dead. A lot of their coffins were already popped open, and if Gutha didn't know any better, she would have assumed someone had already been through the place recently. But Fortify Intelligence potions no longer exist, so Gutha was left drooling on herself while killing the odd Shambler that was still alive. The two of them make it to a chamber where a lever is just waiting to be pulled, and then... Now look what you've gotten yourself into. I'll find the release. What was that? It's time to die, dog. We knew you'd be coming. Your mistake, companion. Which one is that? It doesn't matter. Where's that armor? Dies. Killing you will make for an excellent story. None of you will be alive to tell it. Okay, where do I even begin here? Let's ignore the technical issues, like how the NPCs die even though Farkas wasn't hitting them, and that time one of the NPCs kill camped another NPC and almost broke the scripting for the sequence. Let's focus on the storytelling here. I can pick this thing apart to death for the next hour, so instead I'm going to break this down into three main issues. One, the silver hand come completely out of left field. Two, the werewolf thing comes completely out of left field. Three, our character is not allowed to respond in a believable and appropriate manner. Let's start with the Silver Hand. Up until this point, we don't even know that they exist. There's a chance we can run into them in one of their dungeons out in the wilderness, but they will attack on sight just like any other bandits. And they are bandits, they are part of the bandit faction, have basically all the same equipment, though their loot tables are modified slightly. If you try casting Soul Trap on one of their bodies, the message prompt will even call them bandits. We'll get more into what little there is to know about them in a bit, but for now, all we need to know is that they had absolutely no introduction, and that makes no sense. You would think someone would have warned us that, oh, by the way, we got big beef with this group of bandits with silver weapons, you know, just FYI. Of course, they couldn't do that because that would spoil the big reveal, which leads into the next issue. The werewolf thing makes no sense. Presently, we don't know much because Farkas doesn't explain a lot, except that the circle are all werewolves, but we know enough to say that this is f***ing 
and stupid. I don't know how many of you watching have worked in uh, pretty much any place of business ever, but if you have, you're probably aware of just how easy it is for rumors and secrets to slip out and spread throughout the workplace. You know, maybe so-and-so are dating, what's-his-face is thinking about quitting, you know who got caught jerking it in the bathroom. How fast do you think the entire senior management staff being cursed abominations would get out? Ignoring the fact that at this point, everyone in Whiterun ought to know something funky is going down in the Companions, especially when we get our ceremony and go on a rampage in the city. How are the lower members of the guild not figuring out something is going on here? When the guards keep telling me I stink like a wet dog after I become a werewolf, surely Yorvisker smelling like a goddamn kennel would tip people off that things are a little weird around here. This would absolutely get out, especially if this has been a thing in the Companions for years now. The fact that I can't pick an option to run away screaming or to finish with a silver hand started is just... Who would stick around after seeing this? Guth has signed on because she just wanted to make some cash. Now she's found out her bosses are all secret monsters that are actively being hunted by a group of monster hunters. And remember, we're here to prove ourselves to be accepted into the guild properly. Why would this honorable orc warrior go along with them after she just got sent to go rough up some dude on a farm and is now being told the guild is full of werewolves? I'm going to resist the urge to completely rewrite everything we've seen up until this point and instead just improve this segment by moving some pieces around and adding a few more lines of dialogue. We make it to the end of the dungeon and collect the fragment of Ruth Rat after having fought through all the Draugr in the dungeon, including the giant encounter at the end. Once we grab the fragments, that's when the Silver Hand show up. They tell us they've been monitoring the place after they discovered the fragment and sent someone to tip off the companions about its location because they knew the companions would send some members to pick the thing up. They admit they are actively trying to isolate members of the companions to pick them off and yada yada yada, it's time to die. Exhausted from having just fought through all the Draugr, Farkas transforms and goes beast mode on their asses. He runs off back the way we came all the way to the entrance of the dungeon. We follow him, killing whatever Silverhand stragglers are left behind, until we're back at the entrance and Farkas is in his human form again, wounded and exhausted. Here's when we can finally talk to him and he'll explain a bit, admitting that the Circle are all werewolves, but he's too wounded and needs us to escort him back to Yorvisker. Here we get the option to escort him back or tell him we don't want anything to do with werewolves and the companions. If we were going to go all the way and rewrite the story from here, we could modify this sequence a bit. Make it so that we don't have to kill any Silverhand until we get to the entrance where we see Farkas and the leader of the gang getting ready to square off. And here we have an option of either helping Farkas or the Silverhand. I'm not going to go too deep with this suggestion because obviously we have to rework a ton of stuff, expand the silver hand, and that's just getting into total redo territory, which is never really my intention with my suggestions. All I want to do is point out that all we had to do was recontextualize these events, add some actual pacing to what's going on, and suddenly the thing works much better. Just giving us some time to consider what's going on from when the silver hands show up, Farkas turning into a werewolf, and when we actually get to confront Farkas about his lycanthropy does a lot to make it more believable that our character wouldn't just in instinctively slay Farkas where he stood. It was at this point that I began wondering just how much time they really had to make this faction functional. It's pretty clear to me that they were rushed, but how little time did they actually have to put these quests and cutscenes together? I just showed how this could work by simply shuffling these pieces around. As much as I doubt them, I still don't think Bethesda writers are so bad that this cutscene was their grand uncompromised vision. This had to be the result of having virtually no time left to give all these individual plot points their own quests, conversations, and cutscenes. So they just stuck them all here and moved on. The story doesn't dare slow down at this point because the devs are out of time. So we make it back with Farkas and get inducted into the guild. It's only after the brief ceremony that Gutha is allowed to ask, very civilly mind you, about the circle being werewolves. Codlack admits it, but calls it a curse and says he's been looking for a cure. We shouldn't worry about it, though, because this is our night to celebrate. So it's back to doing contract work. We aren't able to ask any of the other members of the Circle about this or even the Silver Hand. I guess Gutha really took the don't worry about it to heart and just wanted to get back to work. After doing another Radiant contract, we're booted off to Skir, who has been asking about us. The time has come for Gutha to become a member of the Circle and a Werewolf. Skior and Ayala need to do this in secret though because Codlack disapproves of more members being converted. Skior tells us we have a choice, but if we want to progress the story, or do anything related to the Companions, we really don't. The faction is essentially frozen in time until the player accepts being converted. Skior and Ayala will just sit in this chamber until the player capitulates. We aren't allowed to pick up new contracts, even though this is supposed to be getting done in secret. We can't leave and tell Cobb like about this. We literally can't do anything except drink the Kool-Aid or admit we're playing a video game and we refuse to progress the story anymore. Immersion be damned. I think it's rather telling that I'd be teleported onto the map when I tried leaving the Underforge during this sequence. It's as if the designers really didn't consider the possibility that some players might not want to be turned into a werewolf. Considering this isn't listed as a known bug, I'm gonna give the game the benefit of the doubt and say this is just a serendipitous bug for my save, but it was consistent. 
Uh, all right, what do we do here? Um, Guth is an orc who likes a good fight, so she didn't even have to think twice about taking Hirstein's gift. Fuck it, who cares? Next thing she knew, she was out in the streets rocking her new beastly form. Despite being hopped up on Aella's bath salts blood, Gutha still had the sense to not maul Bellathor and some little Nord girl. And it wasn't long before she was waking up in the woods with her new blood sister. Aella was now ready to introduce Gutha to her favorite hobby, raiding Silverhand camps. We're not given any reason for why we are now going to raid a Silverhand stronghold. Aella just says it's a celebration for us becoming werewolves, which sounds absurd if that's the only reason. Presumably this is meant to be retaliation for the ambush at Dustman's Cairn, but surely we already got our revenge when we killed every Silverhand there with Farkas? Unless we're in a state of war with the Silverhand, in which case we go back to the fact that no one told us about this conflict. I really don't think there's any justification for this raid other than the designers needed a quest where we go kill Silverhand bandits. So they gave us a fort with a bunch of them to kill. We are allowed to transform here on our own for the first time, so I guess now's a good point to get into what life is like as a werewolf. Honestly, it's okay. I remember how it used to play before Dawn Guard expanded the mechanics and added a dedicated perk tree, and I remember it being super weak, tedious, and an all-around terrible experience. Fortunately, now I have Dawn Guard, and being a werewolf is a relatively fun way to break up the dungeon crawling experience. I ended up abiding by a rule of switching to beast form if I ended up in a dungeon against bandits, because werewolf mechanics are really geared towards fighting human enemies. So how it works is once a day you can activate the beast form power to transform into a werewolf, for 150 seconds. You can feast on the bodies of fallen human NPCs, hence why this really only works against things like bandits, and doing so will add an extra 30 seconds to beast form and will heal you 50 points of health. Feasting is also how you earn perk points to invest in the werewolf tree. If you do Hearsene's quest, you get the Ring of Hearsene, which lets you transform an unlimited number of times a day, which might be useful for some players, but I rarely found myself transforming more than once a week. Once in beast form, you're forced into a third-person perspective, which kind of proves my point from earlier about how forcing a third-person perspective in a game like Skyrim sucks. A lot of dungeons are too tight for the camera to fit comfortably, and I found my character unwieldy. Personally, I would have preferred rolling as a werewolf in first person, but maybe they thought werewolves were too fast to be playing in first person, or I don't know, maybe they just couldn't get the animations right. As a werewolf, all of our gear is unequipped, and we can no longer use any spells, powers, or shouts. Likewise, we can't use potions, poisons, scrolls, or anything else from our inventory. In fact, we can't even open our inventory or the map, but really any screens except the werewolf perk tree. We also can't open containers, so we can't loot anything, we can't pick locks, and we can't initiate dialogue. We can open unlocked doors and activate things like levers though, so at least we can progress through dungeons. The trade-off for all these limitations is that werewolves have a set of claws that have a base damage of 20, which is level scaled at a rate of plus 5 damage for every 5 levels after level 10, capping out at 80 base damage at level 46. Dawnguard also adds level scale damage resistance to beast form, going up plus 50 for each 5 levels past level 10, capping out at 400 damage resistance at level 46. Werewolves also have almost 50% increased reach with their claws because of their longer arms. They are also immune to being staggered, have increased health and stamina, and stamina regens twice as fast. Werewolves are also faster when sprinting. How much faster? Uh, about 15-20% by my estimate. They also have 2,000 extra carry capacity, which is worthless considering you can't pick up items. As an added bonus though, just being infected with lycanthropy will also make you immune to all diseases, even if you never bother using beast form. Just another reason I find disease resistance to be a joke in Skyrim. Werewolves are also equipped with a Howl ability, which in vanilla Skyrim just hits every enemy in range with a powerful fear effect. Dawnguard expanded this into three abilities that can be unlocked and swapped out at any given time after completing the faction story and collecting the totems of Hearsen with Aella. Those totems can swap the fear effect with a Detect Life spell, two summonable spectral werewolves, or a more powerful fear effect. Outside of the summoning howl, howling has no cooldown, so you can spam the fear effect as much as you want. Though howling locks you in place and makes you kind of vulnerable to damage, so there's a bit of risk involved there. And really risk is the balance here. Going beast mode is all about aggression and speed. You have a few moves at your disposal, such as power attacks that can throw enemies across a room. Kill camps also initiate more frequently when in beast form, but that's a bit of a mixed bag as I found they more often than not just slowed me down and left me vulnerable for my enemies to catch up. You're immune to damage while locked in kill cam animations, but that doesn't mean your enemies won't be lining up shots in the interim. Where you're not immune is when you're feasting on dead bodies. 
Feasting locks you into a few seconds long animation where you are vulnerable to taking damage, requiring you to consider when and where you're going to be munching on some bandit guts. Enemy archers and mages can be a real danger when feasting, which is another reason having a ranged follower like Mercurio can come in handy. Like I said, there's a perk tree associated with werewolves. It's okay, but like every other perk tree in Skyrim, it's lacking in imagination, and so the most useful perks are the ones focused on increasing the health and damage numbers of beast form. One of the perks lets you feast on dead creatures too, not just human bodies, so players who really want to roll as a werewolf all the time can pair that with Hearsene's ring and go to town, though non-human bodies only add 15 more seconds to beast form. The only other aspect about beast form worth mentioning is how passive NPCs react to it. In Skyrim, werewolves are a kill on sight situation, so expect basically everything under the sun to try killing you except members of the Circle, the Dark Brotherhood, the Thieves Guild, followers in your service, and wild wolves. The upshot is that any crimes committed in beast form won't be applied to your human form, so it's kinda like the Grey Cow of Nocturnal from Oblivion. Oh right, I almost forgot to mention, you can't exit beast form on your own. You have to wait for the invisible timer to expire. Fortunately, the wait key still works, so you can skip a few hours until your beast form wears off, but that's not a very intuitive thing every player is going to think of, and it's not like a tutorial pops up to tell you about this or anything. I don't understand how this thing went through several revisions with a DLC expanding upon it, and nobody thought to add a dedicated way to immediately transform back into human form. And you'll want to go back into human form ASAP once you clear a dungeon, because then you have to go through the entire dungeon again, looting all the bodies and chests you couldn't open, and picking all the locks you couldn't interact with as a werewolf. For some players, this alone is a total deal breaker for them and renders beast form non-viable. Me, personally, I was able to live with backtracking through a dungeon once in a while in exchange for the novelty of tearing through a dungeon as a werewolf. But a novelty is all being a werewolf really is. Even with its expansion in Dawn Guard, there's just not a whole lot here to make being a werewolf its own dedicated playstyle. It took me maybe an hour playing in beast form to have all the perks unlocked and another 30 minutes to recover all the totems and experience everything being a werewolf has to offer. I never transformed outside of a dungeon because there was virtually no reason to do so except maybe the increased stamina for traveling very long distances. But doing that would run the risk of aggroing NPCs and I didn't feel like leaving a trail of dead NPCs just because I wanted to sprint at the speed of a horse for a minute straight. It was fun to use it once in a while for the occasional dungeon, which was why I implemented the banded beast mode rule. But playing against enemies that require more tactics like Falmer, or against more obnoxious enemies like dragons, werewolf form is more of a liability than anything else. Sure, the speed and instant knockdown attacks can neutralize enemies very quickly, but there's a lot of unavoidable damage as a werewolf. With the healing mechanics being the way they are and having no ranged abilities except the howl, if you can't immediately overwhelm an opponent as a werewolf, you're pretty much boned. I think adding a couple of defensive abilities like some sort of damage immunity effect or a slow time effect would go a long way towards improving the experience. As well, tightening up the camera and controls, increasing the movement speed more, and allowing us to perform much higher and farther jumps would also help. Ultimately though, carrying something that some consider a curse should well, it should carry some level of inconvenience that alters how you play the game. The fact that I'm considering picking up Lycanthropy in my current survival mode playthrough for the free disease resistance shows just how low impact having this curse really is. Other members of the circle, notably Vilkus, though Farkas has some stuff to note if you cure him, indicate the affliction causes them issues that has impacted their quality of life, but that's not reflected at all for the player. We aren't compelled to transform by any mechanics, so I guess the player just rolled a natural 20 and got lycanthropy without the bloodlust. I'm not advocating for something permanent like holding onto the cursed ring of Hearsene if playing as a werewolf, but maybe something like if you don't go beast mode from time to time and feast on a couple of bodies, you'll end up transforming out in the world uncontrollably. It's not much, and my bandit policy would certainly satisfy Gutha's bloodlust, but it's at least something that would need attention. So after we tear through the Silverhand Fort, we get to the end and find Skier dead. For some reason, the guy next on deck to be Harbinger decided to try soloing an entire fort of enemies specially trained and equipped for killing werewolves. Ayala is upset because he did this, and also they might have been lovers or something, so now she wants to punish the Silverhand even more. She tells us she's going to hang around and look for clues on the bodies, which I guess she does via now extinct mysticism magic because she immediately has the location of another Silverhand outpost. This is actually a radiant contract because now with Skier dead, Ayala will be issuing Silverhand specific contracts until their story is wrapped up. I was given a quest to retrieve another fragment of Wu thread from a Silverhand camp, but it's also possible to get a mission to assassinate a Silverhand chief or to steal some generic intel from a Silverhand camp. All of these quests are temporary though because once we wipe them out during the story, obviously there will no longer be any Silverhand camps for Ayla to send us to. 
So let's knock their discussion out real fast before we knock them out of the story entirely. Hostile werewolves are probably the rarest enemies in the game for most players. The reason being, in vanilla Skyrim, they just don't exist outside of a few that could be found in Silverhand Outposts. In vanilla Skyrim, werewolves in general don't exist outside of the Circle, Silverhand Camps, Hearsene's Quest, and the one werewolf in the Dark Brotherhood. Dawnguard added a few random encounters the player can come across out in the wilderness at night if they've progressed the companion story past proving honor. I don't know why they made that quest a prerequisite for these random encounters to spawn, but once they are active, they are going to be active for the rest of the game. This can result in some players, such as myself, being unsure if hostile werewolves are even a thing in Skyrim. This is a major issue for the Silver Hand because it makes it seem like the faction either completely solved Skyrim's werewolf problem, or that they existed to address something that was never a threat to begin with. With the Dawnguard DLC addressing this gaping hole in Skyrim's world building, it's clear Bethesda intended for werewolves to be more of a recognizable threat in the game, but they probably just ran out of time to make them as obvious of a threat as vampires are in vanilla Skyrim. As a result, I'm gonna assume werewolves are meant to be a constant threat for the people of Skyrim, even if we gotta jump through some mental and literal hoops to make it so. This has me asking the question then, why is a group of bandits trying to save Skyrim from a werewolf threat? If this is supposed to be a major issue for the people of Skyrim, why aren't the Jarls putting out bounties on werewolves and contracting legitimate forces to fight this threat? Like, imagine the companions trying to juggle the issue of being werewolves while Jarls are constantly giving them contracts to go kill ones in the wild. But the unsatisfying answer goes back to this whole questline being incomplete, and this is why I'm getting bored even talking about this questline at this point. It's clear the Silverhand were thrown together to give us some kind of antagonist for this questline, resulting in them being completely undeveloped. I originally wrote a whole thing here listing what little we know about the Silverhand, their similarity to other generic bandit factions, and all these different theories people have about who they are and what their motives might be, but getting that deep into speculation about an incomplete faction is just pointless. I'm under the impression that had there been more to them, like them being a splinter faction from the Companions, we'd at least have gotten some diary somewhere hinting at that. I just don't think there was much planned for the Silverhand themselves. There's a lot of similarities between them and factions in the Dawnguard, like the Dawnguard themselves and the Vigilance of Stendar, which has me thinking the Silverhand were swapped in last minute when the devs ran out of time to implement those factions at the Companions questline. With that knowledge, it suddenly makes sense why we never hear about them leading up to their reveal, why their story just sort of ends, and why they are literally just bandits with some slightly tweaked loot tables. I don't envy the designers who were forced to speedrun implementing a whole antagonist faction to a questline because there was some half-baked werewolf mechanics that needed to be put into the game. But I'm getting tired of talking about this incomplete faction, so let's wrap this up already. After grabbing that Wuthred fragment for Ayala, Gutha makes it back to Yorvesker where she has a little one-on-one -on -one with the big man himself. Kodlak knows all about the revenge killings Ayala and Gutha have been committing, but he fears it's gone too far. It's also distracting from his mission to cure himself of lycanthropy, so he's got a mission for her. He explains the origins of the Circle's lycanthropy, which goes back to a group of witches that essentially tricked the companions of yesteryear to hunt in the name of Hircine in exchange for some incredible power. The companions thought that lycanthropy would be temporary, but it turns out it's permanent and has been with the group ever since. Kodlak wants a cure because he believes he won't be accepted into Sovngarde as a werewolf. Technically, Hircine will have first dibs on his soul after death, which means Kodlak will be sent to the hunting ground realms of Oblivion. Ayala already told Gutha how hyped she is for that because sitting around drinking meat all day in Sovngarde sounds boring. Well, I'm glad somebody agreed with me on that. Personally, Gutha has been enjoying the fursuit bequeathed to her by Papa Hirsin and agrees with Ayala that Hirsin's retirement package sounds pretty dope. But she sympathizes with the old Nordic warrior and agrees to go grab the heads of the witches to put him at ease. It's a shame we don't really get much out of this conflict because this is a genuinely fascinating setup. Nords aren't known for being hip with the Daedra. They acknowledge they exist, but doing their bidding and worshipping them is pretty much unheard of. I guess Hircine would be one of the more palatable princes for Nords, but we're left with much to consider. If there's a lot that could have been explored here, maybe some history of the companions straying from their Nordic traditions as non-Nordic influences took hold in the group, or maybe a desperate harbinger needing a quick way to strengthen the guild, or any number of lore-related topics, but none of that gets covered here. The companions got tricked, an old man wants to be cured, though some count them too, wait, one, like donning the fur. Also, how does he know we need the heads? What are we supposed to do with them after that? He's very light on the details here. Kodlak's just as undeveloped as everyone else in this faction, so turning this story away from its lore premise towards a story of regret with his character just doesn't really work. 
More so when we return after destroying the witches and find Codlock got killed off camera in a silver hand raid on Yorvesker. A group managed to slip into the city and assault the guild hall, killing Codlock in the process and stealing all the pieces of Wuthrad. Ignoring the improbability that any number of Silverhand could realistically lead a successful assault on the Companion's headquarters, how did a host of bandits make it into the city? Before we can make it into the city, we have to convince the guards to let us in, and then we see the guards kicking out a group of Alakir warriors because of their shady business. Clearly, the guards in Whiterun are on high alert for anything suspicious. I'm really meant to believe that what must have been an army of Silverhand bandits just strolled in. Vilkas wants vengeance and those pieces back, so it's time to go hit the Silverhand HQ and wipe them out once and for all. I haven't mentioned it yet, but every story mission in this questline is a standard dungeon run, where every other major questline does its best to pace out its dungeon quest with the occasional, uh, non-dungeon activity. The only hope the player can have of breaking away from Skyrim dungeons here is to land the rare Radiant contract, not leading them into one. So, one, two, skip a few, the Silverhand are no more, and now we are at Codlack's funeral. I'd actually forgotten how this story went, so for a few minutes I genuinely thought Codlack got scammed out of getting into Sofengard. Turns out we can do that posthumously, though, a detail even Codlack forgot. So don't worry if you were afraid the story was going to make you feel anything other than boredom here. After the funeral, we hand over the fragments of Wuthred to Yurland, forcing us to dig through Codlack's quarters for one of the fragments, where we find his journal and discover this was a chosen one plot the entire time. Codlock had been listening to his dreams that were telling him furries don't make it into Nordic heaven, and in those dreams he was seeing Gutha. Not because he has a thing for strong orc women, but because Gutha would be the one to save his soul from here scene. This was why he was quick to let us join the companions. Not that we really needed any further justification for that. He also confirms the werewolf arrangement has been a thing in the circle for several harbingers now, making it seem even less likely that the companions wouldn't be known as a here scene cult at this point. I don't know why we needed the part about Codlock having visions of our character because his his entries show he's been closely following our blistering progress through the guild. He notes how we're much better equipped than anyone else in the circle to take his place now that Skira is dead, and while his ghost pops up to give us the promotion in person, circumventing the need to have the circle approve the promotion, we still have a major problem here. The previous Harbinger is meant to impart all their knowledge of the history and the traditions of the Companions onto the next Harbinger, and this is the main way continuity is maintained in the guild over the centuries. But with Codlack dying before he could have more than two conversations with us, I guess all that knowledge is now just lost. All that history dating back to the Atmoran invasion of Tamriel is just gone forever, it would seem. Truly, that's much more tragic than Codlock having to endure a bloodborne LARP realm for all eternity. Vilkas boasts he knows more than their history than anyone else, save for Codlock, I'd assume, so maybe there's some hope yet. Hey, seeing as you're not going out on contracts, maybe you could write some of that knowledge down, Vilkas? You know, it would be nice for us not to have our entire identity wiped out if you were to depart. Talos knows I won't be around once we're done here to carry any of that forward. We gather in the Underforge to discuss our next move, and Vilkas insists we follow through with Codlock's wishes to try and cure him. He brings up the magical convenience in the tomb of Yskamore that will let us save Codlock's soul. We just need two things. The heads of the witches? Check. And an intact wound thread. Uh... The flames of Hero can reforge the shadow. Oh, okay, check. Yerland, how long did he spend working on that thing? I literally just gave you those fragments. Then again, I could have knocked out 200 dwarven bows in that time, so eh, fair enough, I guess. The reason Yerland Greymane was able to pull Wuthred out of his ass here is because we finally collected all the pieces of the axe and the Skyforge was awakened from Codlack's funeral. The fragments thing I find a little funny because depending upon how the reading contracts work, you can end up only collecting one piece of the axe at Dustman's Cairn, and the thought that the companions were only one fragment short of completing this epic relic is just, well, it's just so fitting. The Skyforge is another thing that barely gets mentioned in this quest line, which is another big mystery and another missed opportunity. In lore books written for Skyrim, the Skyforge is described as an incredibly ancient and incredibly powerful forge that predates life on Nern itself. The native elves were terrified of the thing, which was why one of the original companions claimed it for himself. The Skyforge is literally the oldest thing in Whiterun, and is the reason the city was built where it was. There's very interesting lore implications with the forge, especially with it reacting to Codlock's spirit during the funeral, which allowed the reforging of Wuthred, but the forge receives such little attention during the questline that you'd have no idea of its importance. While the Eye of Magnus just got reduced to being nothing more than a glowing MacGuffin, Skyforge didn't even manage to achieve that. So we make it to Yskimor's tomb, and yeah, just, just another Nordic ruin to close this questline out. It's... 
it's not even a good Nordic Ruin either. It's just filled with ghosts that are literally Draugr minus any of the shit that makes the Draugr the least bit interesting. Vilkus won't even set foot in the tomb, claiming he's not worthy to enter after, I don't know, letting his anger drive him towards helping us destroy the Silver Hands or some shit. Like, buddy, wasn't this mission your idea? I guess this is meant to say he wasn't true to the vague Nordic Code of Honor during this last quest. Like, I... I would think avenging a falling comrade and ridding the world of a group of thugs would be one of the most virtuous things a Nord warrior could pursue, but I guess not. It's kind of sad how we've made it all the way to being named Harbinger of the Companions, and we still don't actually know what this ancient Nordic code of honor we are supposed to be abiding by is. Hey, remember when guilds handed new members a book to get themselves orientated with? Farkas dips out a couple of chambers later because he's, uh, he's developed arachnophobia after Dustman's Cairn. No, seriously. So Gutha reaches the resting place of the legend himself with the only other true warrior in this faction. And after proving themselves to the spirits of the companion resting in the place, Gutha and Ayala are able to free Kodlak by tossing a witch head in the fire and slaying Kodlak's wolf spirit. Yeah, the boss of this questline is just a giant wolf ghost. This questline made me forget that boss fights are supposed to be a thing in this game because we just haven't seen any. I guess that's hard to pull off when half the content is radiantly generated, but you would think the warrior faction would be where we'd see some great boss fights, right? Oh, oh, how can I forget Krev the Skinner during, <laughs> during the Silver Hand raid when Skier gets killed? You'd be forgiven if you thought Krev was just another bandit chief because there's absolutely nothing remarkable at that boss encounter. So it's even funnier about Krev, um, in keeping with the radiant nature of this whole guild, that boss's race and gender are randomly selected each time the player starts the quest. Nothing else to that, but I, I just get a kick out of the designers trying to push even more radiant content in this guild. Krev will actually respawn with some generic bandits after this quest too, but the unofficial patch fixes that oversight by just putting a generic bandit chief to take their place. Once again, you'd be forgiven in thinking he was just a generic bandit chief. But anyway, yeah, that's it. Kodlak thanks us from beyond the grave and says something about hopefully rescuing the other trapped companion spirits by raiding the hunting grounds with a party of spirits from Sovereign Garden. Th that sounds pretty cool, but you know, we'll never see that. He names us leader of the companions, Aelo approves, and we get Ruthred and the Shield of Yskimor out of this place. Despite their legendary pedigree and being the only unique items in this quest line, both the axe and the shield are pretty much garbage. The axe is almost a joke. Base damage of 25, same as glass, and a bonus 1.2 times damage against elven races. In vanilla Skyrim, the axe can't be tempered, but the unofficial patch makes it so it can be upgraded with an ebony ingot. That paltry damage increase to elves is not an enchantment though, it's just a hidden perk that's added when the player equips the axe. So you can still use elemental fury with the axe if you want. Unsurprisingly, the axe has a whole bunch of bugs listed on the UESP thanks to this perk, but I'm unconvinced half of them, like the axe not working on orcs, was not intentional. The unofficial patch fixes these things anyways. The shield has a base armor rating of 30 with resist magic and fortify health 20 points each. Like the axe, the shield can't be upgraded in vanilla Skyrim, but the unofficial patch does its thing. All right, it's not awful, but the Lord Stone grossly overshadows it by giving a constant passive resist magic 20 points and 50 points of health. Spellbreaker is an all-around better shield in terms of base damage and magic resistance, and of course a custom enchanted shield can completely dunk on Yskimor's shield too. As Harbinger, we get a bit of post-story content. For starters, we can recruit any member of the Companions as a follower. This can be handy because so many of them are warrior skill trainers, and with how the follower inventory system works, you can recruit someone, pay them to train you, and then go into their inventory and take your money back. The unofficial patch removes this, though, because the authors hate fun and conflate exploits for bugs. But how are the Companions as followers? Eh. Most of them sport the same primary skills, one-handed, heavy armor, archery, and block. Vilkus drops one-handed for two-handed, but he's the same otherwise. Ayala is the only rogue of the group, meaning archery, light armor, and sneak, which, I, I don't know, I never found archer followers to be that great. They don't seem to shoot nearly enough, taking way too long to line up their shots, and their base damage will not make up for the difference. There was an opportunity to make Ayala the only werewolf follower in the game, but I guess Bethesda couldn't figure out how to make a werewolf follower not trigger passive NPCs. Still, she and the other members of the circle are capped at level 50, as opposed to their lower members who are capped at 25. 
Farkas got butchered though. Smithing and speech are his two major skills, which are useless in of themselves, followed by minor skills in one-handed and pickpocket. Yeah, the dude who trains us to use heavy armor up to level 90, turns out he's not even familiar with the skill. And apparently, despite everyone making fun of him for lacking in intelligence, he's actually the most charismatic of the bunch. He's also equipped with a two-handed greatsword despite his one-handed skill. This is because Farkas was set to the blacksmithing class as opposed to the two-handed warrior class. Oh man, too bad the unofficial patch was too busy removing exploits to catch that one. I don't know, maybe Sarian could have gotten some mileage with this lot, but Gutha needs a good mage watching her back. This is another reason I think some players overlook the followers in Skyrim. Doing the rational thing of joining a guild that aligns with their character's preferred skills gives access to followers whose skills overlap their own. This leads to followers feeling useless and redundant. Why do I need someone who fills the same party role I do, but more poorly? I get why the followers in the magic faction are mages and why the followers in the warrior faction are warriors, but maybe we'd benefit from being able to recruit these followers even if we aren't in the faction. Sure, the followers we got from the Mages Guild and the Dark Brotherhood in Oblivion were throwaway unnamed NPCs, but I can't help but feel that was a better system for handling followers from factions. Like, it doesn't really make any sense that Vilkas and Aella can just abandon their duties now at Yorvisker to help us go kill some Draugr for two more quest lines. Maybe make it so that each faction has faction-appropriate generic followers we can hire. The more experienced the follower, the higher their fee, and this is a service we can access without becoming members of the guild. This way I can go to the companions as a mage and hire myself a big beefy bodyguard, as opposed to being restricted to someone like Boehner because the best warrior followers were given as a reward for completing the warrior faction. The last bit of extra content are the quests we can get from Ayala, Farkas, and Vilkas. We already talked about Ayala's stuff. Go to a radiant location, retrieve the totem, and return it to the Underforge. Not much more to it. In the case of the twins, we get two identical quests killing a dragon and curing their lycanthropy. The dragon quest is easy. Each wolf boy wants to kill a dragon, so just go to the randomly selected dragon peak and kill the dragon with one of them in your party. The cure quest is arguably even less exciting. These just involve bringing each of the boys back to Yskrimor's empty tomb and tossing a witch head into a brazier and fighting the wolf spirit that pops out. You did collect and hold on to all four witch heads, I trust? The last witch head we can use to cure ourselves, which results in the exact same thing. Ghost wolf fight, and then we're cured. I feel like Kirsten was asleep at the wheel here, losing pretty much his entire grip on the companions like this. I have one last rewrite for this story that I'd like to propose. Maybe instead of going to the tomb with the express intent of curing Codlike from beyond the grave, instead we set out to cure Vilkas and Farkas, and maybe ourselves if we think it's a curse. We get to the tomb and Hirsin contacts us. If we destroy the heads, he will release Codlike's soul, but obviously he will continue to hold dominion over the rest of the companions. Or we cure ourselves, pretty much guaranteeing the circle is free of his influence, but Kodlek will be stuck in the hunting grounds for eternity. This acts as a much better referendum on whether we think it's a blessing or a curse than just casually curing the twins and ourselves by just going to the tomb three times over. Gutha cured the boys, but she was with Ayala on this one. She'd been munching on too many bodies now to stop, and beast mode was the only thing that was able to satisfy her bloodlust now. As for her soul, she was by birth tied to Malakath, so Hirsten could work that one out with her patron Daedra daddy himself. One way or another, she was bound for some realm of oblivion, she didn't really care which. But with business at the Mead Hall finally settled, she figured it was time the Gutha and Mercurio Adventure Company head out for some new work. Gutha found herself in an awkward position. While her role as Harbinger was technically meant to keep her neutral in political conflicts, the civil war of Skyrim was just getting a bit too hot for her to ignore. Following the exodus of Alduin and the Dragonborn, the two forces were back to fighting their deadlocked conflict. Sure, Riften was now in Imperial hands and Markarth was in Ulfric's pocket thanks to the agreement at the Greybeard Peace Council, but little had changed and the attrition of Skyrim had resumed. She felt uniquely positioned to do something about it, and her heart had been burning for the Stormcloaks ever since the conflict started. Or rather, she sympathized with their wishes to be a free, independent nation once again. Being a stronghold orc, she understood what it meant to be free, and to have the pride and security that came with being self-sufficient. She had no use for someone telling her how to live her life, which was one of the reasons she left the stronghold and its overbearing chieftain. The way she saw it, she had even less of a use for a southern empire barely capable of maintaining itself, telling her how to live her life. She didn't give two shits about Talos this or Thalmor that, the Stormcloaks just had the better message. Some might ask why an orc would want to help Nords fight for an independent Skyrim, and indeed, that was the first question Galmar Stonefist asked her when she approached him asking to join. But Skyrim wasn't just home to the Nords, it was home to many people. 
and the way she saw it, Talius and his legions were invading her home. If this was her home, then she was duty bound to defend it. Alright, so here's the thing. If you're not playing with an alternate start mod or just ignoring the Cartwright introduction like I am here, this is a harder thing to justify as a non-Nord. We get the very valid option of just saying we hate the Empire, but fighting for Skyrim because it's our home? I don't think so. This is the problem with being told too much about our crossing from Cyrodiil into Skyrim. Yes, we're back for round two with this introduction. Take Sarian, for instance. A high elf from Cyrodiil crossing the border for some unknown reason. If he escaped with Rayloff and took his advice to immediately join the Stormcloaks, can he really make the claim Skyrim is his home after having only been there for a few days? The Empire Hater option works in this case because they did just try executing him and he's an Altmer to boot. But saying Skyrim is his home? That's a bit presumptuous. I'm not saying none of this works, but it requires some legwork and this is mostly due to the introduction dropping the ball from a role-playing perspective. But where it excels is in setting up the Civil War. And this is one of the most tragic parts of Skyrim's development. Bethesda had already done a lot of the heavy lifting to make the Civil War one of the best things that ever put in one of their games. In my previous video, I concluded the main story section by saying I thought Bethesda focused on the wrong conflict for this game. It's clear they had big plans for the Civil War, and like almost everything else we've covered so far, they seem to have just run out of time before they could fully realize that vision. In a recent interview to mark the release of Anniversary Edition, Todd Howard stated that the Civil War was something a few developers envisioned as a background conflict that never would quite conclude. Where the main quest with Alduin had a definitive conclusion, the Civil War was always meant to be something burning in the background, presumably even after one side had won. It's ironic, then, that the inverse came to pass. The dragon conflict doesn't end because we still have random dragon attacks, while the Civil War comes to an abrupt and unsatisfying end. But going back to my bold claim that this should have been the Civil War game and not the Dragon game, after doing a lot more exploring of the Civil War, I'm more convinced than ever this was probably the worst blunder Bethesda made with Skyrim after the removal of classes and spellcrafting. Despite being pitched to Todd as a background conflict, and therefore always being on the chopping block for cuts, his words, not mine, the Civil War gets a lot of lip service from NPCs in the game world, much more so than the Dragon conflict, oddly enough. This is why I find Todd's claims here a bit suspect. I'm much more likely to believe he's downplaying what the original plans were because how unpopular the Civil War ended up because it was so incomplete. What sounds better? We had these big plans, but we wanted to stick to the release date. Or, it was just some side project for a couple of devs, never really a big part of our grand vision for this game. If it was never meant to be a major attraction for the player, why is it featured so heavily throughout the game? Why is it the opening act? Where Oblivion lacked any sort of internal conflict, even though the Emperor gets assassinated 40 minutes in, Skyrim is, in comparison, saturated in political conflict. Where it's not present, the writers construct reasons for why that is. The Greybeards are historically impartial, the Mage's College is much more insular following the Great Collapse and all the anti-magic sentiment from the Oblivion Crisis, the Companions have internal policies mandating neutrality because of past political conflicts leading to crises within the Guild, you get the picture. Sure, these are mostly veiled justifications the designers are using to keep their parts of the game self-contained, but at least everyone took the time to explain themselves with the Civil War. The Dragon Conflict doesn't get nearly as many tie-ins with the world, and that's likely due to the nature of that conflict and the realities of the game's development. Most NPCs and even entire factions are completely mum on the subject of dragons coming back, like the Companions. Dragon Slaying would have absolutely kept the Companions fat and fed on contracts like how Data Breaches keeps McAfee around. The likeliest reason the only stuff dragon related we get there is with Farkas and Vilkas is because recognizing the dragon threat would have to change as the main story progresses. If we escape Halgen but never do the Western Watchtower quest, dragons won't be spawning in the world. At this stage of the story, the dragons can only be rumors if the NPC even heard about the events at Halgen. Once the dragon is defeated at the Watchtower, random dragon encounters are flagged on and dragons are allowed to start terrorizing Skyrim. If an NPC quest or an entire faction is going to recognize the dragon threat, they need to, at the very least, recognize the flag being raised. The developers need to change their dialogue from rumors of dragons to dragons actively attacking. And if we look at Farkas and Vilkas's quest, oh, would you look at that? It requires dragon rising to be complete. But doing this quest after having finished the main story shows just how much more work was really going to be needed to integrate the dragon conflict with the rest of the game world. Both companions talk about the dragons like they're still just rumors, expressing how they want to see one and asking if we have seen one. By this point, the player would literally have bards singing about them in inns all across the province, so yeah, it's safe to say we've seen a couple. To make conversations like this work, dialogue needs to be written to recognize events of that conflict, and that needs to be consistent throughout the entire game. 
This is why writing headcanon that the player character in each major questline is in fact different characters is often a necessary role-playing defense mechanism. That's nearly impossible to do though when the player being Dragonborn is so inconsistently referenced throughout the game. We can look at how the player is treated in the Civil War itself. When signing up, we aren't able to tell either side that we are Dragonborn and nobody brings it up. Nobody goes, oh, the supposed embodiment of divinity wants to join our cause? Gee, that sure would be a good thing to put on a poster. It's only at the very end when we are facing down the opposing leader that being Dragonborn gets addressed. If they weren't going to address it from the very beginning, then they should never have addressed it, because then we'd have at least have been able to pretend that the character doing the Civil War is not the Dragonborn. Now we have to retroactively reconcile all the prior events leading up to this and do the writer's job for them to explain why we just weren't going around stirring up recruitment among the Nords. This is an impossible task though because the writers just ignore addressing the player's Dragonborn status when it's inconvenient for them and bring it up when it would make for a dramatic moment. So I had to go back and write this whole section in because I thought there might be a chance to get to the end of the questline without ever being named Dragonborn. I was curious how the ending conversation might differ if we never earned, yeah right, that title. Fortunately, before subjecting myself to a fourth playthrough of the questline, I was reminded that there's a hard break put in prior to the Battle of Whiterun where Balgriff will refuse to acknowledge Ulfric's challenge until the dragon at the Watchtower is killed. Talk about a weird thing the designers had to contrive just to force the canon that the Dragonborn was the one to end the Civil War. They really couldn't just record a couple of extra lines of dialogue at the end that would have swapped calling the player Dragonborn with something like, I don't know, the champion. Oh, I'm sorry, we already have titles and ranks for this questline that they could have used here. Stormblade, it's an honor. Going back to the world reacting to the progression of questlines, what's great about the Civil War conflict is that it wouldn't be nearly as much work to tie into the rest of the game world, even as it progresses. We can see it in real life, where not everyone is up to speed on current events because they just don't directly impact them. Dragons coming in and attacking your remote village is kind of hard to ignore or plead ignorance on, but that's exactly what we see time and again. Winterhold is a popular settlement for random dragon attacks to spawn in, and even after killing half a dozen of them during the mage's college questline, people in town were still convinced those damn mages were the biggest threat. Because the Civil War is more of an ambiguous conflict, it's easy for NPCs to either write it off as something that they will have no part in, or just pitch in a line to support their preferred side. In some cases, if the dialogue is written carefully enough, the NPCs' lines won't even have to change even after the Stormcloaks or Imperials win. But Bethesda was running at a time and there was no way Todd was giving up the 11-11-11 release date. Something had to go and, well, what was going to sell more copies? Dragons or Civil War? I've heard it said that the dragons were a more marketable conflict, and clearly Bethesda's marketing team agreed. That's what all the trailers exclusively focused on, after all. But I call bullshit on this. First off, Captain America Civil War. 24th highest grossing film of all time at $1.1 billion in revenue. Normies can get behind this type of conflict, so much so that it can be a subtitle and still put asses in seats. Or how about Game of Thrones? That's even contemporary with Skyrim. Star Wars? That's even got an empire in it. Let's not kid ourselves that older Tez fans wouldn't love to play a game that's all about the slow motion car crash that is the collapse of the Cyrodiilic Empire. And likewise, let's not assume new players wouldn't be intrigued by a conflict where the Empire might actually be the good guys for once. It's all about how you sell a story in marketing and what sells better than violence, corruption, greed, politics, and sex. You guys said you wanted Skyrim to be dark and gritty, well maybe take a page out of HBO's playbook then. The Civil War had all the marketable power Bethesda could have asked for, so I don't buy the cop out that it had to play second fiddle cuts and all to the Dragon War questline that most players write off as boring and generic anyhow. You know what part made me actually feel something while playing Skyrim? Evicting Jarl Balin from his palace during the battle for Whiterun. What's the emotionally resonant part of the main story? Killing Party Boy on behalf of the Blades? Yeah, let me tell you, people were really divided on having to kill their favorite character because their most hated character justified it with Because I said so. At least Bro Balgra found himself on the wrong side of my ideals as a Stormcloak player, and as a result, the story made me feel what everyone in Skyrim is feeling at this point with the war dividing families, friends, and communities. People love to meme on the cart ride, but honestly, from a storytelling perspective, this is a pretty solid setup. Sure, it limits roleplay options, and it can get very long in the tooth during repeat playthroughs, especially with a mandatory tutorial dungeon right after, but this sequence does set up the Imperial vs. Stormcloak conflict exceptionally well. It doesn't start with a pre-rendered narrated cutscene dumping all the necessary information on the player. It lets characters in the scene diegetically handle the exposition and trust the player will be able to intuit what's going on. Not only does this help keep the player grounded in events, it's also just more efficient. We are getting character building, world building, and plot progression happening simultaneously, and it's actually pretty entertaining. This softer approach has resulted in a lot of misconceptions about this conflict, though. 
players who are not versed in recent Tez lore and or play the previous games are going to be at a disadvantage here. Granted, there are plenty of lore books and off-the-beaten-path conversations we can come across that will give players the necessary context, but most players seem to only use those nifty bookshelves in their house for display purposes only. As a result, we need to cover some basic groundwork here first before we get any deeper, so I'll keep this history lesson brief. Following the death of Uriel and Martin Septim in Oblivion, along with the destruction of their badge of office, the line of legitimate emperors had been severed. What followed was a secession crisis that ended with a distant cousin getting installed on the throne. This badly weakened the Empire. At the same time, a group known as the Thalmor in the High Elf homeland of the Somerset Isles was gaining traction. They were advocates for a new High Elf-led Empire to take the place of the Dying Man-Made Empire, and this led to the establishment of the Aldmeri Dominion, which began picking off pieces of the Empire notably the Wood Elf homeland of Valenwood and the Khajiit homeland of elsewhere. Throw in secession crises in Morrowind and Blackmarsh that led to them becoming independent from the Empire, and suddenly the post-Septim Empire was a lot slimmer, now only comprising of Cyrodiil, Skyrim, High Rock, and Hammerfell. And then the Altmer Nation attacked. This led to the Great War, a massive continent-spanning war that the Cyrodiilic Empire just barely won, but at the loss of Hammerfell and the signing of the White Gold Concordant that saddled the Empire with a bunch of concessions, notably the outright banning of Talos worship in the Empire. If you don't know who Talos slash Tiberseptim is, go look up a lore video. He's a very interesting and divisive figure. It's really no surprise the Thalmor take offense to him being worshipped as a literal god, even if evidence of his divinity is demonstrated throughout the games. The war strained the Empire near its breaking point, and this drained Skyrim of men, money, and resources, leading to the Markarth Incident. In short, the city of Markarth had been taken over by the Reachmen during the Great War, and for two years they held and ruled the Reach as an independent kingdom. The Empire was getting ready to formally recognize it as a province, but Skyrim wanted it back, so the deposed Jarl of Markarth enlisted Ulfric Stormcloak to go take the city back. In exchange, the city would allow the worship of Talos. This wasn't something he was free to offer, though, and the Thalmor learned about this and ordered Ulfric's arrest after he retook the city. With no other options, the Jarl and the Emperor capitulated, leading to Ulfric's arrest and imprisonment. No in-game sources tells us how long Ulfric spent in jail, but the Blades mobile game confirms Ulfric is still in prison four years after the incident, and he wouldn't be released until after his father's death when Ulfric was made Jarl of Eastmarch and Windhelm. Kind of an important detail left unexplained, but this won't be the last time we see Bethesda being unnecessarily opaque about this story. After prison, he formed the Stormcloaks as his personal army to further his agenda of a free, independent Skyrim and the re-establishment of Talos worship there. Over 20 years passed, then the High King of Skyrim died, letting his young and inexperienced son, Torig, ascend to the throne after a ceremonial meeting of the Jarls of Skyrim. Ulfric used the mood to petition for an independent Skyrim once again, and a while later he entered solitude under the guise of discussing the subject some more. Ulfric instead ended up challenging Torig to an honorable duel and used his extensive combat experience and mastery of the Thune to defeat the king. He fled the city, got branded a murderer by those loyal to the Empire, and called the legitimate High King by those in support of an independent Skyrim. Thus began the start of the Skyrim Civil War. A few months later, Ulfric was captured by the newly arrived military governor, General Tullius, and was set to be executed. But we know what happens with that, and now we are all caught up, roughly speaking, on the events leading up to where the player enters the stage. There's a lot to this setup, and Bethesda did a good job at keeping the sides relatively balanced in their pros and cons. Surprisingly, that attention to maintaining a balance between the two sides is carefully maintained, perhaps to a fault in certain situations, but we'll get to talking about the actual quest a little while later. For now, I simply want to focus on untangling this web of overlapping details that has left players divided for over a decade so we can see the potential Bethesda criminally left squandered in chasing their chosen one power fantasy dragon story. To start things off with then, let's look at what the Stormcloaks are about, because Ulfric's really the one setting the table for the debate. A lot of the Empire's arguments are in response to Ulfric, so the Stormcloak position is the best starting point. But any discussion of the Stormcloaks comes with some baggage. Let's start with something simple. What is the official line for the Stormcloaks? In Skyrim, we can come across a Stormcloak recruitment essay titled, Nords Arise. I find it funny that the Stormcloaks would even bother with written recruitment material because, uh, oh, right, this is the, uh, <clears throat> the Nord friendly character. In the pamphlet, the anonymous author states that the current emperor is a false one who dared to tell the Nords that they are not free to worship Talos as a god. King Torg betrayed Skyrim by agreeing to uphold the White Gold Concordant. The Thalmor cannot be trusted as they attack the Empire unprovoked the same way the elves attacked Yskimor and sacked Sarthal. Ulfric is a true hero of Skyrim, worthy of admission to Sovngarde and playing the same role as Yskimor. 
blessed by Talos with a thum, Ulfric freed Skyrim when he defeated Torg in a trial of arms. Now the Empire sends its legions to subjugate the North and set Skyrim citizens against one another. People should stand together, reject the Empire, and support Ulfric and the Stormcloaks. Alright, how about something a little closer to the source? Galmar has a few choice words when probed. Reasons. Since when does a man need a reason to protect his family, to defend his homeland? It's the damn Outlanders and Empire that need the reasons. Not this Empire. The world's better without it. Certainly Skyrim is. I fought in the Imperial Army in the war against the Dominion. I bled and spilled blood for the Empire. And for what? The Empire to bend its knee before those evil elf bastards? Signing a treaty meant to kill the heart of the Empire itself? To deny Talos! Once again, his beef is squarely with the Empire and its ban on Talos worship. Alright, Ulfric, what do you got for us? I fight for the men I've held in my arms, dying on foreign soil. I fight for their wives and children whose names I heard whispered in their last breath. I fight for we few who did come home, only to find our country full of strangers wearing familiar faces. I fight for my people. <laughs> impoverished to pay the debts of an empire too weak to rule them, yet brands them criminals for wanting to rule themselves! I fight so that all the fighting I've already done hasn't been for nothing. We're fighting because we're done bleeding for an empire that won't bleed for us. Untold numbers of Nords die defending the empire against the Dominion. And for what? Skyrim being sold to the Thalmor so the Emperor could keep his throne. We're fighting because our own Jarls, once strong, wise men, have become fearful and blind to the people suffering. Pretty much the same lines from the recruitment essay. Okay, so the xenophobic line the Stormcloaks get saddled with is clearly absent from their primary propaganda. You could make the argument that it's the subtext of what's being said. If you read between the lines, that's the obvious subtext here. What else could Skyrim belongs to the Nords possibly mean? Well, looking at what Ulfric is saying, Skyrim for the Nords really just means Nords ought to be self-governing their own province again. According to him, the High King has been a puppet for the Empire for a long time now, and we don't really see anything contradicting that claim in-game. In Skyrim, the position of High King is not hereditary. A meeting of the Jarls is meant to elect one among themselves to ascend to the ultimate executive position of the province. It's just that the mechanism has grown to become a rubber stamp for those the Emperor wishes to take the position, which the Jarls agreed to because they were happy taking Imperial Gold in exchange. This is why Elisif isn't High Queen yet. Ulfric and the Jarls who sided with him refused to meet to confirm her ascension. We'll talk about her and the corruption of the Jarls a little bit later. There's also some truth to Ulfric's claims of Torg being weak and distracted from his duties as High King. In Sovngarde, we can actually meet Torg, and there he will tell us that his only regret from accepting the duel with Ulfric was that in death he's left his wife behind. This is in stark contrast to what Ulfric has to say if he's sent there, expressing sorrow for all the souls of Nord soldiers, Stormcloak and Imperial alike, now being devoured by Alduin. Who here sounds more concerned with the well-being of their subjects. Ulfric claims that any Nord can learn the voice if they are dedicated and ambitious enough, and that's what he proved when he defeated Torg. Their High King was not strong enough to even defend himself, so how can he defend Skyrim? This notion of the changing Nord is seen throughout the game. Few Nords remember the Greybeards or express interest in learning the way of the voice. All of the ancient burial places of their ancestors and the great cities of the past have fallen into disrepair and have become infested with bandits, critters, and undead. A whole city that was once the great capital of Skyrim fell into the ocean and nobody even seems to give a shit anymore. If you ask Galmar if the Stormcloaks only take Nords, he outright dismisses that notion. He says he's just looking for people who will be true to Skyrim and the Stormcloaks and aren't looking to just fight for their own benefit and glory. He is simply asking if we are committed the same way he and the rest of their people are committed. That's a reasonable thing to be concerned with as a grassroots movement that survival is based solely on the conviction of its members. Here's the thing. It's not in the writer's best interest to make a whole faction that would only appeal to one race in this game one of the less popular races in previous Tez games to boot. This is why I'm not inclined to definitively conclude Ulfric's agenda is simply a ploy to send all non-Nord citizens packing. But we also can't definitively say that isn't a potential goal of his either, and I think this is the nuance players who blanket label Ulfric and the Stormcloaks as racist are missing. Well that and just a general lack of knowledge of Tez lore. But an appeal to authority is no fun, so let's address some of the big ticket items. Any discussion here is not complete without bringing up all the stuff going down in Windhelm. Hey, maybe the reason these Grayskins don't hump in the war 
is because they're Imperial spies. I suspect these guys have been the worst thing for Stormcloak PR because bullying a Dunmer woman is far more shocking for a modern audience than a Nord man getting booed by an angry crowd and then getting beheaded. Funny thing is, Uncle Rogvir is telling the truth here. Ulfric's challenge was completely legal and everyone in the court witnessed Torg accept. Reports would go on to suggest he literally shouted Torg to pieces in some grisly manner, but Ulfric downplays that when asked and he just says he knocked the king down with his thumb and then stabbed him in the heart to end the fight. This is corroborated by our own experiences as Dragonborn. Even at max strength, we can't shout people to pieces, so it's unlikely Ulfric can. It sounds better for the propaganda on both sides though, demonstrating that we really should be looking a lot harder at this conflict than what's presented at face value. So here's a question I never see anyone asking. Was Rogvir even guilty of a crime here? If Ulfric's challenge was legal and consented to, and Rogvir's job was simply to open and close the gate for people coming and going, did he do anything illegal? I don't think so. Was it ill-advised? Sure, he probably should have waited to get clearance from his superiors, but according to his sister, he didn't even know what had happened. I mean, why would he? The Blue Palace is on the complete opposite end of the city. And if nobody came by screaming the king had just been assassinated and no guards stopped Ulfric in the streets, why is Rogvir taking the fall? It's almost like the leaders here needed a scapegoat to sell the narrative that Ulfric's challenge was illegal. What better way to sell that than to condemn someone for aiding in that crime? The Empire sure is quick to send people to the Executioner's Block. It's almost like the Stormcloaks' calls for justice are actually justified. But back to the drama at the Windhelm Gates. For starters, Neither of these dudes are Stormcloaks. One is a beggar and the other is a drunk. But you know what? Let's listen to what they are saying. Outside of the slurs, threats, and unsubstantiated suspicions, they're saying they're pissed with the Dark Elves because they refuse to help the Stormcloaks. Sympathizers for Severus will find her excuse that the Dark Elves won't join in because it's not their fight valid. And sure, there's logic in that, but that's not exactly the right attitude to have towards the people that have been hosting you and your kin for decades. Oh wait, I'm sorry, two centuries now? Think of it this way. Imagine someone's house burned down and a total stranger took them into their own home. Now say someone showed up to that house one day and attacked the homeowner and the person whose house burned down just sat there watching this happen and refused to help because it wasn't their fight. If you think the homeowner has no right to be angry at their guest, well, let's just say don't come asking to crash on my couch. According to the Stormcloaks, this is what their beef is with the people in Skyrim who won't help their cause. The way they see it, the Imperials are literally invading their home. And in this case, the Dark Elves refusing to help is telling them that they don't consider Skyrim to be their home. So why should they continue to offer them shelter in their city? If the Dark Elves are not willing to help the Nords of Windhelm in their time of need, when the Nords help the Dark Elves in their time of need, yeah, I kind of get why they're pissed. People are very quick to bring up the racist Nords in Windhelm, but they always fail to mention the racist Dark Elves. If you head into the new Nisus Corner Club, you'll very quickly run into Embarrass, who can definitely give Rolf and Angrenor a run for their money. And he's not the only one with some things to say about the Nords. Even sweet, innocent Savaris has some opinions about the Argonian dock workers that's very on brand for the Dunmer. Alright, I'm gonna break this down for some of you in the audience who might not be aware. The Dunmer are not known for being very nice. You probably won't know that if your only exposure to them has been in Oblivion and Skyrim, where almost all their culture and history has been pressed out of them, but here's the cliff notes from Arwind. They were much more blatantly xenophobic than the worst Nords we see in Skyrim, uh, dismissive of the Nine Divines and frankly the Empire in general, worshipped their own leaders who abused tools of the gods to turn themselves into gods, or just outright worship Daedra like Mafala and Boethia, they outright abandoned the Empire before the Great War even occurred, and arguably the Red Year was a punishment from the gods for the Dark Elves just being so damn awful. Oh yeah, and they also enslaved the Argonians and the Khajiit. That's why the Argonians invaded Marwind and started killing all the slave masters. It's rather telling just how much the people of Windhelm have had it with the Dunmer when you have three high elves running shops in the fancier part of town. You would think they would have been chased out of the city at this point considering the Great War with the High Elves was only about 30 years ago, but no, they're still here and they're pretty well accepted at this point. If it had just been one High Elf, I would have been able to consider this an oversight, but not three. I imagine most players asserting the xenophobia line just took one look at the exchange at the gates and Severus' word and figured they had everything they needed to make up their minds on this matter. Oh, also, embarrassed has a set of Imperial armor in his bedroom, kind of substantiating those claims that the Dark Elves might actually be spies. My personal take on Embarrass is that he's working for the Imperials to stir up the Dark Elves to hopefully trigger a revolt in the city. Too bad he lacks the charisma and tact to succeed there. The armor could also just be a red herring or an oversight. Who knows, that's the fun with these debates. Ulfric has been in charge of Windhelm for 20 years. Plenty of time to eject those elves he absolutely hates and mistrusts. 
It's not like it would even be difficult for him to do so. Make the claim that anyone who isn't aligned with the Stormcloaks are too much of a threat now in the city thanks to the war and just kick him out. But he didn't. And don't tell me the writers kept the Dark Elves here because they wanted us to see the Nords being racist because it would have been even easier to just leave the Great Quarters completely empty and have all the Nords celebrating that Ulfric finally got rid of all those Dark Elves to sell that narrative. They didn't though because that would give us a smoking gun that this is a faction where non-Nords are not welcome, which is not conducive towards telling the story that they are trying to tell here. The only line that I found that even hints at Ulfric wanting to get rid of the elves in the city is a conversation between him and Captain Lonely Gale. In it, Ulfric asks about the mood among the Dark Elves, and Lonely Gale tells him that they're restless but not showing any signs of any rebellious activity. To which, Ulfric replies, Well, that's good. Let's finish this first war before starting the second one, eh? This is up to interpretation what he meant, but it could be read as him planning on getting rid of all the elves after the war is won. Or it could just be him talking about the inevitable war with the Thalmor after the Empire is out of the picture. I'm inclined to believe the latter, though, because, like I mentioned, he could get rid of them at any time. They're not contributing to the war effort, and their presence in the city is just a liability at this point. Even still, in vanilla Skyrim, players will never hear this line because Lonely Gale never enters the palace. The unofficial patch, of course, questionably reassigns this dialogue to Ulfric Steward, but I'm unconvinced this dialogue was not meant to be cut, which was effectively achieved when Lonely Gale's character was changed from being Captain of the Guard and having his AI package altered to prevent him from entering the palace. There's another example of this with one of the Argonian dock workers having unique lines when he'd enter the new niece's corner club and he'd get into a tiff with the owner there. This dialogue had embarrassed claiming that Nords want all non-Nords kicked out of the city and scouts many marshes doubting him because Nords don't want to unload their own ships. Another conversation would have embarrassed telling scouts many marshes that he's being underpaid for his labor. Both of these never fire, though, because, once again, Scouts never enters the club. Weird how the unofficial patch didn't reassign this dialogue. These conversations look like the writer tipping their hand a bit too much, and there's a chance the designers reworked the schedules to keep them from firing, as opposed to simply cutting the dialogue from the game files. This is why I'm skeptical about bringing up cut dialogue. But with one of these conversations being restored, it only seems fair that I bring up the unrestored dialogue that would counter it. The takeaway from Windhelm is not that all Nords are racist and that Ulfric wants to eject the elves from the city. The take takeaway is that the place is a powder keg of racial tension, and with that perspective, it's understandable why Ulfric might not want to wade into all those conflicts. This is probably why he ordered the Argonians to stay outside the city walls. The last thing he needs is a new conflict between the Dark Elves and the people they once enslaved. Brunwell Freewinter has some lines that really paint Ulfric in a poor light, though. According to him, Ulfric is absolutely a racist and that the Stormcloak agenda is just an excuse to ostracize those who aren't Nords. I mean, I could just say he's an unreliable source considering he takes over the city if the Imperials win, but hey, let's give him the benefit of the doubt here. He says, Whenever a group of marauders attack a Nord village, Ulfric is the first to sound the horn and send the men. But a group of Dark Elf refugees gets ambushed, a group of Argonians or a Khajiit caravan. No troops. No investigation. Nothing. There's a group of cutthroats out there right now that Ulfric doesn't lift a finger to bring to justice. As long as they don't threaten Nord land. Hey, I don't know if you noticed, Brunwolf, but there's a war going on, maybe even some dragons on the loose. Why would Ulfric waste resources sending men to investigate syndicates that are not directly threatening his people and his holdings? None of these groups are receiving aid because they aren't his subjects. It's not like he's flush with resources here to offer protection to every itinerant group passing through his lands. But you know who's not even protecting their own citizens? Like... We literally get told by Falk Firebeard that he's going to ignore the pleas of a petitioner because ah, he's always just a little bit jumpy. How about Carthwaste and having their minds shut down by a group of hired thugs? Where's the Empire or Elisif or the Jarl of Markarth on that one? Or the Forsworn and Bandits just slaughtering caravans and traders on the roads in the Reach? Yeah, Ulfric's turf's got a few thugs here and there, but the Bandits are so bad on the road from Whiterun to Solitude that they literally have organized checkpoints and ambushes. I can run defense for the Stormcloaks some more, but we really got to get talking about the Imperials at some point this year, so I'm going to cut it here. Now it's time for the Imperials, and, well, I'm utterly convinced at this point they're not meant to survive after this game. The further I dug into their side of the story, the deeper their holes seem to be getting. I used to fully believe in the claims of General Tullius that many others espouse. The Civil War in Skyrim is a disastrous waste of men, materials, and time that all needs to be going towards preparing for the next big war with the Dominion. The problem with this line of thinking is the assumption that the Empire would even stand a chance against the Dominion when the Great War Part II kicked off. The more I investigate and think about it, the slimmer the Empire's chances seems to become, and at this point, I just outright doubt their victory is even possible. 
This doesn't mean I automatically think the Stormcloaks have a future either, because looking at the geopolitical realities of an independent Skyrim, I just don't think long-term survivability is feasible. I also don't think Ulfric is the right leader for the job, and I'll explain, but we really gotta talk about the Thalmor. What brings you to this... <laughs> to Skyrim? They, uh... It's a necessary part of my job to mix with the upper classes of Skyrim, such as they are. Well... You have the honor of addressing a member of the Thalmor. Bask in your as if this craggy wretch of a city could give birth to a superiorly bred myrrh such as myself. No, I'm not from Markarth. I mean... Let's begin again. No, for pity's you know sake. The rules. I've already told you everything. No! Start at the beginning, as usual. If you persist no, in this wait. stubbornness, I was I'll have... catching my breath. Why wouldn't I tell you again? I, I don't even know anything. They are the embodiment of people getting drunk off of small degrees of power, like HOA board members or subreddit mods. If you're expecting me to swoop in with some sort of valid defense for this group, uh, yeah, don't. Bethesda's depiction of them in this game never elevates them out of the disgustingly irredeemable. I'm convinced they wanted players to hate them without question, and they sure succeeded, but I'm still genuinely baffled how poorly and one-dimensional they are presented as, because it really does weaken the story a lot here. Just about every Imperial sympathizer immediately has to go on the defense by qualifying how they hate the Thalmor, and that siding with the Empire doesn't mean siding with the Thalmor. I don't know, maybe I'd buy that line if Elenwyn didn't show up with the Imperials during the Peace Council and the party at the Embassy wasn't packed with Imperial elites. Alright, so I'm confused why Elenwyn is even at the Peace Council. She says she's there to ensure nothing agreed upon will violate the Concordant, but we can just kick her out and she still says the Thalmor will recognize any agreement even without her being present. So if her presence was optional, why is she part of the Imperial Envoy? Why would Tullius invite or even tolerate her being there? I mean, I get defending her when Ulfric wants her to leave, it's bad optics to be giving into demands before everyone has even been seated, but it's also bad optics to be telling people the Empire isn't aligned with the Thalmor and then defending their superfluous presence here. He should have seen this lose-lose situation coming and just left her back west. The player can interject with some unsubstantiated claim that Tullius doesn't even want her there, but once again, why is she there then? The animosity between the Imperials and Thalmor would be an easier sale if there was a bigger distinction placed on the Thalmor and the Aldmeri Dominion. Like, maybe the Dominion would be the actual government and the Thalmor were just the secret police of that government. Maybe the Thalmor are a tolerated evil because their strength helped the Dominion do so well during the Great War. Maybe the government of the Dominion is a lot more stable than the Mead Empire, but obviously not nearly as equitable. Unfortunately, the Imperials can't use any of those copes. The Thalmor is the government. Though there is a distinction between the Justiciers, Agents, and Emissaries, they all seem to be towing the same line of bullshit that has them exhibiting a xenophobia that makes the stuff going down in Windhelm seem like schoolyard hijinks. I'm not going to bother doing a deconstruction of each Thalmor character we meet because they are all practically interchangeable. They all seem incapable of understanding that they are doing nothing to win people to their cause, or more likely they just don't care. Ellen Wynn's approach is to throw opulence and greed out the open and just loudly announce to everyone that they will tolerate corruption and self-interest if they just side with the Thalmor. Oh yeah, this is definitely a way to win reliable and trustworthy allies in a country you were just at war with. This also shows that Ulfric is right, once again, with that Skyrim's elite are addicted to coin if they're willing to do business with someone like Elenwyn. I came up with another crackpipe theory that Elenwyn actually seduced Ulfric when he was in captivity during the Great War. My completely unfounded theory is that she posed as some sort of regretful Thalmor or something, and she used that as a ploy to get him to confide secrets in her about the Imperial War effort, and that's what they used to convince him that he accidentally oofed the Imperial City because of his loose lips. I mean, he was young at the time, and before the war he was stuck in High Rothgar for 10 years, so hey, it's possible. It would also explain why he is so personally offended by Elenwyn's presence at the Peace Council, and would also help explain this line. She's supposed to be on our side? You know exactly. No. Not this time. In reality, that line is probably just a reference to the theory that Ulfric wasn't promised Talos worship by just the Jarl of Markarth, but it was also backed up by the Thalmor. After the city was retaken, they reneged and had the authorities arrest him to ensure maximum saltiness. We see this in the Ulfric dossier. 
Something happened during the Mark Harth incident the Thalmor got personally involved with, and it all worked out perfectly in their favor. The Thalmor are obviously playing some next level political games here. It's just a shame that that doesn't come across in the Thalmor characters we meet in game. They are all absurdly evil and in most cases incompetent too. It's really hard to believe these are the same folks who have managed to engineer a civil war between two of the oldest allies in the Cyrodiilic Empire. If anything, it seems like Skyrim is just some backwater assignment that's one step above file and clerk in the basement of Thalmor HQ. If that's the case, then it's no wonder someone like Ellen Wynn would be relegated to being ambassador to the barbarians in the north. Because we don't know what the long-term goals of the Thalmor or the Dominion are, aside from gearing up for the Second Great War, we really can't say why Bethesda would paint them in such an unflattering light. My instincts as someone in the audience is that they are setting up for an epic-style subversion of expectations, but that obviously never comes during Skyrim. Maybe it's meant to get everyone against the Dominion so when they nullify the player's choices when they win the second war off camera, because that's probably how it's going to be handled, players will be really motivated against them in Tez 6. The writers do their best to limit our knowledge to only what's immediately relevant for the Skyrim Civil War so we know next to nothing about how all these factions are gearing up for the second showdown. As a result, we really can only speculate based on historical events and judgment guesses on the character and apparent strength of the different actors. Another showdown between the Empire and the Dominion seems inevitable though, especially when you got the Thalmor actively trying to sabotage the existing peace with their many glow ops. You would think their constant fuckery would have blown up the peace between the two sides, or at the very least, made people a lot more sympathetic towards the Stormcloaks and Hammerfell calling the agreement bullshit. This seems like a very one-sided agreement, and that only helps further the impression that the Thalmor are stronger than the Empire and have been calling the shots during this period of peace. Both sides have a litany of excuses to explain why the previous war ended in a truce. The Empire was weakened from their numerous crises and was caught off guard by the Dominion's declaration of war, and the Thalmor underestimated the strength of the Empire when they expanded their war goals. I am much more inclined to believe the Thalmor's assertions here. Sure, I can believe the Empire was distracted, but it's hard to miss the fact that the Thalmor were on the warpath. If the Empire couldn't prepare for the war back then, well, how are they going to prepare for the war now that Hammerfell is independent and Skyrim is a mess? Whether Ulfric stirred up trouble or was just expressing what half of Skyrim was feeling about the Concordat is irrelevant at this point. The Civil War is on before we even set foot in Skyrim. The question now is, which side has a better chance of survival? Skyrim is a very defensible province. The weather is hostile, there's few passes through the mountains, and the north coast is hard to navigate safely for those unfamiliar with it. Ulfric could very likely wait the Thalmor out during the Second War by just parking his army inside Skyrim and rebuffing attempts to invade. If he was able to give the Imperials a run for their money with a ragtag group of volunteers, imagine what he'd be able to achieve leveraging the full might of Skyrim geared up for war. This is why the Thalmor stressed that a victory for Ulfric would be bad news. They had to tuck tail and leave Hammerfell, and Skyrim is no doubt more defensible than an open desert, but staying put in Skyrim is not the plan. Not for long, anyways. The idea is to beat the Empire, build up the armies, and then go to war with the Thalmor, which would necessitate invasion of the south, giving up the only real advantage Ulfric has. This is why I think he ultimately loses the geopolitics game, and in the long run, Skyrim independence isn't gonna win out. They're elves. Their average lifespan is measured in centuries. They can absolutely wait out Skyrim's independence and chip away at it with repeated glow ops and embargoes. Long-term survivability of an independent Skyrim would necessitate a re-establishment of the older, rugged Nord lifestyle. And I don't see Ulfric managing something like that with charisma and strong army alone. The Nords of Windhelm don't even want to unload their own ships. I don't see the imperialized Nords of Solitude going back to living like their forefathers. How long before people are looking to depose Ulfric and return to the softer days of imperial rule? We'll get more into the challenges Ulfric would face running Skyrim in a bit, but first, it's time for the Imperials to plead their case. Like with the Thalmor, Bethesda didn't seem all that interested in actually fleshing out the new Imperial powers in this game. I mean, just compare the family trees we have on the UESP for the Septim Dynasty and the Mead Dynasty. We don't even know how many Emperors have ruled since Uriel and Martin's deaths, let alone their names or any details on their reigns. We know Titus Mead I took the throne 17 years after the Oblivion Crisis, but that was 151 years before Titus Mead II was crowned. The Great War broke out three years after that, which is 30 years before the start of Skyrim. So we have a dynasty that is 181 years old, and we have the names for two of its emperors. Names that are so similar, it's convinced many players that Titus I was Titus II's father. I was planning on attempting to set up a path to success for the Imperials to make a case for why supporting them is a politically valid choice, but when I saw these two family trees, I knew they were condemned by the writers. Remember, they were two physical novels written that take place during their reign, and this is what we know about them. 
there are more lore books in Skyrim related to Uriel Septim than there are about the current ruling dynasty. And that's with the current emperor being a war hero who cinched a truce during what was originally going to be a total shutout of a war. Why invest time building up a whole dynasty that is going to get completely erased in the next game? But okay, let's pretend that isn't going to happen. I mean, it is going to be close to 20 years between Tez 5 and 6. A lot can change in that time, so might as well have a little fun here. When I called bullshit on the Empire's excuse that they were distracted with their secession crisis and didn't see Thalmor aggression being a problem, I wasn't just talking out of my ass there. They had almost two centuries to re-establish the authority of the Imperial Throne. Sure, there were many threats to it and things were in disarray following the Oblivion Crisis, but the only way that can continue to remain a problem is if there's serious incompetence and mismanagement going on in the Empire. Which begs the question, why continue to support something that can't get its act together in two centuries? Alright, small tangent I'm shoehorning in here. Did you know Titus I was a bandit before becoming Emperor? Yeah, the lore describes him as a warlord, and the only person we saw in Cyrodiil with that title was the warlord during the Dark Brotherhood quest. Those people in Fort Such were all bandits, or marauders because the game took the time to differentiate that. With only 1,000 men, the Colovian warlord Titus I took the throne from the Nibides Emperor Thul the Gibbering, who is insinuated to have been a necromancer and that's why he was unpopular. Just to give some context for how badly the Empire was on its ass at this point. In historical terms, this is definitely late, late antiquity. The supposed weakness of the Empire now could be a misdirection, though. Tullius was sent up north because they knew he could get the job done quickly and cheaply. We get conflicting reports whether he's not getting support in Skyrim because the Empire can't spare men without threatening the security of Cyrodiil, or if it's just because they physically can't get the legions up there. Pale Pass is one of the only reliable direct links between Cyrodiil and Skyrim, and during the course of the game, the pass is shut down due to avalanches. It's good enough to send some supplies up north, but not enough for a proper army to get through. If the writers took the time to explain this, it implies the Empire still has resources to wage war. Not only that, at Fort Newgrad, we can find a note that will change whether the Imperials or the Stormcloaks control the fort. The Imperial note states exactly what I just said, painting a grim picture for Tullius' supply lines. If the Stormcloaks have the fort, though, it details an invading force of Imperials amassing to the south. Once the pass is clear, it seems the Imperials intend to march the growing legion up north to take care of Ulfric. Either way, it's implied the Empire is still quite fierce. Let's not forget, Tullius did manage to capture Ulfric after only a few weeks up north. Tullius is likely one of their best generals, but it's probably safe to assume the Empire has quite a few of them floating around. And they probably haven't been idle prepping for the coming war if Tullius is this eager to end the Civil War quickly. As well, Cyrodiil is still seemingly quite wealthy, despite losing so many sources of tax revenue over the years. Hyrock is also quite wealthy, and would be another difficult-to-conquer province, and is probably the second-best source of mages on the continent that can help supply the Empire with plenty of battle mages to counter the Thalmor's own magic prowess. The Empire is also trying to beat the Thalmor at their own game with the Penitus Oculatus doing all sorts of black ops and assassinations. And finally, this is still the Empire. Their prestige may be greatly diminished, but there's still enough legitimacy and political connections left that there isn't a non-zero chance that they could rebuild everything they'd lost. Alright, time for why none of this is likely to even matter. First off, Titus II is dead. Whether we kill him during the Dark Brotherhood questline or he just croaks of old age going up north for his cousin's wedding, I think it's going to be canon that he doesn't make it out of Skyrim alive. It's unclear if he even has a successor, let alone if that successor is going to be able to match Titus II's tactical prowess, which was really the only reason the Empire even survived the war. That Dark Brotherhood questline also confirms there's a serious political conspiracy going on in Cyrodiil, so who knows if the whole place isn't going to just fall into chaos again like at the start of the Fourth Era. Certain theories about that quest also calls High Rock's commitment to the Empire into question, and without them, the Empire is utterly ruined. But why would anyone betray the Empire like this? It's greed. Just about everyone on Red Team is greedy, some of them dangerously so. The Jarls weren't asked. We were told, and we had to like it. The chests of gold didn't hurt. Damn it, this isn't about gold. Preventus, shut the fuck up. Why would you implicate yourself like that? And Bulgriff is one of the good Jarls on the Imperial side. Alright, so originally I had this whole bit where we'd go on a tour of all the cities talking about the Jarls and their potential replacements, but I realized how screwed we'd truly be with that detour when it was over 20 minutes of runtime and that was before I'd even hit Elisif and Ulfric. In another timeline, that detour made the cut, but it felt like a lot of synopsis of admittedly rarely discussed background conflicts, but synopsis nonetheless. 
So here's my takeaway after spending several days researching and writing about the Jarls. Korir and Kraldar are both complete who's controlling a city that not even the writers of the questline gave a crap about. Both of them are too focused on the College of Winterhold to matter as rulers, and the city of Winterhold isn't even of strategic importance. So we'll just give the entire hold a DNF and move on. The writers at least didn't forget about Falkreath, too bad just about everything else in the game has, so debating over who would be a better ruler of Falkreath is a pissing contest between a spoiled corrupt brat and a paranoid old man. I'd still take Mr. Paranoid just because he'll at least get things done, but I really think Tullius is sleeping on the strategic importance of Falkreath. If I was him, I wouldn't be valuing my sole supply route with Cyrodiil as being equal to Dawnstar and Morthal. Point goes to the Stormcloaks here. Speaking of, Morthal is mid either way. Idgrad Ravencrone is hands off with her subject to a fault. There's way too much going on these days for her to be spending her time shacked up with her mystical visions. Her Stormcloak replacement isn't any better though, being a discount maven Blackbriar who wants to use her new posting in Morthal as a stepping stone to claiming a bigger city. Oddly, she fingers Riften as her city of choice, which, while she'd absolutely fit in over there, Maven would definitely eat her for lunch. Sorely feels out of place in the Stormcloaks, she really strikes me as someone who'd be working for the Imperials. Point goes to the Red Team. Jarl Skald the Elder of Dawnstar is a literal armchair cringe lord, and even the veterans he's stacked his court with have no problems telling him how stupid he's being with his fanboying for Ulfric and the Stormcloaks. When he's not telling the player to go kill giants just to stick it to the Imperials who aren't around to tell him to leave the giants be, he's bullying the one person in court who doesn't have enough backbone to tell him to f*** off. This makes his Imperial replacement, Brina Merilis, the desired ruler for the people of Dawnstar. She's Skald's polar opposite as a Legion veteran and certified girl boss material, and she's actually concerned for the safety and well-being of the people of the town. She's unequivocally a better ruler, handily winning this one for the red team. Riften is another toss-up because the choice is actually the same. Technically, Maven Blackbriar, or actually Maven Blackbriar. Layla Lawgiver is so insulated and disconnected from the outside world that I'm surprised she and her family are even aware of civil wars happening. With how things work around here, I'm shocked Maven didn't align Layla in the Rift with the Imperials without the Jarl even knowing. Layla was still a check on Maven's ambitions and her worst cruelty, but for a province like the Rift, Maven's style might actually work out enough to benefit her subjects to some degree. Still, I'm gonna give this point to the Stormcloaks, but this was a real race to the bottom here. Then we got Markarth. Jarl Igmund seems way in over his head, and had it not been for the Imperials propping him up, the Silverbloods would have taken the throne a long time ago, as they pretty much own the rest of the city at this point. We know remarkably very little about his faction, despite their many years of being in charge. Ordinarily, I'd say anyone would have been better than Igmund, but with his replacement being the Silverbloods, I'm not so sure. Thongvor seems to at least have the right attitude for winning against the Forsworn, but his brother who runs the business side of the family is in way too deep with the Forsworn to be trusted. Thongvor's steward is another shrewd money man who can't be trusted and seems keen on squeezing the hold for all it's worth, though at least he's willing to kick back to Ulfric. If Thongvor makes good on his promise to eliminate the Forsworn, then he could be a positive change for the city. Meanwhile, I doubt the Imperials will commit to that fight, otherwise the Forsworn would have likely already been gone at this point. I also don't see Igmund rising up and executing the whole Silverblood family, so I'm giving this point to the blue team. Finally, we got Whiterun, and I mean, do I really even need to get into this one? Jarl Balgriff is probably the most capable minor Jarl in Skyrim, probably even High King material. You could say he's too cautious, and his eventual sliding with the Empire was owed more to him having a rivalry with Ulfric, and less to do with protecting the people of Whiterun. But don't forget, Whiterun legalized public worship of Talos without anyone even batting an eye, and that's on top of Balgriff having made the pilgrimage to High Hrothgar. I mean, personally, I think the Talos Shrine is just a really misguided reference to the Preacher from Megaton, considering nobody even acknowledges its existence. But even ignoring that, Bulgriff is definitely not a super-imperialized Nord. It's just a shame we couldn't convince him to side with the Stormcloaks. As a result, Vignar is an absolutely awful replacement, as the senile old man's identity is now built around his petty feud with the Battleborns and bitching about a conflict he technically shouldn't have an opinion as as a member of the Companions. Yeah, the Imperials sweep this one uncontested. Alright, so for those of you keeping score at home, the final tally is 3 points Stormcloaks and 3 points Imperials. Are you fucking kidding me? Even my completely arbitrary ranking ended in a stalemate? Well, goddamn, thanks for proving my thesis right that the writers are really trying to balance this conflict, but this means we gotta go into overtime and boil this down to the two vying for the big chair. 
I feel bad for Elisif. It's clear she probably has the most pure intentions out of pretty much every other Jarl in Skyrim. She cares about her subjects, she takes the job seriously, she knows she's not equipped for what's needed of her right now, which is why she has to rely so heavily on her advisors, and she doesn't even slouch in her chair. Had she been a Jarl of a minor hold during a time of peace, she probably would grow to be a very good Jarl but she is in probably the worst place possible where her inexperience is going to cause a lot of long-term damage. I'm not sure why she would take the place of her late husband. Like I said earlier, the High King slash Queen isn't a hereditary title, and it doesn't even seem like the Jarldom is. Otherwise, why didn't Dengir's brother take the Jarldom of Falkreath instead of Dengir's nephew? I could empathize with Elisif wanting to take the throne just to deny Ulfric's ambitions by keeping Torg there in spirit, but if you really wanted to screw Ulfric, putting someone in power who would have taken a much more commanding lead of the situation would have been much better. Putting herself into the seat really only plays to Ulfric's advantage because now Tullius is distracted with having to carry the governing of the western provinces on his back along with the war effort, a responsibility he doesn't care to accept which leads to Hafengar pretty much being taken roughshod for Tullius' war efforts. Elisif has her core to help, read, run the show, which we gotta break this down. Let's start with her steward, Falk Firebeard. He's probably the most trustworthy and reliable of the bunch, at least going off of what we can see as the player, but even he is compromised to some degree due to his romantic relationship with Bryling. Bryling is a Thane of Solitude who owns Rock Wallow Mine, the same place being run by the potential Stormcloak Jarl from Orthal. Despite what Sorli's husband says about Bryling having a nasty temper, she actually seems very level-headed and fair, so much so that even despite being aligned with the Imperials, she refuses to condemn the Stormcloaks because she respects their courage for fighting what they believe in. That's admirable and pretty based, but that's problematic for someone so close to the potential High Queen of Skyrim to be publicly stating. It's also insinuated that Falk and her want to elope, and they use official business like collecting taxes to hide their obviously problematic romantic relationship. I don't get the feeling that either of them are up to abusing their stations for their own personal gain, but there's still too much potential for abuse to occur here, and at the very least we can say that this could be a serious distraction. We already talked about the court wizard in detail in the previous video. Sybil has her run of the place, using her position to further her experiments that require live subjects from the dungeons and expensive ingredients that are being charged to the city's coffers. Her allegiance is only to herself, and she even openly doubts in court that Elisif will be around much longer. Definitely not a reliable employee, but what can you do? We must trust in Tullius's leadership. For what other choice do we have? Eriker is a f***ing snake who should be taken out for the good of everyone, including the people of the city who either owe him money or rent payments that he continuously keeps increasing. He likes to buy shoddy elven gear that he then sells to the Imperials for a steep markup, and he isn't above entertaining the idea of selling to Ulfric if he was willing to buy elven goods. He tries to use his position as Thane to get preferential treatment for his shipping business, which he claims the profits goes towards financing the Imperials in the Civil War, but for all the reasons I just listed, I doubt he's contributing that much. You also got Elisif saying how she admires Elenwyn and her tastes during the embassy mission of the main quest, just to solidify her awful judgment and character. In short, Solitude's court is a complete train wreck. Seems fitting then that we come back to finally bring to a close this breakdown of the political conflict with Ulfric. In comparison to Solitude's, Windhelm's court is pretty much drama-free by virtue of the fact that the court doesn't even exist. In terms of advisors, Ulfric doesn't really have any. Galmar is his chief lieutenant, and Ulfric values his input, but it doesn't seem like Galmar has anything to do with running the holds. Jorleaf, Ulfric's court steward, doesn't seem to have much going on either. He admits he doesn't do a whole lot, and the few times he does give input, he feels like it isn't all that valuable. Though Ulfric still appreciates his input regardless. Woundfirth the Unliving is the court wizard, and he has no purpose in the court because Ulfric doesn't trust mages. And that's the entire court. We don't even know if there are any thanes. I'm gonna pretend the developers didn't forget to give us some sort of court for Windhelm, and assume this is meant to show Ulfric doesn't really trust people enough to fill his court with advisors and assistants. This could mean he prefers a more hands-on approach, which can help explain the state of Windhelm if he's too distracted by his agenda in the war to give the administrative aspect of his job more attention, in which case this can be his greatest weakness. Ulfric is an enigma, and once again, I hope that's the result of careful writing and not just a lack of development. He stands as a solid example of an archetypical symbol of a movement, someone with enough definition and commitment to be able to sway and motivate, but ambiguous enough to keep from alienating too many people. Instead of seeing the unknowns in his character as a troubling sign, people instead see it as an opportunity to insert their own wishes and interpretations of who he might be. 
Is he just a xenophobic racist who's going to rid Skyrim of its outsiders? Is he simply a devout Talos worshipper? Is he just a traditionalist who only wishes to bring back the old Lord culture? Is he just someone who is sick of getting jerked around by the failing empire? Or is he just some dude with big ambitions seeking the highest position he can aspire to? People can pick what they want and ignore what they don't like because all these definitions fit the product that they see before them. But looking at the gaps in his character next to his empty court has me seeing someone who doesn't really know what they are truly about. He's a great leader to win a civil war, but is he someone who can run a country during peacetime? He could continue to play the Enigma shtick, that might work to bridge some of the divisions that are going to exist in a post-Civil War Skyrim, but sooner or later he's gonna have to make choices, and those choices are going to divide people once again. The way he'd be able to counter that is in elevating the right people to positions of power, but his empty court implies he lacks an ability to trust people enough to do that. He does keep Elisif in charge of solitude, which is a bold display of confidence that the woman who wanted him dead the most can continue to run the richest province unhindered, but, like I said, I think Elisif is a bad Jarl for that hold, and Sybil is probably right. She's gonna get replaced either voluntarily or forcibly. Ultimately, the problem with Ulfric is that his power structure is too centralized. The whole show relies entirely upon him, and he's not even shown to even be thinking about things like marriage, having children, and forming alliances with other houses. It's one thing for his movement to fall apart if he was to die during the Civil War, it's another for his whole country to fall apart if he was to die in office. There's a few conversations you can catch between him and Galmar, and these were really what convinced me Ulfric isn't up to carrying this whole thing solo. He's constantly in need of Galmar's cheerleading to gas him up to make decisions and act with conviction. We can see he's at least trying to make overtures with Marwind and Hammerfell for alliances, but they refuse to take sides, and it's unclear if they will even take sides after the Civil War is done. Despite having some deep insights into the personal character of a lot of people and the hearts of his followers, he fails to see how something like the Jagged Crown could bolster his own claims. Once again, he needs Galmar to spell it out, which really goes to show how desperately Ulfric needs people he can trust helping him. But presently, there are very few people who can do that job. So who do I personally support in the war? Nobody. Skyrim is fucked, same as the Empire. They were doomed when the Septims died, and we we're just witnessing the slow unraveling of this whole thing. That's what makes this thing such an interesting conflict for me to analyze. A lot of players might not like the idea that, in the end, what we do here is meaningless, but I like to think of it as some sort of insight into how real-life figures felt when trying to battle against the headwinds of history. But we are now done talking nice and giving the writers and designers the benefit of the doubt here. As much as it pains me to move away from the only part of Vanilla Skyrim's writing I genuinely enjoyed, it's time to move on to the quests of this quest line. And oh boy, what whiplash it's gonna be going from the best stuff this game has to offer to what's gotta be the worst. So what makes the Civil War quest line so awful? I got three main gripes with it. First, it's rushed. Second, our choices don't matter. And third, it's fucking boring. The number of bugs I came across in this questline was astounding. And I'm not just talking about your usual Skyrim jank, I'm talking quest soft locking bugs, bugs that ruined certain quests, bugs that made quests more difficult to complete, and bugs that just defied my understanding of how this game even functions. Most of them were replicable across different saves and even different characters, and definitely not shit that should exist in a game that has been remastered and re-released this many times over 11 years with a community-made patch installed. These were set-piece quests for the first questline the player is introduced to, and this is the state that they are in today. I have a pretty high tolerance for bugs and jank, but when I have to sit through the same unskippable cutscenes three times because the questline kept softlocking, you can say I had plenty of time to formulate what I would say when it came time to write this section. Modders have documented all sorts of content buried in the game files that hints at what was planned for this questline. Things ranging from salaries for the player and recruiting allies to their chosen side, to several cut characters, quests, and entire battles for each city, including fail states, and battles to reinstate deposed Jarls. There was also a Boethia quest to assassinate Elisif so Eriker could take over. I've no doubt the devs were facing a serious uphill battle working on the Civil War. This engine was not designed to do big battles, and 2011 console hardware was not going to be doing them any favors either. Fallout 3 had some big battle set pieces, and I imagine they were used as a guide when working them into Skyrim, but both the battle for the Purifier and the final assault on the Enclave airbase in Broken Steel were very script-heavy and railroaded the player through custom-built arenas. The battle for Whiterun is a lot more open, and the battles for Forts even more so, but they were still isolated. We only get one dynamic battle that happens on the road from Helgen to Iverstead. Outside of that, we never see the two squaring off outside of a dedicated quest. 
Modders were quick to start putting in bigger battles on PC, demonstrating large-scale dynamic battles were not impossible. This could have been one of the many things Bethesda could have taken a remaster on new hardware to have implemented. But beyond the technical issues, the whole questline has an air of... Let's get this over with. Quests almost never leverage the backstory and world building we covered in the previous three sections. Enemy forts and their related battles are indistinguishable from one another. Some characters are almost duplicates for their opposing faction equivalents, and both factions end up playing beat for beat identically. You mean Ulfric's so-called Stormcloak Rebellion? Riften, the Nord Kings. Oh, excuse me. Jarls. They can't seem to control their own people, so the Legion has stepped in to keep order. Sadly, the Empire's stretched a little thin these days, and we've gotten very few reinforcements. So we've been forced to recruit locally. But rest assured, citizen, we'll put an end to this uprising, and things will get back to normal soon enough. Skyrim is the birthplace of humanity. 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 The birthplace of honor. And those snowbacked Imperials renounced both when they laid down before the Thalmor. This leads well into issue number two. I'm not expecting Bethesda to start copying Bioware's thing of importing saves to carry decisions across multiple games. I'm fine with them coming up with ways of lampshading why my choices aren't impacting future games. That's not what I'm playing their games for. I don't even mind that both factions end up at the same spot in the end, but just with a few new Jarls and Guard Patrols changing. I understand doing massive changes in every city for all the NPCs would open a whole nightmare of quest conflicts. Though they should have at least exiled the deposed Jarls and just failed their few quests. What I don't like is that my choice of who to support doesn't change my experience during the quest line, and that's what leads to the biggest issue of all. This shit is so boring, oh my god. As of writing this, I still need to go back through as an Imperial player to collect footage, and I genuinely can't think of anything I want to do less. Seriously, renewing my health insurance sounds more appealing right now. Each faction follows the same exact structure. Sign up with a faction leader, prove our worthiness to join, retrieve the Jagged Crown, deliver a message to Whiterun, the battle for Whiterun, deliver false orders to an enemy commander, a rescue mission from a fort, blackmailing a Jarl steward, and up to five fort battles depending on how negotiations at the Peace Council went. In the case of Fort Sunguard and Fort Greenwall, you'll be fighting for the same fort on either side. And in the case of the rescue missions, those forts will also be featured on the opposing side as a generic battle. You know what, the recycling of certain forts probably doesn't even matter as the forts are so generic that they could all be the same fort and the experience wouldn't change. If you played through this questline once, you've really seen 95% of what this entire questline has to offer. A couple of cutscenes and some exclusive dialogue is all you'll be missing out on. As a result, I'm not going to go through this blow by blow. I might have to endure this thing several times to make this video, but you all don't have to suffer with me. Let's just return to Gutha as she wins this thing for the Stormcloaks. After explaining to Galmar that Skyrim is her home, the old Nord warhorse sent her out to go kill an ice wraith in the wastes north of the city. Turns out this is the same trial Nord youths would perform when they came of age to prove themselves, which seems a fair challenge to test Gutha's commitment. On the flip side, you got Rika sending the Imperial player to go clear out a bandit-infested fort solo. Through the power of the Elder Scrolls and the Dragon Breaks, I think I got the right man in mind for this task. Thanks for trying to get me killed! What a wasted opportunity here to flesh out the Imperials a bit because god damn could they have used something. A few of you might be thinking I was biased talking about Ulfric far more than I talked about Tullius, but honestly we pretty much covered everything there is to know about him. Despite how anemic Ulfric's backstory is, Tullius doesn't get anything even nearly as interesting. Like with Sheogorath, this is bizarre because, you know, where the previous game took place and everything. Getting a bit of info on Tullius was a rare opportunity where a little bit of service for the Oblivion fans would have actually been appropriate. Maybe Tullius would be like, ordinarily we'd send you off for training for a few weeks, but seeing as you're the Dragonborn and everything, I could make use of you as an auxiliary soldier. How about you just do me a personal favor and deliver this letter to a courier in Falkreath? You could ask him what the letter is and he'll explain it's just a personal letter going to his sister living in Aleswell or Cropsford or one of the other random villages fans of Oblivion might recognize. It'd be an opportunity to name drop one of those locations and give us a cute little update acting as a nod that yes, Oblivion fans, we didn't forget about Cyrodiil. 
This Oblivion drought is also kind of weird, considering our character is said to have been coming from Cyrodiil. Maybe there could have been some dialogue with Talius where the player can reminisce about Cyrodiil, or even imply that they weren't actually from Cyrodiil, they were just passing through, helping clear up some of the implications from the player's arrest before the title card. Now officially part of Blue Team, Gutha is sent with Galmar to retrieve the Jagged Crown because Ulfric needs more symbolism to prove his right to be High King. I find it funny how a Radiant side quest in Winterhold recycled this premise as the Jarl asks the player to retrieve the Helm of Winterhold to get the other Jarls to start returning his phone calls again. In both cases, nobody actually gives a shit because neither the Helm nor the Jagged Crown ever gets brought up again once turned in. The dungeon itself is a Draugr crypt, but it's at least appropriate here, and it's neat getting to do a dungeon as part of a military unit. This will be our first taste of the big battles this questline has to offer, so naturally it creates misleading expectations due to the variety it displays. Initially, we get an all-out assault on the front door of the place because, regardless of which faction we side with, we will always arrive after the opposing faction found the place, even though Galmar was the one who found the location of the crown to begin with. Damn Imperial spies! Then we get a very brief infiltration bit. But Gutha doesn't do stealth, come on now. The further we go, the more the experience gets diluted by the uninspired Draugr crypt, until we reach King Borgis, last of Yskimor's dynasty, final descendant of King Harald, the man who banned the old Nordic pantheon. No, just, uh, just a Draugr Deathlord? Couldn't even give him a custom name like King Olaf? <sighs> okay... Mercurio, what did you do? Why are our allies trying to kill us now? Do they want the honor of giving Ulfric the useless quest item? They can have it. It's not like I'm getting rewarded for this. Oh yeah, did I mention the rewards for this quest line suck? Because they do. This quest was an opportunity for the designers to elevate a standard Draugr crypt into something interesting that would actually expand our knowledge of the Nords. We got someone like Galmar here who has been looking for this place for a while now, and he doesn't have anything to say about the place. Maybe, instead of arriving to find the Imperials somehow beat us to the punch, we break into the crypt and get a bunch of lore and characterization of the Nords until the Imperials arrive and we have to rebuff their advance. Leave the Call of Duty infiltration mission to the Imperial players and maybe Ricka will just throw them some tidbits. We can run into Rayloff or Hadvar here, depending upon who we are siding with, and this continues what ends up being a story about their growth as soldiers in the war. We get to watch as they move up the ranks, starting as lowly foot soldiers and eventually leading their own units during the carriage ambush mission. We even get to have a bit of a heart-to-heart -heart with them after the Battle of Whiterun, where they talk about being haunted by the horrors of this war, and we get some rare dialogue choices to define the morality of our characters a bit more. I like their inclusion in the story, partially because they are probably the only characters in this game with genuine character development, but also because it does help humanize the conflict a bit more. It's a shame they just kind of vanish after the carriage quest. You'd think that they would have been present at the battle for Solid Helm. You know, maybe there would have been a final showdown between the two of them to close their stories out, maybe acting as a callback to their exchange in Helgen. I guess the designers forgot about them. No surprise there. Gutha makes it back with the crown, and it's time for the battle for Whiterun. Galmar does his usual cheerleading to get Ulfric pumped up by mentioning his bare feet. And we are ready for this busted jank fest. Playing as the Stormcloaks as the attackers is a far more interesting experience, which isn't saying a whole lot. But Galmar's speech beats Rika's. The spectacle of invading the city is more captivating than standing at the gatehouse killing a few waves of Stormcloaks. And the showdown in Dragon's Reach is probably the emotional highlight for the entire game. Still, that doesn't mean I wanted to repeat it three times because the scripting broke and wouldn't let me tell Ulfric we'd won the battle. With the battle won, it's time for the Stormcloaks to really go on the offensive. This has Gutha operating exclusively in the field now. Her first mission is stealing some reports from an Imperial courier, getting them altered, and then delivering the false reports to the Imperial captain. The courier we can just kill anywhere on their patrol route without consequence, but that's not even the dumbest part of this quest. No, that honor goes to telling the captain we ditched our Imperial armor for whatever we're currently wearing to avoid Stormcloaks. I appreciate that the captain will actually recognize if we are wearing faction-appropriate armor and adjust their dialogue accordingly, but our excuse for why we are out of uniform seems kinda... stupid? Isn't this the kind of thing we have persuasion checks for? I guess they couldn't bother figuring out what a failed state for that persuasion check would look like, so free points for big-brained Guth over here, I guess. Next up, we're headed to Fort Newgrad for a rescue mission. So yeah, I think I've gotten this quest to work correctly, um... never. No, the four times I did this quest, it broke in some way. 
And if memory serves me right, I don't think I've ever done this quest the intended way. The idea is that we're supposed to sneak in through a back entrance into the prison and stealthily release the imprisoned soldiers who will then help us kill everyone inside the prison. After that, we then go outside to meet up with our reinforcements who will be busy taking over the fort from the remaining guards. The problem was that half the time my allies were spawning too close to the fort for stealth to even be an option because they'd immediately be attacking the fort before I'd even gotten to the original rendezvous point. Then there was a time I got outside after successfully breaking the prisoners out and my allies decided to not attack the fort, forcing me and Markirio to clear out the Imperials by ourselves. I've also had the prison break go wrong in so many different ways. What a fun quest. Next, Gutha had to go blackmail the steward of Markarth. Oh wait, hang on. No, she didn't, because Markarth was already in the Stormcloaks' pocket, thanks to Sarian's negotiations. Yeah, I synced that up when I was getting Dragon Run for Gutha. Nah, she needed to reinstall Layla Lawgiver by clearing out a fort in the Rift instead. Gross. So if you do end up having to do one of the blackmail quests, it's pretty straightforward. Galmor or Ricka will tell you to go sneak into the Jarl Steward's quarters and steal something incriminating. In Riften, it's some documents that would out the Steward as being part of the Thieves' Guild, and in Markarth, it's an amulet of Talos that proves the Steward is a closet Talos worshipper. The Steward will give up the location of a carriage transporting silver weapons, and we team up with Rayloff or Hadvar to ambush and claim ownership of the goods. This was another missed opportunity to give us some cool backstory on these two cities. Maybe we can learn some deep lore on the Thieves' Guild or Maven Blackbriar for Riften, and in Markarth we'd finally get some answers surrounding the Markarth incident. But no, just some boring surface level stuff that's only there to move the events forward. After that, Gutha had a long string of forts to clear out. You know, we haven't done a montage yet. Maybe now would be a good time for one. We made it! The Gates of Solitude. Ulfric gives a speech which, listen, I like Michael Hogan, I think he did the best he could as Tullius, but Vladimir Kulik absolutely kills it as Ulfric. Despite everything leading up to this, yeah, I'm still hyped. I mean, this is the saddest looking army ever, but yeah, 2011 consoles and all that, what, what can you do? The Battle for Solitude is so much better than the Battle for Windhelm. Speeches aside, the narrow streets of Windhelm are an absolute nightmare for ally AI. This would result in me frequently being deep behind enemy lines getting swarmed by endlessly spawning AI because their spawns won't deactivate until Tullius has passed certain trigger zones. It is fun getting to mow down waves of enemies, and you can bet I turned down the difficulty during these battles just to stack more bodies, but I'm still seeing this corridor from Windhelm in my nightmares. Gutha makes it inside Castle Dower and the gang finds Talia sitting in the corner completely defeated. Rika is at least ready to die a true Nord death, which earns her entrance into Sovngarde, so at least she gets some recognition for dealing with Talia's sh** all this time. Ulfric rode right into our ambush with only a few bodyguards. He surrendered pretty meekly too. So much for his death or glory reputation. And if I surrender, the Empire I remember never surrendered. Tullius has his request denied, and it's time for one last speech. Ulfric forces Elisif to admit it was never murder, and then he lets her keep her seat. Once a puppet, always a puppet, I guess. If you do this for the Imperials, you get to Galmar and Ulfric, and the two of them go down swinging like the chads that they are. All Ulfric wants is for the Dragonborn to kill him. Thanks for f***ing up my RP there, chief. And Tullius gives us his sword to use, because of course he has to ruin this moment. Don't worry, you don't actually have to use his sword. He'll steal the credit for all this anyhow. But what can you expect from an Imperial? His head will be sent to Cyrodiil, where it will adorn a spike on the walls of the Imperial City. You can't say I'll ever get used to the damn cold or understand these Nords, but I've come to respect them. Adorn a spike. Man, what a travesty. You want a textbook example of Skyrim squandering an opportunity? Look no further than the Civil War. I get it. Bringing this questline to its true potential was probably never gonna happen. Between the engine, console hardware, and Todd standing there off to the side sharpening his cleaver, this was probably a doomed venture. Points to all those involved who even had the guts to pitch the idea, let alone spend the time trying to get this thing put together. Sorry, I just mercilessly tore what had to be countless frustrating hours of head-slamming work apart, but I hope the compliments I paid in the first three sections shows that I get what you all going for. With that said, let's back this all the way up. 
Was the Civil War a good idea? I know I said I think the Civil War should have been picked over the Dragon Conflict, but that was in the context of Bethesda needing to prioritize one over the other after a point in development. If we were to sit down during Skyrim's earliest pre-production, should the Civil War have made it past those meetings? I really don't think so. Factional conflicts are a thing Bethesda has been trying to get right, but I've yet to see them succeed even once. When you have Obsidian showing exactly how it can work in Fallout New Vegas, it's hard not to look at Bethesda's attempts and wonder if they are doing this simply because people liked it and not because Bethesda wants to do factional conflicts in their games again. Unless they're going to be hiring dedicated writers, I don't think their pipeline works with doing factional conflicts, even within self-contained questlines dedicated to those factions. This is extremely problematic for a Fallout game, but thankfully we're not talking about those today, so we can stay focused on Elder Scrolls. When the faction questlines in Skyrim range from dull to disastrous, it makes me wonder who thought doing a whole major questline that involved two massive factions that would tie into the rest of the game would work. Tez 4 skipped getting into any politics of its world, and with its setting and main story, that was a very strange decision to make as it essentially wasted the potential of a game set in Cyrodiil. Regardless, not even Oblivion's most staunch detractors seem to hit on that weakness much. While fans are completely fine with the total absence of politics in the heart of the Empire during a secession crisis. So if nobody cared about its absence in a setting that it was most appropriate for, why bring it back in Skyrim? Before Tez 5, we really didn't know a whole lot about Skyrim as a province. It was more or less a blank slate, an opportunity to tell any story imaginable because the province is so isolated it might as well be on another continent. Instead, this is the game where politics makes a comeback, doubling down with all new lore introduced with the Great War and the collapse of the Empire. This is not only very ambitious because of the enormity of the stakes, but it's also ambitious because it has to tell a story that would have been easier to tell in Cyrodiil. So once again, was this really the direction this game should have taken? I have a really hard time buying the political and military lore of the Tez universe in general. I couldn't help but continuously roll my eyes when reading a concise account of the Great War between the Empire and the All Merry Dominion. Playing Oblivion ruined the scale of Cyrodiil for me. Does this look like a place a great naval battle could take place? Maybe if those ships were just rowboats, then sure. Then the book got into talking about armies and military maneuvers, and once again, I couldn't get over what I was seeing in Skyrim and imagining the Thalmor's invading army being literally 15 dudes in black robes spamming Firebolt. The games have ruined any chance I might have of suspending my disbelief with this lore, and without interesting quests, characters, and writing in the questline itself, the lore was one of the very few things the Civil War even had going for it. This is where things like the gods and the Daedra and all the unique cultures we have in this franchise stands a much better chance of survival. Skyrim had the opportunity to develop the Nords into something more than the potato faces we saw in Oblivion, and they started doing something with them in Skyrim, but nobody seemed to be fully on board with even wanting to build them up into a unique culture, let alone what that culture actually was. The Companions had everything in place to explore anything about the Nords. History, religion, social norms, values, crafts, music, anything. Anything could have worked its way into that faction had the designers cared about making the Nords into something distinct and decided that's what the Companions was meant to show as a faction. Instead, they turned them into some half-baked cult of Hircean mercenary organization with an upside-down ship for a base. I shouldn't be getting starved for quests like Galmar's Initiation Quest or the Sacred Trials of Kind that vaguely hints at these people having some kind of culture. Almost every quest should have the player walking away with some deeper understanding of what the Nords are about. Because Skyrim failed to explain who the Nords are, players end up not caring about the Civil War. The conflict devolves into a grind between two sides that are little more than different sets of armor. A civil war and a dragon conflict could present an opportunity to answer those questions, but it's going to take some creative writing talent that Bethesda has not demonstrated they possess. Without that cultural foundation, any conflict that asked for us to care about the people involved was doomed to fall short and be forgotten. And now, I can start to forget about this conflict as well. But first, one more bit of civil war content. The Civil War Champion's creation adds two unique sets of heavy armor correlating to the two sides of the conflict. Both sets of armor look a bit gaudy, particularly the helmets, but I do like the shields. The armor sets themselves are quite powerful, especially their enchantments, staying true to CC items being brokenly OP. I'm partial to the Stormcloak one though, just because I'll take anything offering shout cooldown reduction, and power attack stamina cost reduction is pretty unique too. Double bashing damage on both shields? That's a nice touch though. 
Being Ulfric's ace in the hole, Gutha naturally stepped up to be the champion for the Stormcloaks. She donned the armor, went out to the location where the duel was to take place, and of course manhandled the Imperial Champion, taking his armor as a reward and tossing it on a mannequin in the basement of Hendraheim to be forgotten. What a fitting close to this quest line. While on the road, Gutha came across someone afflicted with something that made him look slightly worse than the other people she'd come across in Skyrim. For some reason, people in Skyrim never seemed to bathe or wash their clothes. Even Elisif looked a little ragged. This always annoyed me, playing as Sarian, who is forced to wear dirty robes all the time. Armor doesn't really have this issue. At worst, some of the armor just looks a little bit scuffed, but it never looks like my character had been sleeping on a patch of dirt all the time. Gutha might have been an orc from a stronghold, but she was taught to keep things clean. So you can imagine her surprise when this afflicted man ended up putting her on the path to communing with Periite, the Daedric Lord of Pestilence. A mangy cat had her collecting some odd materials in order to make a concoction that would let her contact his lord. I gotta wonder if the silver bar and the ruby were actually meant for the mixture, or if he was just playing us here and taking that as payment. After mixing up the incense, he tells Gutha to get a sniff in. Oh. Melon's not like a Washibi smelling. It's fitting we start with this quest as it's probably the most Oblivion-esque in its setup. We go to a dedicated shrine where one of the Lord's followers tells us what we need to hand over as an offering to talk to the Prince. We then get a one-on-one -on -one conversation where they tell us what they need us to do. Then we go to that location, take care of business, and earn their artifact. There's certainly a lot more visual stuff going on here than anything we got in Oblivion, where we'd just be staring at a literal statue as NPCs nervously paced around us. But make no mistake, this is an Oblivion quest new clothes. The dungeon this quest takes us to is just another Dwemer ruin. Yeah, add it to the list of those I had to clear when I was playing as Gutha. It's also really long, and the afflicted aren't anything to write home about. Can I just take a second to note how little being poisoned in Skyrim matters? Ignoring the fact that poison resistance is handed out like some regifted doodad from an office secret Santa, even on higher difficulties, most enemies are going to be hitting you with terribly weak poisons that just damage your health. The afflicted here are no different. Their vile vapor shout, yes, it's a shout with its own cooldown and everything, just does 20 points of damage for two seconds. The afflicted are just weak in general, and the boss of their faction we are sent to kill isn't all that much better. He can teleport around. That looks like a cool spell. Can I get that? And he can pop off some decent destruction magic that makes fighting him a bit of a pain as a melee character, but we also got shield bash, so yeah. As a reward, we get Spellbreaker, which Pariyak just plops into our inventory without mentioning it. It's one of the better shields in the game, potentially best in slot if you pretend smithing and CC don't exist, and the ward it can put up when blocking is a really unique display of creativity just about all the other Daedric artifacts completely lacked. It's also one of the few items that's been spared the worst of Skyrim's item art design wrath. Hey, they didn't just send us into a Dwemer ruin as a way of hinting at how Pariyak got his hands on a Dwemer artifact, did they? Speaking of hands, a new hand touches the beacon. Where Periite's quest was almost a throwback to Oblivion's favorite quest structure, Meridia's quest is probably the best example of Skyrim's new favorite quest structure. I've been looking for you. A letter. Not looks like that's it. Got to go. You you cannot escape the truth. You cannot escape the true dragon lore. Heard they're reforming the Dawn Guard. Vampire hunters or something in the old fort near Riften. To oppose. Might consider joining up myself. Find them. Get them. You there. The Dawn Guard is looking for anyone willing to fight against the growing vampire me- Alright, probably second favorite. An item that, once picked up, locks itself in the player's inventory along with a journal entry we can't hide. I mean, we did get this with the Amulet of Kings, at least with the beacon we could just not pick it up. Though it will keep randomly spawning containers, I guess her beacon just really gets around. Ugh. <laughs> Do we take it? Do we touch the beacon? Do I need to touch the beacon is the question. I don't think I do. I'm not going to touch it. Yeah, we're going to blue ball Meridia right there. We'll find another champion. I can think of one other quest that had this set up in Oblivion with some mace we needed to return to its owner, but Skyrim really amped up the number of bound on pickup quests, and let's not even discuss the stuff CC did. 
This was no doubt done as an attempt to more seamlessly integrate quests into the world, and for the most part, Daedra quests do blend in better than their Oblivion counterparts, but this quest is so overt with its implementation that it's become a vintage Skyrim meme. Meridia is one of the good Daedra, so Gutha had no problems doing her bidding. She also respected a strong woman with a commanding voice. You gotta forgive Gutha here, the concept of Daedra being genderless is entirely lost on her. This one's another dungeon crawl, and this time it's a Nordic ruin. I mean, you guys, you put the word wall outside. You could have liberated yourselves here. You could have said, yep, we met the word wall quota. Now we can use whatever tile set we want for this dungeon. I mean, maybe not. This dungeon does contain quest specific art assets that would look at a place not in order crypt. Speaking of, we got to go through guiding this beam of light through the dungeon. There's no puzzle aspect to this or any sort of navigation we have to figure out. So it's more like activating waypoints, you know, just in case a straight line Skyrim dungeon layout and clairvoyance wasn't enough. Gutha reaches the end and puts down the necromancer flooding the place with undead. It turns out the guy was stealing the dead bodies of Stormcloak and Imperial soldiers for his experiments, which I'm curious how those logistics worked. I doubt there were many skirmishes going on between the two sides all the way up in Hafengar, so he must have been carting them from one of the battlegrounds that we saw, like, uh, the road between Helgen and Iverstead? Don't tell me they put Meridia's shrine here in Hafengar because it has a history of necromancy. For our trouble, we get Dawnbreaker, one of the very few new Daedric artifacts in Skyrim. I guess the Ring of Khajiiti was a no-go, seeing as Chameleon and Speed are both dead in this game. Well, it's okay, Creation Club Fishing brought the ring back. Kinda. They dropped the last eye in the name along with the constant chameleon effect, replacing it with an invisibility spell lasting 15 seconds a player can cast if they have the ring equipped. Hide only costs 33 magicka as opposed to the invisibility spell which costs 295 magicka, so yeah, pretty busted as per creation club requirements. But it better be goddamn busted because getting it requires doing Skyrim fishing, which... Okay, during my RuneScape days I was big into fishing, it was one of my main hustles for making money. Honestly, I blame that game for my habit of gravitating towards fishing minigames whenever I see them in a game that I'm playing today. Th this leads to another discussion about how the ubiquity of fishing in games is such a strange phenomenon. It it's really something that you can't unsee once you notice it. I, I, I really ought to get around to making a video about that someday. Oh, someone already did. In fact, they've been invisibly solving a big problem in games for years, and that is habituation. Now, habituation is a big fancy biology word for when an organism gradually responds less and less to a given- Yeah, I can do better than this. Anyways, if I was to rank Skyrim's fishing against all the other games I'd played, I'd put it, mmm, dead last. I, I did have to stop for a moment and think if it was actually worse than Skyrim fishing, but then I remembered all the mini games fishing had for that game, like Fishing Trawler, and oh my god, scalping wilty players with cooked sharks. You make- you, I would make so much money doing that. I didn't even do it for the money, honestly. I did it just because I liked- I just liked chiseling people. <laughs> because they'd be out there, right? They they burn through all their crap because they have- they poorly planned and they're bad players, right? So you just go up there and it's like, yeah, I'll sell you a set amount. Like, you have to buy 150 cooked sharks. They only need a full inventory, which is like 20. But no, you, you have to buy 100 and you have to buy it at a markup too. And I would do- I didn't even need the money, right? I didn't even need the money. I just did it because I just wanted to rip them off. Oh, I hated wilty players. Fuck them. They deserved it. Okay, fishing in Skyrim. It's literally just walking up and activating a fishing spot, waiting for the rod to bob, and then hitting the activate key again to reel it in. There's more mechanical depth to fishing in Stardew Valley, Terraria, and Minecraft. I get fishing was added for free, and it comes with a bunch of quests, unique fish models, an aquarium the player can build, and tons of powerful trinkets, but I couldn't be bothered with any of that because the mechanics can't stack up against the efforts of indie dev teams from over the past decade. This is probably why they let you just jump into the water and grab the fish with your bare hands. Yeah, that's definitely on brand for Gutha. You can't even move the camera around when fishing, or do it in third person. So, the one thing fishing in this game could actually bring to the table by leveraging Skyrim's pleasant environmental art and the lack of camera controls squanders it. Wow. To spoil that video that I'll probably never make, though feel free to keep asking for it in the comments of all my videos, it drives engagement. The best fishing I've seen in a game goes to Red Dead 2. It's 
superb. Slow enough to be relaxing, fast enough not to be boring. It's rewarding thanks to how cooking works in that game, especially in Red Dead Online. God, I'm really, I'm really talking about a lot of Red Dead in this video. And you can do it pretty much anywhere and catch different fish depending on your bait and the location you're fishing at. Also, that game is just stunningly beautiful and fishing lets you just look around and take it all in. The fishing creation adds a whole bunch of artifacts, some of which are actually so good it might be worth enduring the fishing quest to get them if you engage in Gutha fishing. Here's a few highlights. Oh, you ready to hear me butcher more names from Morrowind and Daggerfall? Dense Stagmar's Ring. Resist Fire, Frost, and Shock 20%. A little on the low side, but three effects on a single ring is definitely a big selling point. Mentor's Ring. All spells cost 10% less magic to cast. Once again, low effect, but all schools ain't bad. Varia's Charm. Fortify Light and Heavy Armor 22 points. Eh. But it's got a permanent water breathing effect on it, which will help with fishing. Ring of the Wind. You move 15% faster, which is even better than the Ring of Kashyyyk, which increases the player's movement speed by 10%. See, I told you we talk about these rings. The Vampiric Ring lets you cast the Drain Life spell. Pro tip, give this to a follower. Warlock's Ring. While blocking, creates a ward that protects against spells up to 25 points. Health regenerates 30% faster, and you move 5% faster. Alright, now we're talking. And finally, the best item the fishing creation adds. Fang of Heg Heg Mechdemet. Fang of Heinectemet. Uh, close enough, I guess. A dagger with a base damage of 13 with a 25 point shock damage enchantment with 750 charge uses. Eat your heart out, Mayrune's Razor, you've been replaced. Upgradable with Dragonbone too. Oh right, I forgot we were talking about Dawnbreaker. It's actually a pretty decent sword if you get it at a lower level. Its base damage is on par with Duemer though. It's upgraded with Ebony, but it's gonna fall off pretty quickly for most players. Its enchantment is, once again, decent at lower levels. 10 points fire damage and a chance to trigger Meridia's Retribution. A unique area of effect spell dealing an extra 1 point for 10 seconds of fire damage if the player is attacking an undead opponent. Another pro tip, use this against vampires. It's a shame there's no way to upgrade the enchantments on artifacts, like how we can upgrade their base damage and armor ratings with smithing. Well, when the game allows it, anyhow. 312 use charges is pretty solid, though. I could see this sword getting some extra longevity if it's being dual-wielded with another sword. Just remember, you can't hotkey equip two swords for some reason. So, another fun thing I learned when I had the soul ripped out of me on stream, finding out about that Skyrim quirk, your magic skills affect the charges you get out of equipped weapons. I mentioned this in the magic video when we were talking about staves, but I had no idea the same principle applied to all enchanted gear, swords included. So if you got a higher destruction skill, Dawnbreaker is actually going to have more use charges. How are you supposed to know this? No idea. I learned about staves from the UESP, and people in chat told me about it being the case with swords. Skyrim is such an unintuitive mess that you can learn new things even after playing it for 11 years. Did you know you can get a free dragon soul if you return to the tomb of Jurgen Windcaller after delivering his horn to the Greybeards? Oh, it's already here. <laughs> the fucking note is still there. What? What? Well, first off, how did the horn even get here? Did the Greybeards bring it over here? I thought they didn't leave. My, I'm, f I am absolutely fucking blown away right now. Gutha eventually found herself in Falkreath investigating reports that a werewolf killed a little Nord girl. As Harbinger of the Companions, whose official stance was fur was fun, she figured she'd best investigate this thing. Sinding pleads it wasn't his fault. He stole a ring from Hircine he believed would help control his transformations, but it turns out the ring was cursed, so he'd transform in front of the girl and kill her. Weird that the ring's curse was to have the same problem that he was already having. How did he figure out the ring was to blame then? Also, how did he steal an artifact from a Daedric Prince? I call bullshit on that. Bro, he probably let you have the ring just so he could orchestrate some hunt. Don't give yourself too much credit that you pulled one over on Papa Hircine here. Gutha agrees to take the ring from him for some reason. You should know at this point, she, uh, she has some trouble thinking her actions through. This lets Sinding transform and escape the well he was being kept in. Okay, hold up. I thought the problem was that he was having trouble being able to control his transformations, and that's why he stole the ring in the first place. Or is this implying that the cursed ring is now doing its job? They literally introduced this thing a minute ago, and they're already mixing up the details here. Because Gutha is a werewolf, the ring immediately equipped itself onto her, so now Gutha has a chance of transforming. Don't get too excited here, the chance to transform is only 10% every game hour spent outdoors, with only one check being performed if you wait, sleep, or fast travel. 
Now, is that one in-game hour measured in? Also, the grove we need to go to in order to hunt the white stag to gain Hearsing's attention is close to town. Basically, the odds are pretty damn low that you'll transform even if you have this cursed ring as a werewolf. And if you aren't a werewolf, the ring will do nothing. Once we kill the stag Sindig told us about, Hearsing appears. Yeah, surprise, surprise, Hearsing wants us to help his gang squad hunt down Sindig. So it's off to the grotto where he's hiding out. It's a cool looking dungeon, but it's still a Skyrim dungeon, so it's nothing but a straight line amusement park ride loaded with enemies. Naturally, Gutha helped Sindig kill the hunters because she's the type to root for the underdog in a fight. Get it? Underdog? Initially, I did this both ways because the reward changes depending on if you help Sindog or the hunters, but killing the hunters as a couple of werewolves is probably the more fun route. Regardless of what we do, Hearsing is pleased. If we kill Sindig, he rewards us with Savior's Hide, which is 1. Light Armor, ew, and 2. Has seen a nerf from Oblivion to Skyrim, now only providing 15 points of magic resistance and 50% poison resistance. Yeah, no thanks. I'll take the Uncursed Ring, please. That just allows for an unlimited transformations each day. Like I said in the Werewolf section, not really something I wound up using, but at least I have the option. While running around Falkreath, Gutha came across another dog. This one speaking in a Jewish accent? I don't know, it always sounded like a Jersey accent to my ear. I guess I can hear it though, but what a weird thing to point out in an article. But if you're wondering what that article was I found that quote from, <laughs> you don't want to know. Barbus wants us to help him reunite with his Daedric master, so we can follow him for a very long time through terrain he's likely to get lost in, or we can just travel to the quest marker at Haymare's Shame. Here we find some hostile where- here- god, fucking werewolves, just give me a second, we'll get to that. Here we find some hostile vampires who'd been praying to Clavicus Vile, hoping for a release from their vampirism. Turns out we did vile a solid by slaying all of them because, hey, that technically did free them from their plight. When Gutha says she just wanted to reunite Barbus with Vile, the prince grows indignant. He says he'll consider it if we retrieve the Rueful Axe from another one who sought out his favor. Sebastian Lort is a conjurer whose daughter became a werewolf because she worshipped Hircine. Yeah, see, told ya. In response, Vile gave Conjurer an axe. No idea if the guy actually followed through on slaying his own daughter. They just gotta go kill the Conjurer, reclaim the axe, and Vile might consider taking Barbus back. I get the thing the quest designer is going with here, but why the hell would anyone do business with Vile if all of his transactions end in the supplicant dying? Sure, these are people who probably can't win the favor of the gods and certainly can't seek out conventional aid due to their afflictions and affiliations, but you really gotta be scraping the bottom of the barrel if Skyrim's Clavicus Vile is who you're petitioning. I think I'd rather be doing business with Sheogorath at this point. Oh, right, Skyrim Sheogorath. Nah, I take that back. When we return with the axe, Clav asks us to cleave Barbus in half of the thing if we want to keep it. Hmm, let's see. Base damage of one point over steel, slowest swing speed in the game, even slower than the other battle axes, and 20 points of damage stamina. Yeah, no thanks, take your fucking dog back. He still won't let us walk away empty-handed though, so he gives us his mask. A heavy armor helmet which fortifies barter 20 points, fortifies persuasion 10 points, and a lovely 5% regen magicka. Wow. It does have 23 armor rating, which is the same as the Dietrich helmet though, and it does look kinda cool. Yep, to the basement mannequin with this one. I gotta wonder if the Rueful Axe is intentionally garbage as a middle finger to Oblivion players who kept Umbra because it was weightless as long as a player never finished Vile's quest. Well, I can respect the restraint it must have taken to not cram Umbra into Skyrim to nostalgia bait Oblivion fans. Too bad Creation Club came around to ruin that with something that is genuinely nostalgia bait. For $4.69, you can bring back Umbra. I just want to give props to the UESP for listing the price scheme for the creation credits before listing the creations themselves. Let these prices sink in for a moment and understand that if you were to buy each creation individually, you'd be paying about 299 US dollars if you're buying the best bang for your buck CC credit bundle. Because, of course, they have bulk pricing. The store's always running discounts on things, and there's all sorts of bundles, so you do have to try to spend full price for this thing. I'm genuinely curious how well these things sold. I'm gonna guess not very well at all if they just sold the entire collection for $20 with the Anniversary Edition, as well as the fact that diehard fans making UESP articles couldn't be bothered to make articles for these things. Even with a 93% discount and CC helping write these videos with its endless fodder for jokes, I still feel like I got scammed here. Don't buy it. So, the Umbra creation adds a new dungeon, which is surprisingly rare for a creation, but the dungeon is pretty terrible. Props again, this time to Patrician, for bothering to even read the journals about this place and finding out it's quite literally an amusement park for Nords. By the time I got to Umbra, I'd stopped even picking up all the notes and journals that these creations are loaded with, let alone subjecting myself to reading them. And like, why? 
why are they so long? This creation is so blatant with its nostalgia baiting that it even plays Oblivion music when you're fighting Umbra. Umbra is now a two-handed weapon, a class of weapons the Creation Club really tried beefing up, I guess because it was so starved for artifacts in Skyrim, and now it absorbs 25 points of health and stamina on top of soul trapping for 20 seconds. As a result, it only has 13 charge uses, as opposed to its Oblivion counterpart which had 125. And knowing what we know now about how item charges work on weapons, you'll need points in Conjuration and Destruction to get those uses up because Soul Trap and Absorb Health belong to different schools. But we're still not done because there's one more Clavicus-related creation. Bitter Cup's surprising in that it has three quests on tap. We learn about an altar in the woods near Falkreath, and upon activating it, we can wish for fortune, power, or nothing at all. All three choices lead to unique quests. The one Gutha went with was power, and this one had her being teleported to an arena after she fell asleep. The arena was surprisingly unique in that it stripped me of all my gear and forced me to scavenge for stuff spread around the arena and off the bodies of my opponents. The setup was actually so interesting that I was hoping it would be a little bit more substantial, but no. The thing ends after about three minutes in a boss fight with the arena's grand champion. For our troubles, we get the bitter cup and we can loot some unique and frankly ugly items off the grand champ. Using the Bitter Cup boosts your highest attribute by 20 points while lowering your lowest by 20, which I found annoying because it achieves this by applying a hidden effect that damages that lower attribute, forever turning that number red in the UI. So you'll never know if that attribute is being damaged from a disease or some other ailment that you can cure. So while we got free mods out there fixing all the issues with vanilla Skyrim's UI, we got paid mods here breaking the vanilla UI even more. I didn't do the other two quests for this creation, and reading about them on the UESP, I don't think I was missing out on anything. To close things out with the Daedric Princes, Gutha stumbled across another orc stronghold out near Riften, which was busy dealing with a giant problem. After killing the giant, she ends up getting mixed signals from the orcs there. Most of them tell her to screw off, but one of them begs Gutha to help their tribe. Their leader is a weakling, and so Malakath has cursed them all to teach them a lesson. She asks Gutha to go get some ingredients for a ceremony to summon Malakath. We can ask her where to get a Daedra heart from, to which a tub tells us to in a daedra, of course. All right, Skyrim, I'll give you that one. I went and bought the ingredients like a milk drinker, but this does give me an opportunity to introduce you all to a glitch I ended up abusing for this character. It's a well-known bug with shopkeepers and really does ruin what little there is to the speech skill tree, but what a lifesaver it has been for doing these videos. So if you go to a shop and they don't have what you're looking for, close out the shop menu, quick save, assault the vendor, and quick load. The vendor will have their inventory refreshed and they'll have all their money restored. Most players just use this to sell everything to a general goods vendor like Bellathor, who will buy anything the player has, but also has a limited amount of cash. Once you sell everything and tap the merchant out of cash, you just close the window, quick save, hit them, and then quick load. You'll have your money, and the vendor will have all their money back too. I'm genuinely surprised the unofficial patch never fixed this, because I've been hearing about this bug since 2011. I've never really used it though, because... It really feels like it's just one step above console commands, but, you know, doing all these playthroughs for these videos has me ditching some very old reservations. With the ingredients, Atub performs the ceremony and Malakath comes in hot, calling Chief Yamaras out in front of the whole tribe. Malakath wants Yamaras to clear out some giants that have moved into his shrine, so Yamaras insists Gutha goes along with him. Malakath might have said he needed to kill the chief of the giants, but he didn't say he had to get to the chief solo. Oh yeah, Malakath is definitely gonna appreciate that sort of pettiness. Gutha agreed to go along with him just to see what sort of punishment this dingus would receive. Like with Barbus, we can follow Yamaras all the way to the shrine halfway to Windhelm, or we can just meet him there. Yamaras at least runs, but his flaky AI makes this more frustrating than it's worth. This kicked off one of the jankiest quest experiences I've ever had without anything outright breaking. At the entrance of the cave, we got attacked by a vampire, and for some reason, Mercurius attacks kept hurting allies, so this earned me a bounty with Yamars. Because strongholds are considered their own independent holds, they have their own independent bounties and each member of a tribe can act as guards. So I was able to rectify the situation by just tossing Yamars 40 coins. Just so you know, Yamars, I'm taking that money back. We got inside and nothing broke here, at least. It's a cool-looking cave that's very expansive, which explains its appeal towards the giants, but it's pretty empty. We then got to the grove where the shrine was located, and Yamars had a proposition for Gutha. If she'd kill the giant and got the club for him, he'd pay her and take all the credit. 
She knew he wasn't making it out of this place alive playing these sorts of games with Malakoth, so she agreed just to humiliate Yamaras one more time. After slaying the giant, I got back and found a dead dragon whose soul I immediately started absorbing. I have no idea where this thing came from. I didn't see any dragons on the way to the cave, and I thought the grove was an interior cell, so it's doubly confusing how it got teleported to us. Of course, Yamaras tried double-crossing Gutha for some reason, as she was busy absorbing the dragon's soul. He then took one look at Gutha and started to run away. Like, what? Did he suddenly realize the woman who'd been soloing giants this whole time and ate a dragon soul in front of him was now too much for him to handle? This meant I had to chase him around the grove, tripping away at his health because he's actually pretty tanky. Malakoth immediately contacted Gutha once Yamaras was dead, calling him a bitch one last time and ordering her back to the stronghold with a giant's club. Back at the strongholds, Malakath put the whole tribe on notice that he was lifting the curse, but they'd better shape up because Yamaras was an embarrassment. We then exchange the giant's club for Val and Jung, and that's the end of the quest. With it over, we can recruit the other members of the tribe as followers, but they're kept at level 30 and two of them are rangers, so I don't think so. Val and Jung is rocking a new enchantment from Oblivion, and, well, it's still worthless. It's got a base damage of 25, so like Dawnbreaker, it's somewhere around Dwemer. It is temperable, though. Its enchantment, Absorb Stamina 50 points, is interesting. I don't really know what the use case scenario for this hammer is. 50 stamina is a lot. You're likely not even to find an enemy with enough stamina to absorb before you kill them. And because you can't not use the enchantment when you go to swing the weapon, you're just gonna be wasting the charges unless you really want to sit there juggling two-handed warhammers. Compared to its Oblivion counterpart, I don't know which version is worse. Absorb stamina is better than drain health, at least it's permanent, and the drain health effect on Oblivion's Voluntrung was really weak. Oblivion's had a 3 second paralyze effect on it, but I've never been a fan of effects like paralyze on weapons. If I'm hitting the enemy until it's dead, why would I want that paralyze effect to last more than one second? Okay, actually, paralyze on a weapon in Skyrim could actually be useful if you have followers or summons to finish them off. That would then free me up to find another enemy to incapacitate, but three seconds isn't nearly long enough for my allies to do much damage. As well, like in Oblivion, Skyrim's Volendrung has very few charges clocking in at 13 swings. You're gonna deplete it quickly too, because it has one of the highest swing speeds of any two-handed weapon in Skyrim. I wonder if the lack of playtesting on the Daedric artifacts was due to the designers figuring that if the enchantments are busted, modders will just fix them. What a shame, too. An artist really went all out on this thing, but it's doomed to be nothing more than a display piece because it's just trash in combat. But don't worry, we got a ton of CC two-handed weapons to make up for it. Starting with Stendar's Hammer. Okay, this one's a troll item with its 28 base damage and 100 item weight. Its enchantment does an extra 22 points of damage to your target, but it also drains your stamina by 20 points every time you swing it. Oh hey, did you know that the weight of your weapon increases the stamina cost of performing power attacks? I totally didn't forget to include that when we were talking about stamina earlier and I'm just shoehorning it in right now. But yeah, this weapon was meant to be a joke, as the hammer appeared in Morrowind and was also meant to be a joke in that game. The difference here is that this creation costs real life money and all you're getting is the hammer, while the hammer from Morrowind came with the rest of the Tribunal expansion. Oh, silly me. I forgot about the quest this creation adds to steal the hammer from the Dwemer Museum in Markarth. Yeah, the quest is a quest marker and the hammer isn't flagged as property so you aren't stealing it. Hey, remember that dungeon I mentioned earlier, Foral Host? At the end of it, we can come across the spirit of a paladin we can kill in order to claim Chrysomir, another CC two-handed sword. Only thing worth noting is the unique enchantment on it, and it grants fire resistance and magic absorption in exchange for slower health regen in combat when the sword is equipped. What else we got from CC? Dawnfang and Duskfang? Shadowrend? The problem I really want to get across with these creations is just how easy they are to acquire. Most of the time, I was finding them on accident. Not all of them are OP, like Shadowrend blows with its weakness to match at 15%, but the notion of progression in Skyrim was already dubious. With the anniversary upgrade, you now have the option to circumvent pretty much any part of the game's progression. Want some of the best armor? Go get the Dragon Pleat set. Best spells? There's a chest with all the CC spells tomes just sitting in a cave. Houses? Take your pick. Unlimited money? Get the farmhouse. Carry weight getting you down? Backpacks. It's hard for CC to compete against weapons and armor the player can craft, but boy did they sure try. I can only assume that the reason so many of these items are so powerful and so easy to acquire was due to Bethesda figuring people paid for this stuff, so it's gotta be powerful and accessible. 
I don't see people complaining that they paid $20 for Dragonborn and don't have all that expansions, items, spells, and shouts in a cave somewhere. It's fine to have really powerful items, especially in a single player game, but acquiring those items should still be appropriately challenging. As it stands, CC is just paying to make your game worse by bloating it with items that strip out Skyrim's flimsy progression that I have to tend to like a weak campfire lest what little fun Skyrim can provide dissipates like the mirage that it truly is. While in Markarth looking to grab Stendar's hammer, Gutha got caught up in some events. When she got there, she saw a woman, damn it, she saw a woman about to be shanked. The would-be assassin shouted something about the Forsworn, but the guards insisted there are no Forsworn in the city. A man then ran up to Gutha asking about the attack and then hands her a note telling her it must have fallen out of her pocket. Yeah, that tends to happen because that fucking courier keeps running up with more of these. So yeah, this is the Forsworn Conspiracy and no one escapes Sidna Mines, a couple of quests that tends to rank on the high end of players' favorites. It's okay if we're rating on the scale of Skyrim quests, seeing as it doesn't set us to go clear out some dungeons, and we even have some options and opportunities to use speech checks. The quest is still very heavy-handed though, ruining a lot of the intrigue by telling us exactly where we need to go, what we need to do, and who we need to be speaking with. Still, it's an interesting and creative story about how the Silverbloods have been working with the Forsworn to do their dirty work, and in exchange, they've let the leader of the Forsworn Rebellion continue to live and operate his movements from within the Sindamines Jail. This arrangement has naturally turned sour as the Forsworn have grown to be a bit too unruly, because surprise, surprise, Madanok, the king in rags, has been playing the long game here. Yeah, 20 years long, in fact. Gutha agrees to do a little snooping, and this has her running around the city following quest marker, I mean leads, as she pieces together the conspiracy I just described. She goes to the treasury house to investigate the Silverbloods, and the Forsworn try killing her and Thonar there. Thonar ends up copping up to the whole scheme, but doesn't really have much else to say and just kicks her out. She then confronts Nepos the Nose, who sent a thug to scare off the investigation, and it turns out Nepos is the one acting as the hands of Madanok outside of jail. They then try killing Gutha again, but at this point you'd need an army of Daedra to take her down, so she and Markyrio wipe them out. The corrupt guards end up killing Altrice and move to arrest Gutha to pin all the recent deaths on her. Alright, so the problem here is that the quest designer really needs us to get arrested for the second quest to begin. We can kill the respawning guards and flee the city, but we can't do anything in the hold if we play it that way. We also can't bring any of this evidence to Tullius or Ulfric, who both have vested interests this arrangement between the Forsworn and Silverbloods would absolutely be endangering. As well, getting falsely arrested is an emotionally resonant moment to strengthen Madinox's arguments. Sure, in all cases it has technically been self-defense, but this is why vigilantism is often illegal. It's way too easy for someone like Gutha here to screw things up during an investigation, which leads to many avoidable deaths. Yeah, I would say she's at least partially responsible here. So, after realizing she's probably at least guilty of some form of criminal negligence, she agrees to go quietly and she's sent to the mines. The mine part lets us see things from the side of the Forsworn in a rare moment where the antagonist faction in Skyrim is given an opportunity to be fleshed out. Not too much, though. This is the only time we even get to talk to the Forsworn after all. Madanok presents the argument that they are really the oppressed ones here because this is their homeland and they were peaceful when they took over during the Great War and did you listen to Brig's story about his daughter being executed? You see, the Nords are the true brutes here and... Yeah, fuck Madinok. His agents tried to kill Gutha twice, and the Forsworns are a serious problem in the Reach. Ulfric needs peace if he's gonna build up Skyrim again, after all. Hopefully the Silverbloods make good on their promise to send all of them into the mines to dig up silver for the Stormcloaks, because this is where they belong. Here is the problem with the Forsworn and this whole quest. This is the only time we get to see them acting as anything other than hostile bandits engaged in weird magic that produces things like Hagravens and Briarhearts. I don't appreciate the contrivances needed to get us into the jail to speak with the King in Rags, and I don't appreciate him assuming that we are allies now that we got locked up after he tried having us killed. Twice! I don't sympathize with them because there's nothing really to sympathize with. Bragg's story is unsubstantiated and unusually cruel, even for the Nords in control of the city. As corrupt as they are, the Silverbloods did warn Gutha several times to stop asking questions, and even at the end, they just sent her to the mines. Is Bragg lying? 
Probably not, but that's not the point. The Quest is trying to do a lot as cheaply and as quickly as it can, so what better way to humanize a faction that has been characterized so uncharitably up until this point than to have a dude with a sob story that comes at the expense of another group? It's a shame too because the conspiracy part was very well handled and I like the details that you can get if you save Margaret in the beginning. She ends up revealing that she's actually an Imperial agent sent by Tullius to investigate the Silverbloods. She even had a plan to try to buy or steal the mines from them. Did you really think that was going to work? Are you sure Tullius didn't send you here to just act as bait? We can side with the Forsworn and stage a breakout, but I took the better route of asserting my dominance by gutting Madinock and using his secret escape tunnel to escape. Because I even had this option, and because the Silverbloods actually thanked me for taking care of their problem, this quest still does end up ranking on the higher end of Skyrim quests for me. It's an interesting window into what could have been if the Forsworn had been more fleshed out and choices actually had consequences. As it stands, the Forsworn will continue to act as bandits out in the Reach regardless of what happens to Madinok. After having helped win Skyrim's independence, Gotha figured it was time to help Windhelm itself. There's a murderer on the loose, and the guards can't spare the men to investigate thanks to the Civil War. I mean, the war is over now, surely three women getting killed and cut up in the streets at night should get a couple of guards assigned to it, but I guess Ulfric needs his troops to solidify his gains elsewhere or something. In any event, Gotha signs on as an investigator because, well, the last one sure went well. She starts by questioning everyone standing around the body, and while everyone heard the commotion, nobody saw who did it. Yeah, I mean, I guess that would give it away now, wouldn't it? Talking to the priestess of Arke, she tells Gutha the woman was cut up with some embalming tools, and following a trail of blood led Gutha to a house in the fancy part of town. Inside, she found some journals, some flyers warning about the butcher, a weird amulet, and a hidden room with an altar where necromantic rituals were being performed by the butcher using parts he'd been harvesting from his victims. So here's where another one of those Skyrim inconsistencies wasted a good 10 minutes of my life. Remember how I said I'd stopped reading most journals and notes because the Creation Club had been poisoning me with them? Well, here's where my policy of not picking up journals and notes I didn't think were important kind of screwed me. Usually when you read an important note or a journal, that's when the associated quest stage will be completed. Sometimes that's not the case, and it's only when you pick the journal or note up that the stage is completed. Because I read the Butcher Flyer like three times, I saw the stack of them in the house and figured, yeah, there's no need for me to pick these up. I got enough crap cluttering the books tab in my inventory already. Well, this was one of those items I had to pick up. With how the game had been giving me dialogue box pop-ups, I assumed the quest stages were being completed once I activated the objects. But just to be safe, I was also taking the journals. Well, this led to me running around town for 10 minutes unable to progress the quest until I went back and grabbed one of those pamphlets. Not because I had to show the pamphlet to anyone, it was just so that I could ask the steward about the butcher, a name I'd already heard from several other NPCs already. Back on track, Gutha talked to the author of the pamphlet and she said the court wizard was rumored to dabble in necromancy. He was also called the Unliving. Well, he definitely seemed to be a bit off when Gutha went to talk to him before she realized she needed a pamphlet of her own. Following the advice of the court steward, Gutha met up with Calixto, who was interested in the strange amulet. He also mentioned it probably belonged to the court wizard, but he said he'd be happy to pawn it off of her. So she sold him the amulet, went to the steward, and told him it was the court wizard. Another case closed. I gotta give Blood on the Ice credit here. It at least trusts the player to carry out the investigation on their own, unlike the Forsworn Conspiracy that has Eltrees to spell everything out and quest markers to lead the player by the nose. There's even some red herrings, like the priestess name-dropping Calixto by mentioning he's probably the only one in town who'd have those embalming tools because weird items are sort of his thing. I mean, these things litter the crypts all over Skyrim, but yeah, sure, whatever you say. It turns out Calixto's only connection is that he'd be interested in buying the amulet, and the embalming tools being located in the house where the murders were taking place got Calixto off the admittedly weak hook. The quest even has a second part because you can actually lock the wrong person up. Yeah, you can consider me impressed. This is a genuinely robust quest, especially for Skyrim. That scripting thing that led to pamphlet gate was kind of annoying, but other than that, yeah, it's pretty good. This quest also encourages the player to talk to the citizens of Windhelm and is actually a good way to get better acquainted with the city and help the player find some more of the hidden side content the city has to offer. One of those quests being the White File. Unlike the past two quests, this one returns to the Skyrim tradition of relying on a dungeon run. But just like the other two quests, this is also a two-parter. Norellian runs the alchemy shop in town and he has spent his life looking for the White File, a legendary artifact said to constantly renew whatever liquid is placed inside it. He has the location, but he needs an adventure to go and get the thing. Gutha agrees because she's actually been to Forsaken Cave before and even ended up killing the undead form of the creator of the White File. Kuromil can spawn as a Draugr, but at high levels he'll actually spawn as a Dragon Priest, which has a lot of implications. 
This is one of those quests that completely twists the lore that Skyrim itself established. There's, uh, there's supposed to be a big difference between the Draugr and the Dragon Priests, neither of which I think fits someone described as being a legendary alchemist someone like Norelian would spend their lives trying to study. I'm gonna guess the designers here just use these forms to imply Kiramil is a lich without realizing Draugr and Dragon Priests aren't actually liches. Also, does Kiramil sound like a Nord name to you? It sounds kind of Altmer to me, and uh, yeah, there aren't any Elven, Draugr, or Dragon Priests. Anyways, the file is cracked and we need to repair it. This second quest sends us around the map collecting ingredients to fix the thing. This is one of those quests that asks for specific items, and by specific, I mean you have to go to this exact place and get it this exact way. This is stupid because two of the items are powdered mammoth tusk and a briar heart. Both are alchemy ingredients you can find in the game, but the designer insists you retrieve the exact ones they marked in the world because they are miscellaneous quest items here. Remember when we had to go get those ingredients for Periite and Malakath's quests? It's genuinely fascinating seeing the range of confidence between Bethesda quest designers when it comes to trusting the players' intelligence. With the file complete, Neralian is allowed to die, just like how Todd Howard has been allowed to age now that Starfield is close to its release. Unfortunately, Quintus isn't really a master alchemist, so we're going to be getting the discount file as a reward. We can only pick from a few effects that the file will forever be imbued with, as opposed to being able to put whatever potion we want into the thing. We are given the choice of resist magic 20% for 60 seconds, fortify stamina 20 points for 300 seconds, oof. Fortify Sneak 20 points for 60 seconds. Fortify Magicka 20 points for 300 seconds. Fucking hell, really? Restore 100 points of health, or the one I went with. One-handed weapons do 50% more damage for 60 seconds. It's a shame two-handed players get scammed here, but the one-handed increase is pretty decent. Of course, the dialogue options don't tell you anything about the effect the file will have, and once you make your pick, there's no take back, so you'll probably be doing a bunch of reloading to actually make this choice. The file will replenish its contents every day, meaning it really acts like a racial or a standing stone power, which makes most of these effects even worse. That damage increase one came in very handy though when I'd remember to use it, and it paired well with Gutha's Berserker Rage Racial ability. It would have been neat if we could have done another quest to upgrade this to its original form so that we could turn it into a custom daily power. Imagine making some insanely powerful fortify skill potion that would just let you melt enemies for 60 seconds. Or cast a school of magic spells at a steep discount. Or just make a rocking piece of gear. Rise in the East is the final job Gutha has in Windhelm. The local East Empire Company office has been having issues lately with some pirates. The office manager suspects the Shatter Shields are in league with the pirates to knock out their competition in the city. He sends Gutha next door to steal the logs of Severus, their Dunmer office manager who is known to be very exact and detail-oriented. Fortunately, her logs do indeed reveal the location where the pirates recruit in Dawnstar. I've been to that inn, I never saw any pirates. Gutha ends up in Dawnstar and finds the captain of one of the ships and he tells her everything. That he's the captain of a pirate gang, that they've been hitting ships because everyone's distracted by the war. He even name drops their secret battle mage who runs the whole operation. He's reluctant to let her sign up with them though because he's never heard of her. Then why did he mention any of this? So Gutha has to beat the location out of him in a brawl. Isn't assault a crime in Skyrim? Why is it fine for the player to resort to throwing fists to get info out of people? Back in Windhelm, Gutha gets to meet the district manager, and after putting her slacking subordinate in his place, she's ready to launch an assault on the pirate base. Gutha tags along with them and yeah, we get shipped off to a remote pirate base. I kind of like this quest, if only for the novelty that it dares send us off to a remote part of the map like this. It demonstrates the benefit totally self-contained quests like this provides quest designers because they clearly had fun writing this quest and scripting the assault sequence after we'd killed the battle mage. We get a brief battle through the pirate camp as the East Empire Company starts dropping explosives onto the outpost. It's a dumb quest that felt like it came out of a Fallout game, but it had enough self-aware moments to signal it's not really anything to be taken seriously. Really, it just got me wondering if anyone could make a quest like this, or if the designer needed some sort of approval to do what we normally see only DLC doing with a location that's off the main map of the game. It does seem like a waste, though, to spend this unique setup on a quest that was little more than a tongue-in-cheek Operation Anchorage. With that settled, Gutha was finally able to buy a house in Windhelm and be named Thane of the City. She did have to pay to have the city clean up the crime scene in her new home, but Gutha wasn't about to let a little blood deter her from getting to own a manor in the city she just helped save from a serial killer. You've got to be kidding. Looks like you aren't such a sharp investigator after all. Yeah, Woundforth isn't the murderer. 
Fortunately, he hasn't been executed yet for the murders, so he's able to help Gutha figure this one out. He asks her why she'd accuse him, and she explains she found his journal, his amulet, and his necromancy table. Yeah, this dialogue is a little weird because the rest of this conversation isn't written with the idea that he'd just been exonerated on account of another murder happening. You can bring all this evidence directly to him before having Jorleaf arrest him, and if you do, he'll explain why all of this is nonsense. He doesn't keep journals, the amulet isn't his, and most importantly... Necromancy! I am a member of the College of Winterhold, in good standing. They haven't allowed necromancy for hundreds of years. I sure know. Those archaic policies died out with the Mages Guild, and were never enforced here. Necromancy, as any other type of magic, is a tool to be used. Honestly, I would have appreciated being able to lock him up still after this confrontation, just because him getting this detail wrong really craps on his defense. But that's a screw-up on the writer's part, not the character's. Besides, the game lets you know he's telling the truth because it immediately locks you out of being able to have him arrested. Instead, he tells us he's been following the murders and predicts the next murder will be very soon. Tonight, actually. Or tomorrow night, or really whenever you get time to patrol the streets of Windhelm. Once again, I would have appreciated getting the option to botch this part too and fail to catch Calixto in the act. Oh yeah, the murder was actually Calixto, that wasn't a red herring, that was actually a clue. So Gutha hits the streets after dark and eventually finds Calixto stalking another potential victim. By the nine, can we hurry this up? Time is disk space here. I know we couldn't get to the end of this quest without some sort of Skyrim jank. So, Calexto just kept stalking this woman because, of course, I couldn't confront him before the two of them reached their scripted destination where he'd finally pull out his knife. And, of course, attacking him before this would be considered a crime. The other time, I just found him running through the streets with a quest marker over his head and I was allowed to slay him. Honestly, I was conflicted whether I was even going to cover this quest. It's such a mainstay of Skyrim analyses and discussions that I just didn't think I had anything worth talking about with it. But then I fell for the trick. Yes, I fooled you twice. I didn't imprison Woundforth on purpose when I was doing the quest. I know that both him and the Calixto were the main suspects, but due to that incident with the pamphlet and me confronting Woundforth before getting the pamphlet, I figured I'd cleared Calixto because Woundforth didn't interject with his defense. Because I don't have every quest committed to memory as I'm doing them, I like to do them as blind as possible for just this reason, I mixed up who the guilty one was. I realized the error when I was doing my research, then looked at my footage and realized why I'd fallen for the trick. It's funny, but it's also pretty stupid. This goes to show that Woundforth's innocence isn't really believable even with all the evidence. His defense is unsubstantiated, and the only part of his defense that could clear him, the writers botch and we have no way of verifying even if we are the Archmage. Like I said, I'd still lock up Woundforth even after confronting him had he not suddenly asked Pold that the next murder would occur that night and had the game not taken the option away from me. As well, the one piece of evidence that would completely implicate Calixto is locked up in his shop with an unpickable lock and no key exists until you kill him at the end of the quest. Sure, there is a Ratu Aces for the first time, and if you do your due diligence, you really have a good chance of having Moonforth solve this thing for you, but I can't help but feel the designers really intended for most players to just fall for the trick. So they stacked everything against Woundforth, even including an AI package that has him sleeping during the day. Though, Calexto's eyes are bloodshot, hinting that he could be missing sleep too. I do appreciate the attention to details here. No, seriously, there's a lot going on, especially for a Skyrim quest. And there's even some cause to suspect many other NPCs in the city. I just feel like the trick imprisoning Moonforth is... Well, it's just kind of cheap. It doesn't help that this is a quest that requires me to pay attention in a game where I have to turn my brain off while playing. Like Paranoia and Whodunit, Blood on the Ice, and even the Forsworn Conspiracy are quests that really should see iteration in Tez 6. But I doubt that will happen because Bethesda seems to engage in willful amnesia when it comes to making their games. Expanding the number of believable suspects we can accuse, reducing the bias and evidence that heavily points towards the wrong suspect, and removing the ability to have the mystery solved for us when we arrest the wrong suspect should all be addressed if this quest was to see its way into Test 6. To close things out then, Gutha had some unfinished business in Whiterun. See, she wanted to be Thane of Whiterun, but Vignar wasn't about to just give her the title even if she helped him take the throne. Some people might call that gratitude, but others would call it nepotism, and that sort of nonsense has no place in a post-imperial Skyrim. So tough shit, bitch. Earn your rank. This had Gutha putting on her detective cap one more time. Foolish old woman. You know nothing. Nothing of our struggles, our suffering. Here's another dialogue most Skyrim players will recognize. 
But how many players have actually talked to Fralia Gramey? Well, if you do, she invites you to her house to talk because she doesn't want anyone overhearing the conversation. Gutha takes her up on that and meets her at her house. This ends up triggering her son, Avelston, who comes out with his axe. I like how this house has two entrances, and because I came in the back way and Avelston positions himself, assuming the player's gonna come in through the front door, it ended up creating this awkward standoff that made it look like he was hiding behind his elderly mother. And also, yes, this is Yerlin Greymane's son and wife. The story goes that the other son, Thorald, has gone missing. The Battleborns have been telling everyone that the son got killed because he sided with the Stormcloaks. But the Greymanes refuse to accept that because they don't trust the Battleborns who have sided with the Imperials. This adds a lot more to the feud between these two families, which is basically the dividing line between the Stormcloak East and the Imperial West here in Whiterun. Avelston fears leaving the house lest he gets jumped or something, and yeah, I don't blame him. If the Silverhand were able to stroll into the city and assault Yorvaskar, some Imperial hit squad could absolutely get to Avelston because apparently the Whiterun guards just don't do their jobs. He asks Gutha to find evidence of what happened to Thorald and points her to the Battleborn's house across the street. Yeah, it's another freeform investigation quest. There's a few ways we can approach this one too, because there's a few different Battleborns we can work over. The first approach is simply passing a 75 speech check with Idolof, who will tell us outright that Thorold got picked up by the Thalmor. Idolof wrote a letter to General Tullius investigating Thorold's disappearance because they used to be friends, and he'll just give us the Imperial missive which confirms the story. The second route is pickpocketing John. You know, Mr. You know what's wrong with Skyrim these days? Everyone is obsessed with death. He has a love letter from Olfina Greymane on him, which we can then use to blackmail him in exchange for the same Imperial missive. Seems a bit screwed up, but yeah, that is an option, I guess. The third route is stealing the missive from the Battleborn house, as Avelston hinted at. You can pick lock the doors to get in, or you can become a friend of the clan by either helping the kid Lars deal with a bully, or suck off Edeloff by responding Battleborn when he abruptly prompts you like some weird socially unadjusted narcissist when you first meet him. Or you can just harvest some wheat for Alfield at their farm outside of town. Down. Doing any of these things will have them leaving the front door unlocked, so you can just stroll in and look for the missive undisturbed. This is stupid on several levels. So because the Battleborns now consider us a friend, they will just permanently leave their front door unlocked? Did they only lock their doors because there was an orc wandering town? Is there no one else they don't trust in this town? Like, oh, I don't know, a whole other clan that lives across the street? Why couldn't they just give us a key to the place? Would that have made it a bit too obvious how dumb it is giving a stranger free access to their house just because they did a job for them? You could also just not bother with any of this and simply pick the locks on the front and back doors because they're only novice locks. There's usually someone in the house though, so that's something you'd still need to work around. The missive is kept in an office behind another novice lock, but it's easy to hide when picking that lock, and the missive isn't flagged as property, so it isn't even considered a crime if you yoink it. However you attain it, bringing the missive back to Avelston has him itching to launch a solo rescue mission on the Thalmor Fort to get his brother back. Alright, hold your horses there, Chief. The Thalmor would absolutely snap you in half if you went in equipped in low-level gear like that. Let me see if I can find some way to free him without bloodshed. Yeah, despite what the dialogue option here and with the Thalmor at the gate of their fort hints at, there's no peaceful way to settle this. I suspect it was originally going to be considering the rest of the quest embraces speech, and Tullius is the one who penned the letter, but it probably just wasn't implemented. We do have the option to stealth into the fort to rescue Thorald, but you know how this goes. With the Thalmor all dead, Thorald says it's probably not safe for him and his brother in Whiterun, so they'd best join Stormcloaks. Wait, I thought you already did that. Isn't that why the Thalmor picked you up? He gives the same message to give to his mother so she'll know he's safe, and that's the quest. I liked having options, and I enjoyed all the little ways the two clans mixed with the many goings-ons of Whiterun. I would have appreciated getting the option to side with the Battleborns, in which case, the quest would have been to convince the Greymanes to just drop the subject already. Really, the only truly obnoxious one is Ulfred. The rest of the Battleborns seem like decent folk. Even Idolof with the knowledge that he was the one to check in to see what happened to Thorald. It's not like they sold the Greymanes out and that's why he got pinched by the Thalmor. Once again, it's possible that was the original idea. It makes sense given Whiterun's position in the Civil War and how the player determines its fate. It just might have been the victim of some cuts. Hey Vignar, now that I helped your family, you're ready to make me Thane? Then by my right as Jarl. Hey, nepotism wins out after all. With that, Gutha was ready to pack it in and settle into a quiet life in her Windhelm Manor with her adopted daughter. 
Guth had a few of those floating around Skyrim, actually. Collecting orphaned girls was something of a hobby of hers. Mercurio headed off back to the Arcane University, and the Gutha and Mercurio Adventure Company was officially closed for business. But it didn't take long for rumors to reach her about strange things happening on Solstheim. Apparently, the Dragonborn had slain some ancient dragon priest or another dragonborn or something and had set himself up as Lord of the Island. Allegedly, he was threatening to press his claims for the Imperial throne now that Titus II was dead? Alright, hold on. This needed some investigating. So she bid Sophie farewell once again and grabbed a boat at the Windhelm docks headed for the strange island. Like the last video, I don't really have a proper conclusion for this thing. While I've got a clearer understanding of Skyrim now thanks to looking into things like level scaling and melee character builds, I'm not quite ready to render a final judgement on the game. I mean, I probably could, I doubt there's much the stealth playstyle will do to change my thoughts at this point, but where's the fun in a premature call? Instead, I want to reflect on my time playing these three characters. I can't shake the feeling that my enjoyment with these characters was unintended by the designers, like I was having fun with them in spite of the mechanics related to their styles. Veggie Soup was a game changer for my melee characters the same way 100% destruction cast cost was for my mage character. The difference being, I was actually having fun with my sword and board orc before I'd gotten Veggie Soup, and by endgame, she was virtually unstoppable even without it. The same could not be said for my mage. It really got me wondering how much better the magic system of Skyrim would be with just lower spell costs. But here I go again, talking about magic. Can you tell magic is my preferred playstyle in RPGs? It's a shame Melee has so many terrible skill trees. Out of all of them, Block and Smithing seem to be the only competent ones. Because this really does box Melee characters into, at best, three playstyles. Those being the ones that I played. Sword and Board, Two-Handed, and Dual Wielding. Two-Handed was definitely the worst experience. It had its moments, but for the most part, it really just felt like a slower one-handed style, which just makes it an outright inferior experience considering the overall melee combat experience in Skyrim isn't something you want to be locked in for more than a couple of minutes at a time. There's no gratification from longer fights, no sense of greater accomplishment for overcoming a serious challenge because Skyrim's combat is still fairly shallow. I think there's more to it than a lot of other analysts give it credit for, but don't take that to mean I think it's something that will appeal to people looking for something with a steep, gratifying learning curve. There's not nearly as much decision-making to be done while engaged with it, which is honestly not a terrible thing if you want an experience that's more laid back, but it's definitely a hindrance if that pace gets slowed down. But that's what the two-handed playstyle really highlighted for me. Skyrim's combat is clearly geared towards many small engagements back-to-back, -back, as opposed to fewer, much longer stints. I don't know, maybe if we just buffed the base damage of all the two-handed weapons, maybe the playstyle could have been salvaged. It's really no wonder then that the dual-wielding character was the most fun. That character was a damage-dealing monster, and had the controls with hotkeying not ruined the experience of using anything other than her conjured swords, there was huge potential with custom weapon enchantments too. Just don't bother with the Soul Stealer perk. Turns out that made soul gem management basically impossible because I was constantly filling larger soul gems with weaker souls because I couldn't not soul trap every enemy I had to kill. I'm still baffled by how miserable dragon fights were for all of these characters. It's left me utterly convinced that dragon rend really was a concession the designers had to throw in. Because if you're pure melee, you really have no offensive capabilities once a dragon takes flight. I think a more elegant solution would have been just buffing the hell out of things like the Fire Breath Shout, because now I have to make the choice of either running through the main quest until I get Dragon Rend, or just never turning in the Dragon Stone and never activating dragons. That second option sucks though, because some melee playstyles really synergize well with shouts like Become Ethereal and Elemental Fury. So my choice as a melee player is either committing to getting Dragon Rend or locking myself out of a lot of options that frankly the melee playstyle desperately needs. This is why melee magic hybrid builds are so tempting and is probably the best experience for both playstyles overall. As I've demonstrated, you won't be investing into many skill trees as a melee player, so why not pick up a couple of backup magic skills? As for the factions and questlines we looked at in this video, I'm... <sighs> what else can I even say? The Companions was so bad that I genuinely think it should have just been cut entirely, or at the very least, stripped down into something that just dispenses contracts and nothing else. There's a reason most players can barely remember the events of that questline. The whole thing felt like a fever dream, and even after spending weeks analyzing and writing their section, I've already forgotten quite a bit of it. 
Being a werewolf is kind of fun if you got Dawn Guard installed, but there's not a whole lot to it. It's not something you can effectively build a proper character around, so wasting the potential of the companions to service the werewolf lifestyle just seemed bizarre. But the companions' wasted potential is nothing in comparison to the Civil War. It is understandable why the Civil War fell through, though. I applaud the ambition, and the backstory was really good when it wasn't being unnecessarily opaque. But its execution was genuinely painful to play through. While the Companions was a boring quest line to go through, it was at least functional. The Civil War, on the other hand, was actually frustrating, especially when a major quest kept softlocking for no reason. I'll admit, I have a habit of breaking games, and usually it's my own doing, but that's not what was happening this time around. It wasn't like I was going in with some kind of engine-busting nightmare character and using console commands and speedrunning quests. I was literally just playing the questline as a normal player would and things kept breaking. Maybe something was messed up with Gutha's save file because Serian had fewer bugs overall and the questline didn't softlock, even though he was running around spamming crazy AoE spells, but that's still not an excuse for Skyrim. Fortunately, busted crap meant I had plenty of things to talk about when it came to discussing the quests where I really had to scrape the insides of my brain to put something together to talk about with the Companions quests, the Civil War almost wrote itself. The conflict between all of its factions was also pretty fun to do, and I hope people get that my whole take on it was just a giant shit post because there really is no right or wrong side to support in the conflict. If you like the Imperials, that's fine. Though, I feel like most people support the Imperials just because they don't want to support the Stormcloaks. And that seems like a weird stance when it's very easy to remain entirely neutral in the conflict, especially when there's nothing to be gained from completing the quest line. Unlike the Companions, I'm grateful the Civil War exists in the game, despite how busted it really is, but like I said, it probably shouldn't have made it past pre-production. So the original plan was to include Dawn Guard with this video, but each section ate up more runtime than I expected, especially the discussion on dungeons. As a result, it's getting kicked over to whenever I get to covering Dragonborn. I say whenever because I'm not sure if there will be a dedicated DLC video or not. Generally, those sorts of videos don't do well view-wise, and I'm also concerned about dropping so many Skyrim videos. I honestly think the algo is going to start having a conniption if I try to push past 3 with this series. This isn't me signaling I'm going to half-ass the DLCs. There's plenty of things worth talking about, especially with Dragonborn. I just might tack it onto the stealth video instead, make it a two-for-one sort of deal. There's a lot of reasons why I'm hesitant to do that, though. I'm still undecided right now. I've been head down grinding this video for so long, I haven't really had time to even consider what comes next. I'm almost positive the next video won't be the next Skyrim video, though. I, uh, I really need a break from this game, lest the next part turns into a disingenuous hit piece just because I got bored with the project. I'm looking to overhaul my production pipeline with this video now wrapped because the content drought on my channel between this one and the Skyrim Mage video is not sustainable, nor is it fun for me to grind a single video for months on end. Basically, I'm saying don't expect the next Skyrim video to be done anytime soon. This one took over 500 man hours to produce, which was pretty much the same amount of time it took to produce the Mage video. The reason a shorter video took longer to produce is that I made a big push to up the production quality for this one. From voice recording, editing, and even writing, I wanted this video to be a step up on all fronts. I hope that time and effort has resulted in a better viewing experience. If you made it this far, congratulations, and thank you. I don't think I'd be doing these videos still if it wasn't for the support and positive feedback I've been getting, especially for the Mage video. I didn't say it at the time, but that video was very much a do-or-die situation. If it flopped, I was getting ready to pack it in for YouTube but it's turned out to be the most successful video I've done to date, and that really helped push me through this project, which honestly, this one was a bit of a grind. Since the last video, I set up a Patreon and activated memberships for the channel. If you pledged or donated since the last Skyrim video, your name should be popping up on screen right about now if you want to glance at your second monitor to catch it. I can't express how much the support means to me, so some thank yous will just have to suffice. First and foremost, thanks to all those people whose names are going by right now. You're all helping me stay fed on late evening DoorDash orders so I can steal another 30 minutes of writing or editing, or financing the Dr. Pepper Fund so I can get amped for an hour-long voice session. Thank you to all the people who have been tuning into the live streams. I plan on doing more of them ASAP. It's just hard because those tend to leave me exhausted, so I end up losing a whole workday when doing them. 
They get harder to justify doing after a project hits a certain point because it really does become a game of how many hours can I squeeze out of the day. Still, I think including them in the video brought something special forward I'd never have thought to explore had it not been for all the people watching and chatting during those streams. Thanks to the fine people on my Discord server and Patrician's Discord who have helped immensely with researching, sourcing jokes and memes, and just listening to me beta testing arguments and bits for this video. Now that this video is done, I can actually start being active again. And last but most certainly not least, thanks to everyone who has watched and continues to watch these videos. Seeing the Skyrim Mage video still pulling in healthy numbers is pretty wild. All of you who are watching while falling asleep, you're unironically bankrolling most of the channel. Viewers tend to discredit the impact of their viewership, but as someone who values days by the minute, just know that I appreciate you giving me hours of your time like this. It means more than you might think. That's all I got for you. As always, thanks, and I'll see you in the next one.